Since its inception in the 7th century, Christianity and Islam have been at odds. In the century after Muhammad's death in 632, Islamic forces seized territories including Jerusalem, the Levant, North Africa, and a large portion of the Iberian Peninsula, areas that were previously dominated by Christianity. By the 11th century, the Christian forces had begun reclaiming parts of Iberia through the Reconquista, though their connection to the Holy Land was weakening. The Fatimid dynasty, rulers of North Africa and large regions of Western Asia, including Jerusalem and Damascus, had kept a relatively peaceful relationship with Western powers. However, in 1073, the Seljuk dynasty took Jerusalem from the Fatimids, marking a shift to a less accommodating stance towards Christian pilgrims. The plight of the pilgrims and the call for aid from Byzantium rang out in the heartland of Europe, and the embers of a new kind of war were ignited. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you here again. If you'd like to support the channel, perhaps follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, a like, comment and subscribe goes a long way. And now, without further ado, let's talk about the First Crusade. This is part of a larger series on the Crusades in general, which I will get to, and we'll be going into quite a great amount of detail, so make sure you're relaxed. The onset of the First Crusade was a direct countermeasure against the Islamic encroachments by the Fatimids and the Seljuks into previously Christian territories and parts of the Byzantine Empire, which was around modern-day Turkey. The idea of making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem had gained traction in Western Europe as an act of penance. Despite the Seljuks' tenuous grip on Jerusalem, eventually ceding it back to the Fatimids, reports from returning pilgrims highlighted the mistreatment of Christians under their rule. This period also saw the Byzantine Empire's plea for military aid align with the growing readiness among the European Western nobility to heed the call to arms under papal leadership. During the 11th century, Europe experienced a significant population surge due to advances in technology and agriculture that boosted trade and economic prosperity. The Catholic Church ascended to a position of unparalleled influence over Western society, which was structured around the systems of manorialism and feudalism, with knights and nobles providing military service to their superiors in exchange for land use rights. Between 1050 and 1080, the Church sought to expand its authority through the Gregorian Reform, leading to friction with Eastern Christianity over the concept of papal primacy. This tension culminated in 1054 with the mutual excommunication of Pope Leo IX and Patriarch Michael Cerularius, precipitating the East-West Schism. Concurrently, Christian societies had long accepted the use of violence for communal defense, a stance that evolved into a theological justification for holy wars especially after the Crusade 
became entwined with Roman citizenship, requiring citizens to defend the empire. The fragmentation of the Carolingian Empire also gave rise to class of warriors in Western Europe, leading to increased violence and efforts by the papacy to control it. This error also saw popes like Alexander II and Gregory VII formalizing systems for mobilizing military resources, including campaigns in the Iberian Peninsula and Norman conquests. Despite Gregory VII's failed attempt to organize a military expedition to aid Byzantium against the Seljuks, the foundation for the Crusader ideology was already laid at this time, asserting that fighting for just causes could absolve sins. Well, back in the Iberian Peninsula, Christian kingdoms like Lyon, Navarre, and Catalonia, despite lacking a unified identity, capitalized on the Caliphate of Cordoba's collapse to make territorial gains, leading to the Reconquista's early stages. Meanwhile, the Italo-Normans captured significant territories in southern Italy and Sicily from the Byzantines and North African Arabs, often clashing with the papacy, but ultimately launching their conquests under the papal banner, setting the stage for future crusades and conflicts that would define the era. Now, from its inception, the Byzantine Empire stood as a kind of a beacon of prosperity, but also with a good amount of cultural richness and military might. And by the reign of Basil II in 1025, the empire had expanded its borders to their zenith, securing territories as far east as Iran, along with Bulgaria and significant portions of southern Italy, while also curbing the issue of Mediterranean piracy. Well, despite facing rivals on all fronts, from the Normans in Italy to the Seljuk Turks in the east, the empire adeptly navigated these challenges, often employing mercenaries from the very factions they contested, money talks. At the same time, the Islamic world was carving out its own expansive narrative and had been doing so since the 7th century, with the entry of the Turkic peoples into the Middle East, marking a pivotal phase of Arab-Turkic entanglement. The Seljuk Turks, originally from Transoxania and newly converted to Islam, dramatically reshaped Western Asia by the 12th century through their conquests. Their Sunni allegiance, that's one of the branches of Islam if you don't know, Sunni and Shia, brought them into conflict with the Shia Fatimid Caliphate. The further stirring of the political cauldron the cultural and administrative contrast between the nomadic Seljuks and their sedentary subjects further exacerbated tensions within the empire, a strain that was highlighted by the capture of Romanos IV Diogenes at Manzikert in 1071, a defeat that hastened Seljuk expansion and indirectly prompted the First Crusade's call to arms. But we're just getting started. The early 12th century witnessed a fracturing of power in the Middle East, participated by the demise of the Seljuk and Fatimid leaders, leaving a fragmented landscape ill-prepared for the First Crusade's onslaught. This period of turmoil saw the emergence of figures like 
Kilij Arslan and Tutush I, whose rivalries further splintered the Islamic realm. Amidst the disarray, the Fatimids recaptured Jerusalem from the Seljuks, shortly before the emergence of the Crusaders. Now, the spiritual foundations for the First Crusade were more or less laid during the Council of Piacenza and the subsequent Council of Clermont in 1095, under the auspices of Pope Urban II. He's an important character, so we'll talk about him in a bit more detail. It was these two gatherings, the Council of Piacenza and Council of Clermont, that catalyzed the mobilization of Western Europe toward the Holy Land. Byzantine Emperor Alexius Komnenos, facing the Seljuk threat, sought assistance from Urban at Piacenza, igniting a favorable response from the Pope, and indeed most of West Western Europe, rather, was not aware of the issues that the Byzantines were facing. They were a long, long way from the frontier. It's one thing to fight barbarians. It's another thing to fight the might of the newly forged Islamic empires. Well, back to Pope Urban. His motives intertwined with aspirations to mend the East-West schism, albeit on his terms, and restore unity under papal leadership, leveraging the Byzantine plea as a bridge towards ecclesiastical reunification. In mid-1095, Urban shifted his focus towards France, his native land, by the way, and rallied a great deal of support for the crusade. The climax of his campaign was the Council of Clermont, when he delivered a stirring sermon to the assembled French nobility and clergy, a speech that has survived in various iterations through the accounts and contemporaries crusaders alike. And yes, I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but I think it's important. So let's listen to it. This is the speech of Urban II at the Council of Clermont, 1095. Most beloved brethren, urged by necessity, I, Urban, by the permission of God, Chief Bishop, and Prelate over the whole world, have come into these parts as an ambassador with a divine admonition to you, the servants of God. I hope to find you as faithful and as zealous in the service of God as I had supposed you to be. But if there is in you any deformity or crookedness contrary to God's law, with divine help, I will do my best to remove it. For God has put you as stewards over his family to minister to it. Happy indeed will you be if he finds you faithful in your stewardship. You are called shepherds. See that you do not act as hirelings. But be true shepherds, with your crooks always in your hands. Do not go to sleep, but guard on all sides the flock committed to you. For if through your carelessness or negligence a wolf carries away one of your sheep, you will surely lose the reward laid up for you with God. And after you have been bitterly scourged with remorse for your faults, you will be fiercely overwhelmed in hell, the abode of death. For according to the gospel, you are the salt of the earth. But if you fall short in your duty, how, it may be asked, can the earth be salted? Oh, how great the need of salting! 
it is indeed necessary for you to correct with the sort of wisdom this foolish people which is so devoted to the pleasures of this world, lest the Lord, when he may wish to speak to them, find them putrefied by their sins, unsalted and stinking. For if he shall find worms, that is, sins in them, because you have been negligent in your duty, he will command them as worthless to be thrown into the abyss of unclean things. And because you cannot restore to him his great loss, he will surely condemn you and drive you from his loving presence. But the man who applies his salt should be prudent, provident, modest, learned, peaceable, watchful, pious, equitable, just, and pure. For how can the ignorant teach others? How can the licentious make others modest? And how can the impure make others pure? If anyone hates peace, how can he make others peaceable? Or if anyone has soiled his hands with baseness, how can he cleanse the impurities of another? We read also that if blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. But first, correct yourselves, in order that, free from blame, you may be able to correct those who are subject to you. If you wish to be friends of God, gladly do the things which you know will please him. You must especially let all matters that pertain to the church be controlled by the law of the church. And be careful that simony does not take root among you, lest both those who buy and those who sell be beaten with the scourges of the Lord through narrow streets and driven into the place of destruction and confusion. Keep the church and the clergy in all its grades entirely free from secular power. See that the tithes that belong to God are faithfully paid from all that produce of the land. Let them not be sold or withheld. If anyone seizes a bishop, let him be treated as an outlaw. If anyone robs monks or clergymen, nuns or their servants or pilgrims or merchants, let him be the anathema. For thus it happened to the rich man in the gospel. He was not punished because he had stolen the goods of another, but because he had not used well the things that were his own. You have seen, for a long time, the great disorder in the world caused by these crimes. It is so bad in some of your provinces, I am told, and you are weak in the administration of justice, that one can hardly go along the road by day or night without being attacked by robbers, and whether at home or abroad one is in danger of being despoiled either by force or fraud. Therefore, it is necessary to reenact the truce, as it is commonly called, which was proclaimed a long time ago by our holy fathers. I exhort and demand that you, each, try hard to have this truce kept in your diocese, and if any one shall be led by his cupidity or arrogance to break this truce, by the authority of God, and with the sanction of this council, he shall be anathemized. After these and various other matters have been attended to, all who were present, clergy and people, gave thanks to God and agreed to the Pope's proposition. They all faithfully promised to keep the decrees. Then the Pope said that in another part of the world Christianity was suffering from a state of affairs that was even worse than the one he just mentioned. He continues, Although, O sons of God, 
you have promised more firmly than ever to keep the peace among yourselves and preserve the rights of the church. There remains still an important work for you to do. Freshly quickened by the divine correction, you must apply the strength of your righteousness to another matter which concerns you as well as God. For your brethren, who live in the East, are in urgent need of your help. You must hasten to give them aid, which has been promised to them. For as the most of you have heard, the Turks and the Arabs have attacked them, and have conquered the territory of Romania, as far as the shore of the Mediterranean, and even the Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the lands of those Christians, and have overcome them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many, and have destroyed the churches and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue thus for a while with impunity, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. It is on this account I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's herald to publish this everywhere and persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldiers and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians and to destroy this vile race from the lands of our friends. I say this to those who are present. It meant also for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. All who die by the way, whether by land or sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant through the power of God, with which I am invested. Oh, what a disgrace, if such a despised and base race, which worships demons, should conquer a people, which has the faith of omnipotent God, and is made glorious with the name of Christ. With what reproaches will the Lord overwhelm us, if you do not aid those who, with us, profess the Christian religion. Let those who have been accustomed unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with victory this war which should have begun long ago. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as mercenaries for small pay now obtain the eternal reward. Let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for a double honor. Behold, on this side will be the sorrowful and poor, on that side the rich, on this side the enemies of the Lord, on that his friends. Let those who do not put off the journey, but rent their lands and collect money for their expenses, and as soon as the winter is over and the spring comes, let him eagerly set out on the way with God as their guide. Pretty good speech, don't you think? Now, though the historical record of Urban's exact words is fragmented and reconstructed post facto, the essence of his appeal focused on the restoration of peace, support for the beleaguered Christians in the East, and the articulation of a holy war as a pilgrimage with its ultimate aim, perhaps implicitly, of reaching Jerusalem. Now that rallying cry that was not translated within the text, Deus lo volt, 
or just Dios Vult. God wills it. Allegedly emerged from the fervent response of, all, of Urban's audience. Encapsulating the Crusade's divine sanction in the collective imagination of Christendom. Well, contrary to the common image of French nobility leading the initial charge towards Jerusalem, it was actually a rather eclectic mix of peasants and lesser nobles who first heeded the call to the Holy Land. Inspired by Pope Urban's proclamation, they embarked on their pilgrimage months ahead of the scheduled departure. It seems they could not wait to go. Well, they rallied behind the fervent yet unofficial preacher Peter the Hermit, whose compelling oratory ignited a widespread zeal, drawing together a diverse group that, despite popular belief, included not only unskilled peasants, but also seasoned knights like Walter Sans Avoir, who led a contingent of his very own. This enthusiastic but undisciplined ensemble encountered numerous challenges long before they reached the enemy lines, engaging in unplanned skirmishes and requisitioning resources as they traversed friendly territories. Now, Walter's group, that Walter Sans Avoir, made their way through Belgrade, modern-day Serbia, and Zemun to Constantinople with relative ease, while Peter's contingent, marching independently, clashed with the Hungarians, and faced more than a few logistical challenges at Nish. Finally, united in Constantinople, Peter and Walter's forces, bolstered by an additional crusaders from across Europe, rather smaller groups comparatively, prepared for the next leg of their journey. Despite the fragmentation of another group from Bohemia and Saxony on the Hungarian border. Well, in their quest for supplies, the bands led by Peter the Hermit and Walter Sans Avoir resorted to plundering the outskirts of Constantinople. Well, this wasn't taken very kindly by the local people, of course and Alexios, Emperor of Constantinople, decided to expedite their passage across the Bosphorus as quickly as possible. Now once on the other side, their somewhat lack of discipline led them to disperse and continue their pillaging, eventually encountering the seasoned Seljuk forces near Nicaea, where they suffered a devastating loss. The siege of Zerigodon and the Battle of Sivitot saw significant defeats for the Crusaders, with key figures like Walter falling in combat, while Peter, who was conveniently absent during the confrontation, regrouped with the remnants for a subsequent crusading effort. Off to a very good start, it seems. Well, at the same time, the fervor surrounding the First Crusade's call sparked quite a bit of violence in Europe itself, notably in the Rhineland, as there were massacres against Jewish communities. Figures such as Emiko of Flonheim and other Crusade enthusiasts targeted the Jewish population in a series of very brutal attacks, driven by a mix of religious zealotry and greed. It didn't help that the Jews were the only ones practicing usury, that is, lending money at interest. I'm sure a lot of people wanted to go the quicker route of repaying their loans. Now, 
Despite the church's official stance against such violence, the massacres unfolded with more horrific consequences for the Jewish populations, particularly in Worms, Mainz and Speyer. King Coloman of Hungary found his realm in the path of a tumultuous crusade, facing and defeating two marauding bands that disrupted the peace of his kingdom. The aftermath saw the dispersal of Emiko's followers, with some integrating back into the larger official crusading force. Now, the general mobilization for the First Crusade was an endeavor of unprecedented scale, with participation estimates ranging from 70 to 100,000 individuals from across Western Europe. This call to arms, deeply rooted in strategic planning and discussions with prominent leaders like Ademar of Lepoy and Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, quickly garnered significant support among the nobility, particularly from southern France, where the call rang out for crusade the most loud. The crusading message spread far and wide, and the response was overwhelming, surpassing Pope Urban's original expectations, and it drew a diverse crowd far beyond the warrior elite, which had its own problems. Of course, many of these people had no idea how to fight, and they were not very disciplined. Hence, the mass amounts of looting and disorganization. Well, Urban's campaign faced challenges in managing this response, particularly in his efforts to restrict participation to those who were capable of enduring the rigors of such an undertaking. It's a long way to travel from France to the Holy Land and even further afield. But despite all of these intentions, the ranks swelled, predominantly with peasants, embodying a new wave of religious fervor and personal commitment to the cause. In fact, one must remember that back in those days, for the most part, if you went to war, you had to bring your own armor. People were rushing out, selling whatever they had, so they could buy a sword and perhaps a leather tunic, as that was the main, main go for most people if they weren't just wearing some cloth armor which barely counts as armor at all. Either way, they were getting on the bandwagon. Now, unraveling this multitude of motivations driving the crusaders gives us an even more complex challenge, as the historical records primarily focus on the nobility, as they always do, and those tales are often narrated through the lens of ecclesiastical writers. Well, it's widely accepted that a profound sense of personal devotion played a significant role for many, ranging from the humblest foot soldier to the highest ranking noble. Urban II's rallying cry was heard by everybody, and that of course included key figures from the French aristocracy. Thus, the movement was bolstered by such leaders as Godfrey of Bouillon and Beaumont of Toronto, alongside their kin and comrades, each bringing their own aspirations and personal convictions to the cause. Everybody had an agenda. Now, the journey to Constantinople saw the crusading forces take diverging paths. Godfrey opted for the overland route through the Balkans, while Raymond of Toulouse and his Provençals 
hugged the Illyrian coast before turning eastward. Bohemond and Tancred, with their Norman contingent, sailed to Durazzo and proceeded over land. Upon their arrival they were in dire need for positions, provisions rather, and they anticipated support from Alexios. However, Alexios, weary about the prior encounters with the People's Crusade, and cautious of Norman leaders like Bohemond, known for previous incursions into Byzantine land, greeted them with a mixture of preparedness and suspicion, managing to narrowly avoid the earlier issues that had marred their passage. Fortunately, this time, there wasn't as much looting. But the story's not over yet. There'll be plenty more looting later on, friends. Now, contrary to the Crusaders' expectations of Alexios assuming command, after all, this was his idea, the Emperor focused on facilitating their swift passage into Asia Minor, tying assistance to the pledges of fealty and return of any reclaimed lands to Byzantine control. Of course, that's a little unfair, isn't it? You can't expect everybody to do the heavy lifting and then just give you all the rewards. Well, this condition led to tense moments and near conflict within the walls of Constantinople itself. With most leaders, save for Raymond of Toulouse, who agreed to a non-aggression pact, reluctantly swearing allegiance to Alexios. Well, with the oaths secured, Alexios provided strategic counsel for implementing confrontations with the Seljuks, marking a crucial moment of cooperation and quite a bit of compromise between the Byzantine Empire and the Crusading forces. Now, this is where things really begin to heat up. In the early months of 1097, the Crusader armies advanced into Asia Minor, their ranks bolstered by the remnants of Peter the Hermit's force. They were also accompanied by the Byzantine generals, Manuel Botomitz and Tatikos, underscoring Emperor Alexios's commitment to the Crusade's success. Their initial target was set, and it was Nicaea, the erstwhile Byzantine city now serving as the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum's capital under Kilij Arslan. Now Arslan was preoccupied with conflicts in central Anatolia, and, underestimating the strength of the Crusaders, probably because of what happened before, left his treasury and his family vulnerable. Thus, the siege of Nicaea began on the 14th of May, 1097. Hearing about this, Kilij Arslan definitely hastened his return. But, despite his efforts, on the 16th of May, a mere two days later, the Seljuk Sultan's counterattack faltered against the substantial Crusader forces. This did, however, lead to significant casualties on both sides. The Crusader armies initially struggled to fully encircle Nicaea, hampered by the city's strategic positioning on Lake Iznik, which allowed for continued provisioning. The situation shifted once again dramatically with the innovative overland transport of Crusader ships to the lake, prompting the Turkish garrison's surrender on the 18th of June of the same year, 1097. 
Now in the aftermath of the victory at Nasea, the Franks were a little bit disappointed because they had issued a directive against looting, which everybody was rather looking forward to doing some, well, a good afternoon's worth of looting after the battle. Is that not the reward for conquest? However, Alexios's financial compensations did ease these tensions, and despite later chronicles suggesting strained relations, contemporaneous accounts like that of Stefan of Bloy to his wife Adela indicate a spirit of collaboration and goodwill between the Greeks and Franks at this juncture. Well, by late June, the Crusaders advanced deeper into Anatolia, flanked by Byzantine forces led by Tatikios, with aspirations that Emperor Alexios would dispatch additional Byzantine reinforcements. To enhance maneuverability, the Crusader army split into two factions, the Normans and the French, planning a reunion at Doraleum. However, on the 1st of July, Gilij Arslan ambushed the advanced Norman group. Despite a significant numerical disadvantage, the Normans formed a defensive circle to protect their non-combatants, and urgently signalled for assistance from the French contingent. The battle continued with the arrival of the French forces. Godfrey of Bouillon managed to penetrate the Turkish encirclement, while the venerable legatee Adamar initiated a decisive rear assault. Surprised by the swift French support and resilience of the Normans, Arslan's forces withdrew, thwarting his plans to annihilate the Norman contingent. This victory at Dorleum ensured a unchallenged passage through Anatolia for the Crusaders, albeit through a scorched earth led by Arslan's strategic retreat, exacerbating the Crusaders' struggle with the harsh summer conditions, scarcity of food and water. Oh, and if you don't know what a scorched earth policy is, effectively, if you are retreating, you don't want to leave behind you nice farmland and berries to pick off trees and all the rest. You want to leave everything burned and nothing for the enemy army to eat. Well, that certainly makes chasing you a lot more difficult. Well, despite occasional support, and I mean occasional support from local Christians, the Crusaders often had to resort to looting for sustenance, and this underscores the expedition's precarious logistics, once again a long, long way from home. Along with this, leadership disputes persisted among the Crusader chiefs, yet none possessed the authority to claim command solidifying Adamar's role as a kind of spiritual compass of the First Crusade. Venturing beyond the Silesian gates, Baldwin and Tancred embarked on divergent paths towards the lands of Armenia, fueled by Baldwin's ambition to carve out his own dominion within the Holy Land. And it's not Baldwin the Fourth, by the way, before you ask. Now relying on local Armenian support, notably from the adventurous Bagrat, they separated their forces after leaving Heraclea on the 15th of September. Tancred's swift arrival at Tarsus saw him coaxing the Seljuk defenders to accept his banner atop the citadel, only for Baldwin to follow subsequent suit the subsequent next day, gaining control over key defensive positions. Well, despite being completely outnumbered, Tancred opted against conflict over the city. 
The situation began to escalate when Norman reinforcements were barred entry by Baldwin, leading to their slaughter by the Turks, a tragedy for which Baldwin's troops held him responsible, resulting in a retaliatory massacre of the soldier garrison. In the aftermath, Baldwin secured the loyalty of Gunamer of Bologna, a pirate who sailed up to Tarsus by enlisting his crew for the city's defences, furthering his campaign's ambitions. Meanwhile, Tancred had claimed Mamistra, only for tensions to flare upon Baldwin's arrival, driven by Norman desires for retribution over Tarsus. This discord saw Baldwin departing for Mirage, yet Bagrat's persuasion led him to campaign through Armenian populated areas, culminating in the capture of strategic fortresses by the year's end, with Bagrat appointed as Ravendel's governor. In the early part of 1098, Baldwin was beckoned to Edessa by Lord Thoros, seeking aid against Seljuk encroachments. Baldwin's departure to Edessa was marked by the detention and interrogation of Bagrat, who was suspected of Seljuk collusion, and a harried journey beset by Balduk of Samosata's forces. Baldwin's entry into Edessa heralded a pivotal alliance, as Thoros conferred upon him a co-regency, solidified by military reinforcements from Edessa. This coalition enabled Baldwin to finally confront Balduk, securing a strategic foothold near Samosata, amidst regional power dynamics profoundly influenced by Baldwin's burgeoning leadership and evolving crusader presence. Well, not long after Baldwin's victorious return, the tranquility of Edessa was shattered by a conspiracy among the local aristocracy, seemingly with Baldwin's tacit approval. Very sneaky. This led, as it always does, to a violent uprising, forcing Thoros to seek sanctuary within the city's walls. Baldwin now seen as Thoros's heir, vowed protection. However, on the 9th of March, when insurgents stormed the citadel, taking the lives of Thoros and his spouse, Baldwin's intervention was notably absent. It's funny how that works. Sure, it's just a coincidence. The following dawn witnessed Baldwin's elevation to Count of Edessa by the citizenry, marking the inception of the Crusader states. Now, the Byzantine Empire, having relinquished Edessa to Seljuk control years earlier, voiced zero opposition to Baldwin's new title, not a single objection. This strategic victory not only fortified Baldwin's position, but also ensured vital resources for the Crusaders' campaign towards Antioch, acting as a bulwark against Seljuk advances and securing essential supplies. Back in Edessa, Baldwin's governance was characterized by shrewd diplomacy and strategic matrimonial alliances marrying Arda of Armenia, thereby solidifying his position and fostering integration with the local populace. His acquisition of Samosata through negotiations with Balduk marked a pioneering peaceful accord between the Crusader and Muslim leaderships, showcasing Baldwin's adeptness in both warfare but also diplomacy. That being said, Balduk was in no position to bargain. Now this whole narrative of Edessa 
is further enriched by figures such as Belek Ghazi, the Artukid Emir, Emir is a word for prince in Arabic, with familial ties to Seljuk governors, who initially aligned with Baldwin. However, the siege of Saruj, Baldwin's strategic demands, and the subsequent execution of Balduk underscore this precarious balance of power. The defense of Edessa against Gerboga's formidable siege later on highlighted Baldwin's resilient leadership, inadvertently aiding the crusaders' pivotal triumph at Antioch, and setting a precedent for the enduring legacy of the crusaders' states in the Levant. The Crusading Forces now with Baldwin and Tancred, and a good dose of confidence, advanced towards Antioch, a city renowned for its formidable defences, but also its strategic position. All in all, it was incredibly important. They had to have it. Stephen of Blois, in correspondence, depicted Antioch as an immensely fortified and seemingly unconquerable city. In October 1097, the Crusaders laid siege, hoping for Antioch's surrender through coercion, or perhaps if they were really lucky, internal betrayal, a method that had seen the city's allegiance switch between the Byzantines and the Seljuks previously. Well, despite their efforts, the vastness of Antioch allowed it to remain partially supplied, prolonging the Crusaders' endeavor and labeling the siege of Antioch as notably significant in the history of sieges itself. Now this prolonged siege was so very special. It stretched over eight months. I mean, if you thought lockdown was bad, well, this was just as bad, truly. And it saw the Crusaders grappling with starvation, attributed by Adamar to their sinfulness. Yes, that's right. He had told them that it was all their fault, and they should just imagine the food. Well, this led to strict fasts, prayers, and for some reason they decided to kick out all of the women. No girls allowed. Adamar, I think, perhaps had some issues of his own. But that speculation... Well, because of this, desertions became common, including that of Stephen of Blois. Relief did come through foraging and aid from allies, notably via supplies from Cilicia and Edessa, and the newly seized ports of Latakia and St. Simeon, alongside a crucial English fleet bearing provisions in March. And it wasn't just that. The Muslim world's fragmented state further played to the Crusaders' advantage, missing a pivotal opportunity to oust the besiegers with united forces. Well, the infighting on both sides was bad, but sometimes it was worse on the other side, and you could capitalize on that. Now Kerboga's ambitious coalition aimed to expand his dominance to the Mediterranean, but was delayed at Saruj, crucially affecting the siege's outcome. Bohemond's negotiation with an Armenian commander of Antioch's defences led to a clandestine entry on the 2nd of June, allowing the Crusaders to take the city in a violent sack indiscriminately killing Muslims and Christians alike amidst the chaos. It was just a uncontrolled bloodbath. A sack 
of a city is never a good time. Well, upon Kerboga's approach on the 4th of June, his substantial force encircled the Crusaders, initiating a relentless assault for several days starting with the 10th of June. With the situation dire, Bohemond and Adhemar sealed the city's exits to prevent a collapse from within. Shifting strategies, Kerboga aimed to starve them into submission, which is, by the way, how most sieges went. While well, the discovery of the Holy Lance by Peter Bartholomew claimed to have been revealed in a divine vision, offered a fleeting morale boost. Though its true impact is debated, given the two-week gap before the decisive confrontation and, come on, the Holy Lance? Well, as long as you believe it, I suppose it has as much power as you want it to. Well, as surrender negotiations failed on the 24th of June, the Crusaders, against all odds, sallied forth on the 28th of June, surprisingly maintaining cohesion against a comparatively disorganized Muslim assault. And this resulted in a significant victory for the outnumbered Crusaders, with the Muslim forces ultimately retreating in disarray and confusion, the Christians had won the day. Good job, boys. Now Stephen of Blois, upon witnessing Antioch's rather grim circumstance, effectively abandoned the cause. Informing Emperor Alexios of their seemingly impending doom, which contributed to a narrative of abandonment by Alexios, used by Bohemond to justify his claim over Antioch. This contention led to internal disputes among the Crusaders, delayed by their differing origins and personal ambitions, further complicated by a devastating plague that claimed Adamar, among others. Yeah, but honestly, Adamar was no big loss. The year's end saw the Crusaders, desperate and diminished, resorting to cannibalism after the siege at Marat al numan an act which was unrecorded by contemporary Muslim sources. Don't hear about that very much, don't you? Well, despite leadership conflicts and the whole eating each other thing, the march towards Jerusalem resumed in early 1099, with Bohemond remaining in Antioch, thus founding the first Crusader state. As the Crusader forces advanced along the Mediterranean coast towards Jerusalem, they encountered comparatively minimal resistance. Local rulers chose negotiation over conflict, supplying the Crusaders rather than engaging in battle. The Crusader army's hierarchy saw changes too. Robert Curtos and Tancred pledged their allegiance to Raymond IV of Toulouse, attracted by his wealth and the promise of compensation. In contrast, Godfrey of Bouillon bolstered his brother's achievements in Indessa, declined Raymond's overtures. January saw Raymond lead a procession towards Jerusalem, a symbolic march aimed at demonstrating piety and determination with Robert and Tancred and their armies in tow. Raymond's ambition extended beyond Jerusalem, by the way. He eyed Tripoli for the establishment of a domain to rival Bohemond's Antioch. 
This led to the protracted siege of Arca in February 1099. Meanwhile, Godfrey and allies, including Robert of Flanders and the recently independent Tancred, converged on Arca, reinforcing the siege. The Crusades' leadership faced a good deal of turmoil, particularly after the divisive ordeal by fire concerning the Holy Lance, which severely dented Raymond's credibility. Wasn't so holy after all, hmm? Well, failing to capture Arca, the Crusaders rejected a Fatimid proposal for a peaceful pilgrimage and continued to push on towards the holy city of Jerusalem. The Fatimid governor, aware of the impending threat, took drastic measures to hinder the crusader advance. Yet the crusader's march continued unabated, receiving support from Tripoli's emir and reaching abandoned Ramallah. Upon sighting Jerusalem, the culmination of their long and arduous journey, the Crusaders were overwhelmed with emotion. They'd gotten to the holy city. Their campaign, marked by faith, ambition, and strife, now faced its ultimate test at the holy city's gates. Upon reaching Jerusalem, the Crusaders were met with a surprisingly desolate landscape, devoid of any essential supplies, and always under the looming threat of Fatimid retaliation. The option to lay siege, similar to their strategy at Antioch, was deemed to be unfeasible due to their depleted numbers and resources. Well, consequently, they opted for a direct assault on the city. At this juncture, the Crusader forces had dwindled to an estimated 12,000, including only 1,500 cavalry. Remember, they set off with about 100,000? Well, they certainly dwindled away, didn't they? Well... This desperate situation necessitated a decisive move for Jerusalem's capture. They had to get in. Otherwise, they would simply be starving to death outside the city's walls. Or just going back to eating each other. Now, the cohesion among these varied contingents was at a nadir, with Godfrey and Tancred positioning to the city's north, and Raymond to the south, and at this point their unity was quite fragmented, evident in the Provençal's troops' absence from the initial attack on the 13th of June. This first attempt, more exploratory than forceful, ended in failure as they breached the outer, but not the inner, wall. In response to this setback, the leaders held the meeting, concluding that a united, forceful assault was imperative. The arrival of the Genoese mariners, led by Guglielmo Imbracchio, sorry about uh, butchering that one, at Jaffa on the 17th of June, proved fortuitous, bringing not only skilled engineers, but also critical supplies including the timber that was needed for siege machinery. The crusaders' spirits were further uplifted by Peter Desiderius's vision, which likened their forthcoming victory to the biblical conquest of Jericho, prescribing a fast, followed by a barefoot procession around Jerusalem's walls. The sight of this most likely would have provoked quite an interesting reaction from the guards looking down upon them. Now, complying, the Crusaders observed a fast on the 8th of July, 
and encircled the city walls, slowly walking around them, culminating in their march on the Mount of Olives, with a sermon from Peter the Hermit as the main event of the day. This act of unity was timely, as news of an advancing Fatimid army from Egypt reached them, underscoring the urgency of their mission to breach Jerusalem's defenses. The ultimate assault commenced on the 13th of July, with Raymond's forces targeting the southern gate and others the northern wall. Initial efforts by the Provencals at the south gate struggled, but those attacking the north gradually got through, and the city's defences eroded. Well, by the 15th of July, two days later, a concerted effort enabled the crusaders to breach the inner northern rampart, causing a collapse in the defenders' resolve and opening the city to the invaders. The entry into Jerusalem was marked by widespread killing, contrasting sharply with the crusaders' spiritual zeal. And despite varying historical interpretations of the scale of the massacre, contemporary accounts are pretty much all agreeing that it was a rather brutal one. The massacre also extended all the way to the Temple Mount, where defenders were ruthlessly killed until Tancred's invention spared those in Al-Aqsa Mosque. The southern defenders, learning of the breach, fled, and Raymond's forces entered the city under an agreement with the garrison commander for safe passage. Well, regardless of this, the bloodshed persisted, targeting both Jews and Muslims equally, with the former perishing in a synagogue where they were all forced and put into and well, then the Crusaders lit it on fire. Not a good way to go. Well, despite the horror, many city inhabitants managed to survive. Sometimes through escape, or perhaps by ransom. Others, reportedly, managed to say, Wait, 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 don't kill me. Here's a bag of gold. Let me go works sometimes. Well, the city's eastern Christian residents had previously been expelled, so they weren't around to see all of this, and very lucky that they weren't, because they may have been confused. Of course, they may have been killed along with everybody else. I mean, how different would they really have looked? I'm sure God would not have liked that one, wouldn't he? Now, the 22nd of July. On this day, a pivotal meeting took place within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, aimed at deciding the leadership and governance of Jerusalem. The absence of a clear ecclesiastical authority, due to the recent death of the Greek patriarch, left a void for secular governance, a concept that was actually supported by quite a many people. Now Raymond of Toulouse, despite being a leading figure in the Crusades since 1098, saw his influence gradually wane away, particularly after his unsuccessful siege at Arca and his failed efforts to carve out a territory for himself. He was still somewhat trying to get over the embarrassment. But everybody else knew. It's very hard to forget. His refusal of the crown, citing that only Christ was worthy to be king, could have been a strategy to encourage others to decline the role. Yet Godfrey of Bullion was quite undeterred. Give me that crown, he said. 
likely bolstered by his commanding Lorrainian army and his noble lineage. Of course, the nobility was only noble because it was a right hand down from God, correct? Well, consequently, Godfrey was chosen as the ruler, adopting the title Advocatus Sancti Sepulcri, or Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. This election also managed to rather ruffle some feathers, especially Raymond's, who made a brief but futile attempt to take the Tower of David, before simply giving up and leaving the city with his tail between his legs. Now, it was around this time that the visionary behind the First Crusade, Pope Urban II, actually passed away. Indeed, he passed away on July 29th, 1099, but at this time he was unaware of Jerusalem's fall to the Crusaders. His successor, Pope Pascal II, would lead the church for nearly two decades following these monumental events. And of course, Jerusalem. Well, that city's fate would continue to oscillate back and forth. Held by the Kingdom of Jerusalem until 1291, but briefly falling under Muslim control after Saladin's victory at the Battle of Hattin in 1187. But of course, that's for the next video on the Crusades. Now, in the heat of August 1099, the Fatimid vizier al afdal Shahan Shah orchestrated a landing at Ascalon with a formidable contingent of 20,000 troops from North Africa. In response, Geoffrey and Raymond led a considerably smaller force of 1,200 knights and 9,000 infantry to confront the Fatimids on August 9th at the Battle of Ascalon. Despite facing a two-to-one numerical disadvantage, the Crusaders decided on a surprise attack at dawn, a very cheeky one, catching the overly confident and ill-prepared Fatimid army completely off guard, and massacring a good deal of them. A very staggering and strategic victory. However, it wasn't all good news. Internal conflicts between Godfrey and Raymond squandered a pivotal chance to capture that city, as disagreements over leadership prevented the city's garrison from capitulating to Raymond, whom they deemed more trustworthy. This significant triumph didn't translate into any real territorial gain at all, and Ascalon simply remained under Muslim control putting an ongoing military challenge to the newly formed Crusader Kingdom. Following their vows, a significant portion of the Crusaders deemed their pilgrimage fulfilled and opted to return to their homelands, leaving behind a mere 300 knights and 2,000 infantry to safeguard Palestine. Godfrey's ascendancy to Jerusalem's leadership was chiefly supported by the knights from Lorraine, who, upon his demise after just a year, opposed the Papal League Dagobert of Pisa's intent to transform Jerusalem into a theocracy. Instead, they championed Baldwin to become the inaugural Latin king of Jerusalem. Bohemond, well, he set off back to Europe, aiming to confront the Byzantines from Italy, yet he suffered a defeat in 1108 at Dyrrhachium. Raymond? Well, he died, and following his death, his successors with aid from Genoa succeeded in seizing Tripoli in 1109. 
Now these brand shiny new crusader states, the county of Edessa and the principality of Antioch, showcased rather fluctuating alliances. They jointly faced defeat at the Battle of Haran in 1104, yet Antioch was the one that asserted dominance, even obstructing Baldwin II of Jerusalem's return post-capture at the battle. This era marked the Franks' deep entrenchment into Near Eastern politics, leading to frequent conflicts between Muslims and Christians. Antioch's ambitions for expansion were dramatically halted, following a devastating loss to the Turks at the Battle of Ager Sanguinus. This crusade left behind mixed legacies across Europe. Those who turned back before reaching Jerusalem, as well as those who never departed Europe, faced ridicule and threats of excommunication upon the Crusade's triumphant conclusion. Conversely, survivors who reached Jerusalem were hailed as heroes, with Robert II of Flanders earning the moniker Hiero Solimantinus for his feats. The subsequent Crusade of 1101 saw the return of figures such as Stephen of Blois and Hugh of Vermandois, who had previously retreated, though this force faced near destruction in Asia Minor, and its remnants bolstered the Jerusalem kingdom upon arrival. The Second Crusade stands as a testament to the interplay of religious fervor, political intrigue, and military ambition that characterized the medieval period. Launched in response to the fall of the county of Edessa to Muslim forces, this crusade was marked by the mobilization of the mightiest rulers of Christendom. Yet, despite its grand intentions and the significant resources committed, this crusade culminated in failure and dissolution. The campaign's outcomes not only deepened the rift between the European powers, but also between the Christian and Muslim worlds, setting the stage for future conflicts of the crusading era. Hello, welcome. If you're new to the channel, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to have you again. If you'd like to support the channel, Links to the Patreon are in the description and comments, otherwise a like, comment and subscribe goes a very, very long way. Now, without further ado, let's begin our topic for today, a full history of the Second Crusade. Now, of course, if you've not watched my first Crusade video, perhaps it would be prudent of you to do so before you watch this one. There are some returning characters. Or, if you just want to watch this one, let's get busy. Following the initial crusade, and the subsequent minor crusade of 1101, the crusaders established three principal states in the Levant, being the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Principality of Antioch, and the County of Edessa, with the county of Tripoli joining them later in 1109. Positioned furthest north and being the most vulnerable, Edessa had faced constant threats from neighboring Muslim territories, including the Danishmen's, Ortakids, and especially the Seljuk Turks. Baldwin II of Edessa later succeeded by Jocelyn of Cordenay, experienced capture alongside Jocelyn following the Battle of Haran in 1104, and both were captured again in 1122. Well, despite some recovery after the Battle of Azaz in 1125, Jocelyn was slain in combat in 1131. His heir, Jocelyn II, 
found a rather uneasy ally in the Byzantine Empire. But the deaths of John II Komnenos and Fulk of Anjou later in 1143 left Edessa without strong allies. Further weakened by disputes with Tripoli and Antioch. Now over on the other side, Zengi, the Artebek of Mosul, expanded his domain to include Aleppo in 1128, thereby positioning himself as a central figure in the Syrian power dynamic contested between Mosul and Damascus the two largest cities at the time, albeit Damascus was quite a bit larger. The rivalry extended to Baldwin II of Jerusalem, who faced defeat near Damascus in 1129. Despite the Burid dynasty of Damascus forming an alliance with King Fulk against Zengi's sieges in 1139 and 1130, brokered by Uzma ibn Munkid, Zengi maintained his influence. The Fall of Edessa In the December of 1144 marked a significant turning point. Jocelyn's attempt to assist the Ortigids against Aleppo left Edessa completely open and vulnerable and this allowed Zengi to move in and swiftly capture the city. Despite reinforcements from Jerusalem that perhaps arrived a little bit too late, Edessa was lost, with Jocelyn II retreating to govern what remained of his holdings from Turbacel, much smaller and less grand position. Now over time, it just got worse. The remaining lands of Edessa were either overtaken by Muslims or ceded to the Byzantines. That was the Eastern Roman Empire. Zengi, well, he was hailed as a hero in the Muslim world. Of course, he took back the old territories, didn't he? But he did not extend his campaign to Antioch, or the remaining Edessan territories. And no wonder, Antioch had the highest walls in the region. It was incredibly difficult for the Crusaders to take that one, and they would not let that go without significant amounts of boiling water from the ramparts. Well, Zengi's return to Mosul, and subsequent assassination in 1146, left the legacy to his son, Nur ad-Din, who continued his father's ambitions in Syria. Finally, the unsettling news of Edessa's capture managed to reach Europe through pilgrims and official messengers from Antioch, Jerusalem, and Armenia in the early 1145. Pope Eugene III was informed by Bishop Hugh of Jabala, leading to the issuance of the papal bull Quantum Predisores in December 1145, which, of course, called for a brand shiny new crusade. Of course, the first one went quite well, albeit once they got over the few speed bumps, they managed to take a lot of territory. Another crusade, well, we just follow the old formula, right? Well, we shall see. Now, during his report, Hugh of Jabala also introduced the legend of Prester John, a mythical eastern monarch believed to perhaps come to the crusaders' aid. 
Apparently this Prester John was out there somewhere in the Middle East with this formidable Christian army, this crusader of force of unmatched power that would show up. If you build it, they will come. That kind of situation. Now, operating from Viterbo, due to his lack of control over Europe, Pope Eugene aimed for the Second Crusade to be a more coordinated effort, with Europe's mightiest monarchs at the helm and a prearranged path, marking a departure from the somewhat chaotic nature of the First Crusade. Once again, if you want to know how bad that was, just go and watch the First Crusade video. Bernard of Clairvaux, a French abbot, was tasked by the Pope personally to go around and promote this crusade, offering indulgences similar to those promised for the First Crusade, albeit if you come to the Holy Land, then your sins will be forgiven, and everyone was quite keen on signing up for this, which makes one tend to think that they must have been sinning to quite a degree. Well, at a gathering in Vesely in 1146, Bernard's impassioned preaching persuaded King Louis VII of France and other nobles to take up the cross and join the crusade. His mission then continued in Germany, where miracles reported in his wake further bolstered the crusade's goal. Citation needed on that one, I think. Either way, this led to Conrad III of Germany and his nephew Frederick Barbarossa to commit to the cause as well, two very big names. So now you had Germany and France. That's a pretty good roster. The kind of people that you want on your team if you're marching halfway across the world to kick some heads in. Now, despite Bernard's fervent advocacy, the Crusades' call led to some rather unintended violence against Jews in the Rhineland, which was incited mainly by a zealous monk known only as Rudolf. Bernard, alongside Archbishops Arnold of Cologne and Henry Maines, decided to intervene in this, condemning the violence and restoring peace. And you must remember, Jews were not Christians, right? And this was a war against the enemies of God. Well, non-Christians, enemies of God. Well, not a good time to be uh, living in that area, let's just say. Now, in 1147, the crusade expanded to the Iberian Peninsula, that's down near Spain, aligning with the Reconquista efforts against the Moors. This same year saw English crusaders assist at the siege of Lisbon, that's in Portugal, aiding King Alonso of Portugal in capturing the city after a very prolonged and difficult siege. This engagement marked a notable instance of crusaders settling in conquered territories, influencing the region's Christian reconquest efforts. And simultaneously, forces under Alfonso VII of Lyon and Count Raymond Berenguer IV targeted Almeria, leveraging naval support for a successful conquest. The Crusaders' efforts extended to Valencia and Murcia, with subsequent campaigns leading to the capture of Tortosa and other key locations, further embedding the Crusader presence in Iberia's martial and political landscape. Well, the Islamic areas during the time of the Crusades, 
Their military was a rather formidable one, and it primarily consisted of very well-trained and very well-equipped ethnic Turkish professional soldiers. The core of this military might was sustained through a system named as the ICTA, which allocated land fiefs responsible for supporting a designated quota of soldiers. During conflicts, the urban-based Adath militias, who were predominantly Arab, supplemented the professional ranks under the leadership of the Rais, or city chief. Although these militias might not have matched the professional soldiers in training, their enthusiasm and further, often fueled by the concept of jihad, compensated for their lack of polished combat skills. Running off pure anger, it seems. You know what it's like. Now additionally, Turkoman and Kurdish auxiliary forces were mobilized during wars, as they were known for their fighting spirit albeit sometimes lacking discipline. Now, Mu'in al-Din Anur, the Artebeg of Damascus from 1138 to 1149, emerged as a preeminent military and political figure of the era. While officially under the nominal rule of the Burid Amirs, Anur wielded actual control notably for his military acumen and as a cultivator of the arts. Historians note that Anur's contributions to thwarting the Second Crusade were overshadowed by su subsequent political shifts that favoured the Zengid's dynasty, which regulated his achievements to the background of the historical narrative. It seems the Zengid's were rather taking credit for the group project. Now back to the crusading armies. The crusading armies displayed a diverse tactical preference, with French knights showing a predilection for cavalry maneuvers, excelling in speed and coordination, while their German counterparts showed a stronger inclination towards infantry engagements demonstrating superior skill in swordsmanship. Tactical diversity underscored the varied martial traditions within the crusading forces, and when you think about it, does it not seem so culturally French to be mounted, being all fancy, and so culturally German just to run in and start stabbing with a sword? I think so. Well, to the leadership of the crusade, we saw figures like Conrad III, who was praised for his valour, yet critiqued for hesitancy in critical juncture. And of course, Louis VII, whose piety and affection for his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, sometimes drew criticism from his contemporaries for perceived distractions from martial and political pursuits. England's King Stephen actually abstained from joining the crusade, since he was preoccupied with a good amount of domestic strife. And King David I of Scotland was somewhat similarly deterred from the crusade, illustrating the complex web of social considerations that influence the different areas of the time. Now, back to Jocelyn II. Edessa was gone, and everybody wanted it back. That was the whole cause of this mission, the whole cause of this new crusade, to retake Edessa. So Jocelyn, in a bold move, managed to recapture it, and he laid siege to its fortress following the assassination of Zengi. 
but his triumph was very short-lived, as Nur ad-Din emerged victorious in a further clash of November 1146. Well, the planning of the French crusaders took a crucial turn during a meeting at Etampes on the 16th of February 1147, when discussion centered on the choice of route to the Holy Land. Now, the Germans favored an overland journey through Hungary, citing political tensions with Roger II of Sicily as a deterrent to a maritime approach. Well, of course, the French nobility found themselves at somewhat of a crossroads, wary of traversing the Byzantine Empire due to lingering mistrust from the experiences of the First Crusade, still had a poor taste in their mouth from that one, especially because of Alexios Komnenos. Not very reliable. Ultimately, the decision was made to align with Conrad's overland strategy, setting a departure date of the 15th of June, despite Roger II's consequent withdrawal from the crusade. Now, back in France, the absence of the king on crusade prompted the selection of Abbot Suger as regent, a decision sanctioned by the Pope, and made during the significant Council of Atampes. Meanwhile, the German contingent saw Adam of Ebrach and Otto of Friesling championing the crusading cause, with departure delays pushing their start from Easter to May, marking a period of preparation and intense anticipation across the crusading nations. Everybody was very keen to get going at this point. The Second Crusade's German contingent, under Conrad III, and the guidance of Cardinal Theodwin, aimed for a rendezvous with the French in Constantinople. Joining forces with Ottokar III of Styria, not Syria, Styria, in Vienna, they gained safe passage through Hungary courtesy of Geza II. However, upon entering the lands of the Byzantines, tensions began to flare up. Skirmishes broke out near Philippopolis and Adrianople, pitting the Germans against the Byzantine forces led by General Prosok, including an encounter with Frederick Barbarossa himself. Well, misfortune struck when floods claimed German lives in early September, and by the 10th of September the Germans finally reached Constantinople, facing a strained relationship with Emperor Manuel I Komnenos. Manuel's request for German troops to defend against Roger II's raid in Greece was rebuffed by Conrad. Can't blame them for not being in the mood. In Asia Minor, Conrad pressed forward towards Iconium, not bothering to wait for the French. His forces were divided, with knights and elite troops marching overland, and the remainder, who were led under Bishop Otto of Friesling, taking a route down the coast. This journey proved very perilous, as the region was largely under Turkish control, contradicting Conrad's expectations of Byzantine authority. On October the 25th, 1147, the Seljuk Turks met Conrad's forces in battle and decimated them at the Second Battle of Doraleum. The Germans then faced relentless Turkish assaults during their retreat to Constantinople, with Conrad sustaining a few rather serious injuries. 
Meanwhile, Otto's contingent also suffered a catastrophic defeat near Laodicea in the November of 1147. This series of setbacks made things a lot more perilous for the Crusaders' journey, and certainly more than a few eyebrows were raised among the leadership. How could it possibly be going so wrong? Departing from Metz in June 1147, the French contingent of the Second Crusade, under the leadership of King Louis VII, embarked on their journey toward the Holy Land. Encumbered by notable figures such as Thierry of Alsace, Renaud I of Bar, and Amadeus III of Savoy, among others from various French regions, including Lorraine, Brittany, Burgundy, and Aquitaine, they charted a course similar to that of the Germans. In contrast, Alphonse of Toulouse and his Provencal force opted for a maritime route, delaying their departure until August. The French ranks swelled with crusaders from Normandy and England who met at Worms, but faced tensions with King Gezer of Hungary over the inclusion of Boris Kalamos, a Hungarian pretender king, in their ranks. Now this friction was just indicative of the uneasy passage through territories that remembered the First Crusade's less savoury actions. Well, the French, upon entering Byzantine lands, encountered a changed political landscape. Emperor Manuel Komnenos had opted for a strategic truce with the Seljuk Sultan Mesud I, redirecting his focus towards the potentially treacherous crusaders, who had in the past exhibited a propensity for looting and a possible interest in Constantinople itself. Well, despite this backdrop of suspicion, and the recent memory of the Crusades, the First Crusades, rather, excesses, the French were somewhat well received, with an even more surprising degree of hospitality in Constantinople. However, this warm welcome did not completely assuage the tensions, as some French crusaders voiced their dissatisfaction with Manuel's truce with the Seljuks, and proposed a bold, if not reckless alliance with Roger III to attack Constantinople itself. King Louis VII, prioritizing the pilgrimage's sanctity and strategic coherence over internal dissent, managed to keep such radical propositions at bay, emphasizing the precarious balance between crusading zeal and political pragmatism. Now, upon their assembly in Constantinople, the crusader forces from Morverne, Savoy, and Montferrat, having journeyed all the way over land from Italy through Brindisi to Durazzo, embarked on ships to cross the Bosphorus into Asia Minor. Despite the optimistic rumors of German successes at Iconium, Emperor Manuel Komnenos withheld military support from the Byzantines, citing the need to defend against Roger II of Sicily's incursions into the Peloponnese. Thus, unlike their predecessors in the First Crusade, the French and the Germans ventured into Asia Minor without local assistance. In adherence to a precedent established by his grandfather, Alexios, Manuel secured an oath from the French that any reconquered territories would be immediately restored 
to the Byzantine Empire. While the French contingent, now bolstered by the remnants of Conrad III's forces, advanced towards the Mediterranean coast, aiming for their goal, Ephesus. Despite receiving admonishments from Byzantine envoys regarding the pillaging conducted by Louis' troops, and the looming threat of further Turkic aggression, the Crusaders continued to press on. The anticipation of a Turkish assault began to materialize at the Battle of Ephesus, where the French managed to emerge victorious on Christmas Eve of 1147. This triumph was soon followed by another battle of the Meander. Things seem to be turning around. The battle is turning in our favor. However, the crusade's momentum faltered upon reaching Laodicea in the early January of 1148, as the vanguard, led by Amadeus of Savoy, were ambushed at the Battle of Mont Cadmus, resulting in significant losses. In a perilous situation, King Louis VII found himself evading Turkish detection. The continuous harassment by Turkish forces and the scorched earth strategy they employed compelled Louis to abandon the overland route in favor of a naval passage to Antioch from Adalia. However, things did not go to plan, and it was thwarted by a delay in the arrival of the promised naval support, forcing the majority of the crusaders to undertake a grueling march to Antioch. This journey decimated the ranks through combat losses from ambushes and disease, and it very nearly obliterated the entire army. Upon his arrival in Antioch on March 19th, Louis was greeted warmly by Raymond of Poitiers, Eleanor's uncle. Raymond harbored hopes that Louis would aid in the defense against the Turks and join a campaign against Aleppo, a strategic city on the route to Edessa. However, Louis opted to continue his pilgrimage to Jerusalem rather than engage in further military endeavors. Eleanor found pleasure in her stay at Antioch, yet faced pressure from Raymond to stay put and help expand their familial territory. He even went so far to suggest divorce if he refused to commit to the Crusade's military objectives. Amidst this, rumors surfaced of a romantic entanglement between Eleanor and Raymond. Ooh, this is getting good. Well, there were most likely just rumors. Perhaps even made up by some forces from the other side to stir up some infighting. Either way, the rumors, whether true or not, strained her marriage with Louis. In response... Louis departed for Antioch for Tripoli, placing Eleanor under arrest. Very juicy. In the meantime, Otto of Friesling and the remnants of his force reached Jerusalem in early April, with Conrad arriving shortly afterward. They were joined by forces that had previously aided Lisbon, and Provençal crusaders led by Alfonso Jordan of Toulouse. Tragically, Alfonso died under suspicious circumstances at Caesarea, believed to have been poisoned by Raymond of Tripoli, 
who had harbored some fears about Alfonso's political ambitions. This accusation led many Provencal crusaders to abandon their journey and simply go home. Although the crusade initially aimed to recapture Edessa, King Baldwin III and the Knights Templar now set their sights on Damascus. I mean, they came this far. May as well go for the big prize. The regent of Damascus, Muin ad-Din Unur, alarmed by the crusaders' approach, fortified the city, mustered troops, and sabotaged water sources along the route to Damascus. He also sought aid from the Zangid rulers of Aleppo and Mosul, who were usually, in more normal times, his adversaries. Of course, despite their historic rivalry, the imminent threat of a crusader siege prompted these calls for assistance. However, their forces would not arrive in time to participate in the defense of Damascus. This delay likely stemmed from a desire to see Unur weakened by the crusader's threat. But we're not too sure about that. But it certainly seems very likely that they would let the crusaders soften him up and then go in for the kill. Now the nobles of Jerusalem were enthusiastic about the influx of European forces. It's good to finally see some friendly faces around here. A significant assembly occurred on the 24th of June, 1148, near Arco at a town called Palmeria, where the Jerusalem Haute Cour convened with the newly arrived European crusaders and they certainly made a big event of it. It was a celebration. Perhaps they were all celebrating a little bit too early, thinking that, well, now we are all here. The victory and the glory is only around the corner. The assembly ultimately resolved to launch a all-out assault on Damascus, Previously allied with Jerusalem, Damascus had veered towards an alliance with the Zengids, and had even attacked Bosra, an ally of Jerusalem, in 1147. The choice to target Damascus rather than Edessa has been critiqued by historians as a pretty grave strategic error. Given the strained relations between the Unur of Damascus and the Zengid's emerging dominance. However, some modern scholars argue the opposite, arguing that targeting Damascus was tactically sound. Either way, the reason that Damascus, being southern Syria's most formidable Muslim state, would be better positioned the Crusaders against Nur ad Din's ascendancy with Unur being the weaker link compared to Nur ad-Din, there was a prevailing belief that Nur ad-Din's takeover of Damascus was imminent. Therefore, it seemed strategically advantageous for the Crusaders to control Damascus before the Zengids could. In July, the Crusading forces, numbering around 50,000, congregated at Tiberias, before embarking towards Damascus, circling the Sea of Galilee via Banias. The Crusaders opted to launch their attack on Damascus from the west, drawn by the prospect of abundant supplies from the orchards. They reached Daraya on July 23rd, but by the next day they faced fierce resistance from the defenders who launched relentless attacks on the crusaders advancing through the orchards. Assistance for Damascus came from Saif ad-Din Ghazi I of Mosul and Nur ad-Din of Aleppo, 
the latter leading a direct assault on the crusader encampment. Now this forced the crusaders to retreat from the city walls back into the orchards, leaving them vulnerable to guerrilla tactics and ambushes. William of Tyre noted that on July 27th, the crusaders made a strategic retreat into the city's eastern plains, an area with fewer defenses and scarcer resources. Rumors circulated that Unur had enticed the crusader leaders into this disadvantageous move with bribes, promising to sever ties with Nur ad-Din should the crusaders withdraw. However, the arrival of Nur ad-Din and Saif ad-Din on the battlefield made it untenable for the crusaders to reclaim their initial positions. Faced with the unyielding stance of the local crusader lords against continuing the siege, the kings had no alternative but to give up on Damascus. Conrad was the first to withdraw, and the rest of the forces followed suit on July the 28th, retreating towards Jerusalem under the persistent harassment of Turkish archers who constantly shadowed their march. Well, the failed siege planted the seeds of mistrust among the crusader forces and led to a breakdown in cooperative efforts. Conrad's move to Ascalon, though intended as a new strategic plan, floundered as further support was withheld, a direct consequence of the burgeoning mistrust. And this failure not only sustained mutual suspicion among the Christian factions for generations, but also marked the beginning of the decline of Christian strongholds in the Holy Land. Conrad eventually sought to strengthen Western ties with Emperor Manuel in Constantinople, while Louis extended his stay in Jerusalem until 1149. The crusade also took a personal toll on Louis and Eleanor's marriage, which deteriorated to the point of the constant silent treatment, apparently. What a terrible fate. Perhaps the biggest tragedy of the Second Crusade. Well, their return to France was apparently in separate transports. Rather telling, isn't it? Bernard of Clairvaux, who had championed the crusade with fervent zeal, faced profound humiliation over its defeat. It was universally seen as a complete waste of time. Compelled by a sense of responsibility, Bernard drafted a written apology to the Pope, elaborating on his views in the second part of his Book of Consideration, attributing to the Crusade's failure to the sins of its participants. That's right, it wasn't his fault. It was because everybody was too busy thinking the wrong thoughts, and that's why they lost. More than a little bit of a cop-out, if you ask me. Well, despite his efforts to initiate another crusade, he eventually, and rather wisely, distanced himself from the debacle. Bernard passed away in 1153, leaving behind a legacy intertwined with the crusade's ambitions and its subsequent despair. And just imagine it. If you were told originally by Bernard of Clairvaux that you, sir, should go on the crusade, and you did, walking half away across the world, hoping that your sins would be forgiven, and then you watch your commanders make the silliest decisions they can, in fight with each other, and ultimately the whole thing falls apart, 
only to have the finger pointed squarely back at you by the person who convinced you to go on this fruitless endeavor in the first place. Make up your own mind on how popular Bernard of Clairvaux was in the wake of his death. Of course, the Second Crusade left a lasting mark on French culture, particularly through the intrigue surrounding Eleanor and Raymond, which captivated many troubadours and fueled the romantic notion of godly love. Despite Conrad's tarnished reputation, Louis emerged with an enhanced image of France, revered as a devout pilgrim who endured divine retribution with a great amount of grace. However, the Crusades severely strained relations between the French and the Byzantine Empire. Accusations from Louis and other French leaders against Manuel, alleging his conspiracy with the Turks against crusading forces, well, this certainly soured Franco-Byzantine relations for many decades to come. Within the Byzantine Empire, the Crusade was remembered not for military engagement, but as a victory for strategic diplomacy, celebrating Manuel's adeptness in navigating and manipulating complex political landscapes for the Empire's benefit, as lauded by Archbishop Eutastheus of Thessalonica in his eulogy for Manuel. Of course, it's rather easy for Manuel to feel this way, as he was not the one marching down to Antioch. Well, very easy when you're sitting in your nice, comfortable little palace to say, well, that crusade wasn't that bad. Now, the aftermath cast a long shadow over the Christian kingdoms in the East, ushering a period of heightened strife and political turmoil. At the death of the Atabeg of Anur in 1149, well, that ignited yet another political struggle within Damascus, with the military leader Mu'ayyad al-Dawal ibn al-Sufi commanding the Adath militias demanding a greater share of authority due to his role in stopping the Second Crusade. This internal conflict signaled the decline of the Burid state, as Damascus grew increasingly distrustful of the Crusader states, culminating in its capture by Nur ad-Din in 1154. Now, the capture of Ascalon by Baldwin III in 1153 only escalated this conflict, drawing Egypt into the fray and marking a brief period during the 1160s when Jerusalem made inroads into Egyptian territory. But all in all, despite these gains, the failure of a joint invasion of Egypt with the Byzantines in 1169, alongside dwindling European reinforcements, and a fractured Byzantine alliance just weakened Jerusalem's position even further. And of course, it wasn't over yet. The rise of the great Saladin in 1171 as Sultan of Egypt, uniting the land of Egypt and Syria against the Crusader states, along with the subsequent fall of Jerusalem in 1187 to his forces, underscored the dire consequences of the Second Crusade. This participated the call for the Third Crusade, as the Crusader states faced an existential threat from the consolidated forces of Saladin. But of course... That's for the Third Crusade video. Just how many Crusades will they have? Well, if you keep watching the videos, you'll find out, won't you? The Third Crusade 
also known as the King's Crusade, was defined by its high-profile leadership and dramatic confrontations. Sparked by the fall of Jerusalem to the Muslim Sultan Saladin in 1187, this crusade saw European monarchs, including Richard the Lionheart of England, Philip II of France, and Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire, join forces in an ambitious attempt to reclaim the holy city for Christendom. Hello, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to have you back with me. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon links are in the comments and description. Otherwise, a like, comment, and subscribe, if you feel so inclined, goes a long way. Now, to the topic at hand. A full history of the Third Crusade. Please make yourself comfortable. So let's start right at the beginning, and give a bit of background. In 1185, the death of King Baldwin IV marked a turning point for the Kingdom of Jerusalem, one of the Crusader states, as he left the realm in the hands of his young nephew, Baldwin V, whom he had previously appointed as co-king in 1183. With Baldwin V being only a child at this time, Count Raymond III of Tripoli resumed his role as regent. But tragically, the young king's life was cut short, and he passed away before reaching the age of nine in the following year. In a bold move, Baldwin IV's sister, Sibylla, took the crown for herself and also crowned her husband, Guy of Lusignan, as king, with the support of Reynald of Chatillon. Reynald, pushing the boundaries of peace, attacked a wealthy caravan en route from Egypt to Syria, and imprisoned its travellers. This effectively violated a truce with Saladin, the Muslim leader, so Saladin demanded the release of the prisoners and the return of the goods, a request that King Guy, the new ruler, supported. However, Reynald defied these demands, setting the stage for a conflict. This defiance provided Saladin with the pretext he needed to launch an offensive against the Kingdom of Jerusalem. In 1187, he besieged Tiberias. Despite Raymond's counsel for patience, Guy, who was swayed by Reynald's influence, led his forces to the horns of Hattin, near Tiberias. There, Saladin's army engaged the parched and disheartened Frankish soldiers, culminating in the decisive Battle of Hattin on July 1187. In the aftermath, both Guy and Reynald were captured and brought before Saladin. In a gesture of respect towards Guy, Saladin offered him water to quench his thirst. When Guy shared this water with Reynald, Saladin used this act to deny Reynald his protection, ultimately executing him for past treacheries. Guy, however, was spared immediate death, taken to Damascus and later ransomed back to his people. By the end of 1187, Saladin's victories had expanded to include the capture of Acre and Jerusalem itself, marking a significant loss for the Christian forces, who would not regain control of Jerusalem again until 1229. The news of these events reportedly led to the death of Pope Urban III from shock and his successor, Pope Gregory VIII, 
interpreted the fall of Jerusalem as divine punishment for the sins of Christians across Europe, and issued the papal bull Audita Tremendi on the 29th of October 1187. This bull called for a new crusade to reclaim the lost Holy Land. Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire Expedition to the Holy Land stands as one of the most well-prepared and organized crusading efforts in history. By the time he embarked on this venture, Frederick was a seasoned leader of 66 years. This monumental effort is documented in two main accounts, the history of the expedition of Emperor Frederick and the history of the pilgrims, with an additional brief piece, the letter on the death of Emperor Frederick, shedding light on its conclusion. So, the call to arms for this crusade came in the wake of Jerusalem's fall to Saladin. Pope Gregory VIII wasted no time in rallying support for the new crusade. Within mere weeks, he dispatched letters across the German episcopate, urging the mobilization of German nobility for the just cause. Frederick Barbarossa received personal appeals from the beleaguered rulers in the East, calling for his aid against the Muslim forces. By early November, the papal envoy, Cardinal Henry of Marcy, was appointed to preach the crusade throughout Germany. His efforts, alongside those of Bishop Henry of Strasbourg, culminated in a significant assembly in Strasbourg where around 500 knights pledged to take the cross. However, Frederick was initially hesitant to commit, citing conflicts with Archbishop Philip of Cologne. Nevertheless, he sought to persuade Philip of France, his ally at the time, though Efforts were thwarted by Philip's ongoing conflict with England. Which leads us to the pivotal gathering in Mainz on March 27, 1188, dubbed the Court of Christ, where Frederick officially embraced and supported the cause. The assembly saw a reconciliation with the Archbishop of Cologne, and under the influence of a rousing sermon by Bishop Godfrey of Würzburg, Frederick took up the cross. His commitment was mirrored by his son, Duke Frederick VI of Swabia, and a lineup of other prominent leaders, including Duke Frederick of Bohemia, Leopold V of Austria, and Landgrave Louis III of Thuringia, alongside numerous other nobles. With the cross taken up, Frederick declared a general expedition against the pagans, adhering to the papal directive. He set a meticulous preparation period from April 17, 1880, 1188 rather, to April 8, 1189, while the assembly scheduled for St. George's Day April 23, 1189, in Regensburg. To maintain order and ensure the Crusade's effectiveness, a financial requirement was established. Participants needed at least three marks, sufficient to sustain themselves for two years. This measure aimed to prevent the expedition from devolving into chaos, as the previous ones often did ensuring that only those who adequately prepared and equipped would join the ranks of what was to become the most memorable crusading endeavors of the Middle Ages. Now, in a proactive move to finance the crusade and ensure the safety of the Jewish community, Frederick Barbarossa levied a 
quite modest tax on the Jews in Germany. This financial contribution towards the crusade efforts came with a strong mandate for their protection, explicitly prohibiting any preaching against them. And I'm sure that the Jews were rather glad to hear this because the previous crusades were not a very good time for them, especially in Germany. Now, this degree was significant, especially considering this previous history which were tainted by all of these outbreaks. Frederick's measures proved effective in preventing such atrocities within his realm during the Third Crusade. But England, however, witnessed plenty of violence against Jews. And other areas of Europe was the same. Now, Despite all of these precautions, tensions had to surface. On January 29, 1188, a mob, rather angry mob, stormed the Jewish quarter in Mainz, prompting many Jews to seek refuge in the Imperian castle of Munzenberg. The Court of Christ in March saw further disturbances. Rabbi Moses Har Cohens of Mainz noted minor incidences from early March, escalating to a near invasion of the Jewish quarter by a mob on March 26th. The situation was diffused by the Imperial Marshal, Henry of Calden, and further reinforced by an Imperial edict from Frederick, warning of very severe penalties for those who harmed any Jews. A public display of solidarity followed on March the 29th, as Frederick and Rabbi Moses rode through Mainz together, underlining the imperial commitment to Jewish safety. And, by the end of April, those Jews who had originally fled began to return, very much reassured of their protection. Well, parallel to these measures, Frederick embarked on diplomatic efforts essential for the Crusade's success. He sent envoys to negotiate safe passage and provisions for his army through various territories, including Hungary, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, and the Byzantine Empire, with possible outreach to Leo II of Armenia. Acknowledging the need to formally end his previous treaty of friendship with Saladin, Frederick sent Count Henry II of Dietz with an ultimatum to Saladin in the May of 1188. This message demanded Saladin's withdrawal from the conquered lands, the return of the true cross, and reparations for slain Christians under the threat of terminating their alliance. The true cross, by the way, was a relic that was believed to have been the cross that Jesus was crucified on. This was a relic that was taken in the victory of the Muslim conquerors over the Christians in the previous crusades. So, of course, they really wanted that one back. Now, as the Crusades' preparations progressed, Frederick received envoys from several key regions in Nuremberg, just after Christmas, in 1188. These diplomatic engagements yielded promises of provisions and safe passage from the Hungarians and the Seljuks, along with a reception promise from the Serbian Grand Prince. A critical agreement with the Byzantine Empire was finally secured, contingent upon oaths from prominent crusade leaders for their conduct. Of course, all the looting and pillaging was in living memory for the Byzantines. A delegation was then dispatched to Byzantium, and preparations were beginning to be finalized. In the winter gathering of 1187 at Strasbourg, 
Amidst the fervor and excitement to reclaim the Holy Land, Bishop Godfrey of Würzburg presented an ambitious proposal to Frederick Barbarossa to transport the crusading army by sea rather than the perilous overland route. Frederick, however, was unmoved by this suggestion, a stance that was later reinforced by Pope Clement III, who explicitly instructed Godfrey to abandon this line of discussion. Now, despite these directives, many German crusaders took matters into their own hands, bypassing the designated assembly at Regensburg and heading straight to Sicily, hoping to find maritime passage to the Holy Land themselves. This deviation prompted Frederick to appeal to King William II of Sicily, requesting a halt to these independent parties. Likely spurred by concerns that Saladin's forces would soon overpower the remaining crusader strongholds along the coast. As the first of the reigning monarchs to embark on the holy mission, Frederick Barbarossa commenced his journey with a symbolic act of piety, accepting the pilgrim's staff and scrip in Hagenau on the 15th of April, 1189. His arrival at Regensburg for the muster revealed a gathering far smaller than he had originally anticipated, which of course stirred more than a few doubts about the general viability of the crusade. Yet the revelation that an international contingent had already positioned itself at the Hungarian frontier awaiting the German Emperor's lead, certainly stirred Frederick's resolve up again. With a force initially estimated between 12,000 to 20,000 men, including a significant contingent of knights, Frederick's army embarked from Regensburg on May 11th, 1189. This force, as it traversed through Europe, swelled with additional contingents from Hungary, Burgundy, and Lorraine, hinting at the final tally significantly exceeding the number that departed Germany. This growing force reflected both the magnetic pull of Frederick's leadership, but also the broader European commitment to the Crusader cause in general. The journey to the Holy Land itself was marked by incidents that tested the discipline and resolve of the crusading army. From the punitive burning of the Mauthausen, in response to an imposed toll to the expulsion of unruly elements in Vienna, Frederick's leadership navigated both logistical challenges and matters of martial discipline. His issuance of an ordinance for good behavior before Pressburg underscored a commitment to maintaining order and purpose among his ranks, certainly did not want a repeat of the looting and pillaging of the First and Second Crusade, quite an embarrassment and, frankly, not very Christian behavior. But then again, you're not yourself when you're hungry. Now, the journey through Hungary, under the auspices of King Bela III, illustrated the collaborative spirit among the Christian monarchs, even if they disagreed on little things politically. The Hungarian king even provided essential supplies and escorted the crusaders to the threshold of Byzantine territory. As Frederick Barbarossa's crusading army advanced, the journey took them through the strategic heartlands of the Balkans, each step marked by diplomatic nuances and military reorganizations designed to navigate the complex politics en route to the Holy Land. Departing Belgrade on July 1st, 
The army, bolstered by the presence of King Bela III of Hungary, crossed the Morava River towards Branisievo. This locale had risen in importance as a Byzantine and administrative centre after Belgrade's devastation in recent conflicts. Here, the mutually beneficial exchange of wagons for boats with the Hungarian king Bela III marked the end of his accompaniment, highlighting the logistical considerations that were pivotal for the crusade's progress. Now at Branisevo, the arrival of the Burgundian and Metz contingents reinforced Frederick's forces, while provisions supplied by the local duke underscored the vital support from the Byzantine officials, despite emerging tensions. We'll get to them later. The journey along the Via Militaris towards Constantinople was fraught with danger, including harassment by bandits who reportedly acted under local Byzantine orders. Certainly an undercurrent of hostility and mistrust. Well, the communications between Frederick and the Byzantine Emperor Isaac II Angelos, already strained, were further complicated by Isaac's military engagements away from the capital. The situation led Frederick to dispatch additional envoys to ascertain the Byzantine stance. At Nice, Frederick's encounter with the Grand Prince Stefan Nemanja of Serbia showcased an intricate diplomacy at play. While extending hospitality, Nemanja sought formal recognition of his rule, a request Frederick diplomatically denied, citing his pilgrimage as sanctity and his desire to avoid entanglement in local rebellions against the Byzantine authority. This stance, however, did not prevent Frederick from securing a marriage alliance with the Serbian prince, a move that, while cautious, was perceived by the Byzantines as a antagonistic act. Now, the reorganization of the army in Nis underlines Frederick's strategic foresight. Dividing the forces into four distinct segments, aimed to enhance maneuverability and discipline, as they entered regions under stronger Byzantine influence. The restructure was a preemptive measure to ensure the Crusade's integrity amidst the potential hostilities. Upon reaching Sofia, the absence of welcoming Byzantine delegations and the lack of provisions were somewhat telling signs of the deteriorating relations between the Crusaders and Byzantium. The unopposed passage through the Gate of Trajan highlighted the Crusaders' forces' formidable presence, capable of prompting a Byzantine garrison's complete withdrawal, either through the mere sight of its scouts or a direct engagement led by Frederick himself. The arrival in Pazardic to find ample supplies was a much-needed reprieve for the Crusaders, emphasizing the fluctuating fortunes of such an expansive military and diplomatic endeavor as they continued to inch closer and closer to their ultimate goal. Now Barbarossa's crusading journey through the Byzantine territory towards the Holy Land was also fraught with diplomatic tensions, along with military confrontation. At Pazardic, the situation escalated when Frederick learned through his envoy, Lectophorus, of the disdainful treatment his previous envoys had received 
another sign of the deteriorating relationship with Byzantium. The reception of Isaac Angelo's letter, downgrading Frederick's imperial title, and levying accusations against him, marked another significant rupture. Isaac's demand for hostages in exchange for safe passage further strained these relations, leading to Frederick's decision to await the release of his envoys before considering any agreement. The breakdown in diplomacy pushed Frederick and his forces towards more aggressive tactics. The capture of Philippopolis and subsequent military actions against nearby Byzantine forces signified a shift towards open hostility. Frederick's strategic occupation of territories and the local Armenian and Bulgarian population's pledges of support was just another example of how complex things were becoming. Now, Isaac II's countermeasures, including harassment strategies employed by the protestrator Manuel Camitizes, culminated in a significant clash near Prosenos, highlighting the ongoing intensity of the conflict. But despite all these challenges, Frederick's forces continued to advance, eventually crossing into Anatolia. Once in Anatolia, despite initial assurances of safe passage from the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, Frederick's army faced continuous assaults. The decisive victory at the Battle of Philomelion, against a significantly larger Turkish force, mind you, showed the Crusaders' martial prowess, and it certainly dealt quite a morale hit to the Turks. However, the continuous harassment from the Turks led Frederick to move to capture Iconium, dealing a substantial blow to Turkish forces and capturing the Seljuk Sultanate's capital. Tragically, Frederick's crusade came to an abrupt end with his untimely death in the Salef River. This loss significantly demoralized his forces, prompting a large contingent to simply return to Germany. The remaining crusaders, now under the command of Frederick's son, faced further hardships, including disease in Antioch, which significantly reduced their numbers. And despite not achieving the ultimate goal of capturing Jerusalem, Barbarossa's campaign inflicted considerable damage to the Turkish forces and captured critical territories. And he has to be proud of that. Rest in peace, Freddy. Now, between the spring and autumn of 1189, two principal fleets from northern Europe embarked on independent voyages towards the Holy Land, with additional, smaller-scale ventures likely setting sail around the same period, or some possibly as early as the previous year, 1188. Now the first fleet, a sizable international assembly, left England during the Lent of 1189, and it was a formidable force, comprising around 10,000 men and 50 to 60 ships from diverse origins, including England, Denmark, Holland, the Rhineland, and more. This fleet made a strategic stop in Lisbon, before engaging in a significant assault on Alvor, where it overcame the Almohad defenders in a brutal confrontation. Its journey culminated in its arrival at Acre on the 1st of September, adding to a significant force of the siege already occurring there. The second fleet, though smaller at its outset, with eleven ships departing from Germany in April, gained notable attention due to the survival of a first-hand account 
the De Itinere Navali. And distinguished by its composition of mainly commoners, the fleet expanded upon reaching Lisbon in early July, joining forces with the English contingent that had departed in May. Recruited by King Sancho I of Portugal, this enlarged fleet, now boasting thirty-eight vessels, laid siege to Silves, culminating in the city's surrender after forty-five grueling days. The fleet's contribution extended beyond military exploits. Upon its arrival at Arca between April and June of 1190, materials from its ships were repurposed to establish a field hospital, marking the genesis of the Teutonic Order. But not all encounters were victorious. The winning streak couldn't go on forever. The Bayan of Ibn Idari recounts a naval engagement near the Strait of Gibraltar during the spring of 1190, where a northern fleet clashed with the Alamad navy. This encounter ended in defeat for the northern fleet, a narrative conveniently absent from Christian chronicles and it suggests the selective recording of events based on cultural perspectives. In a distinct episode during the summer of 1190, an English vessel, separated from its fleet, found itself in Silves amidst a siege by the Alamads. There, at the behest of Bishop Nicholas, a veteran of the 1189 expedition, the English crusaders lent their strength to the city's defense, contributing to a successful outcome. Their reconciliation of Henry II of England and Philip II of France at Gisors in January 1188, marked by their mutual decision to take up the cross, set the stage for a united Christian front against Saladin's control over the Holy Land. The imposition of the Saladin tithe in their realms, a novel fiscal strategy absent in the Holy Roman Empire, showcased the extensive commitment to financing the military expedition by any means necessary. Back in Britain, the crusading call resonated deeply, with Archbishop Baldwin of Forde's successful recruitment drive across Wales a campaign vividly captured in the writings of Gerald of Wales. Following Henry II's death in the July of 1189, Richard I, known as Richard the Lionheart, ascended to the English throne, swiftly turning his attention to the Crusade. His proactive fundraising efforts alongside early departures of his subjects by sea, underscored a general feeling of widespread zeal for the campaign. In April 1190, a significant segment of the English crusading fleet set sail, engaging in military actions that included both cooperation with the Portuguese against the Alamads and unfortunate hostilities back in Lisbon. Richard's rendezvous with Philip II in Vesely, and their joint journey to Lyon, followed by separate paths to the Mediterranean, highlighted a logistical challenge of such a massive uptaking. Richard's impatience in Marcel and subsequent journey to Sicily, along with the English fleet's direct voyage to Messina, further illustrated a complexity of medieval naval coordination. It was never easy. Now, the politics in Sicily, recently altered by the death of William II and the accession of Tancred, introduced personal and diplomatic tensions, notably with the imprisonment of Joan of England. Richard's military response in Messina, 
coupled with the dispute over his marital intentions, strained his alliance with Philip. Nevertheless, both monarchs persisted in their crusading mission, with Philip departing for the Middle East ahead of Richard. Now Richard's subsequent naval misfortune near Cyprus and his encounters with Isaac Ducas Comnenus brought unexpected challenges, leading to the strategic conquest of Cyprus. This debacle, while debated among historians regarding its motivations, significantly impacted the Crusades' logistical base and expanded Richard's influence in the eastern Mediterranean. Now, upon Guy of Jerusalem's release in 1189, he found his authority entire challenged by Conrad of Montferrat, whose defense against Muslim sieges had made him popular and bolstered his position. Undeterred, Guy set his sights on Arker, assembling an army and joining forces with Philip's arriving French contingent. And despite their effort, they faced Saladin's counter-siege, trapping them inside the walls of Arco. Tragedy struck in the summer of 1190, when a disease outbreak claimed Queen Sibylla and her daughters, leaving Guy's claim to the throne quite precarious. The succession crisis deepened as Isabella, Sibylla's half-sister, was swiftly divorced and remarried to Conrad of Montferrat, positioning him as a new contender for the crown. The winter of 1190-91 saw the crusader camp ravaged by illness, claiming notable figures including Frederick of Swabia, and Patriarch Heraclius. With the return of the sailing season, reinforcements finally arrived, including Leopold V of Austria and Philip of France. Richard the Lionheart's arrival in June 1191 energized the siege efforts against Arco, leading to its capture in July. However, the victory sowed discord among the Allies over the division of spoils and the contested kingship of Jerusalem, with Richard supporting Guy and Philip and Leopold backing Conrad. Philip and Leopold's subsequent departure from the Holy Land, each for their own reasons, left Richard to continue the campaign. Despite initial attempts at diplomacy with Saladin, including a proposal for a face-to-face -face meeting which was rebuffed by Saladin, relations between the two leaders remained tense. And this tension escalated when Richard ordered the execution of 2,700 Muslim prisoners, prompting Saladin to retaliate against his Christian captives the strategic significance of Arco's capture was soon followed by the Battle of Arsuf, where Richard demonstrated his military prowess against Saladin's forces. Despite Saladin's attempt to disrupt the Crusaders' march towards Jaffa, Richard's tactical acumen led to a crucial victory, undermining Saladin's invincibility and bolstering the Crusader morale. This victory enabled Richard to secure Jaffa, a vital step towards an eventual march on Jerusalem, and a significant blow to Saladin's control over the region. After the victory at Arsuf, Richard the Lionheart focused on consolidating his gains, taking Jaffa and establishing it as his base. Efforts to negotiate peace with Saladin through his brother Al-Adil, involving propositions of marriage to Richard's relatives, ultimately failed. Richard then marched to Ascalon, 
a strategic location recently dismantled by Saladin, aiming to fortify it against future Muslim assaults. As 1191 waned into winter, Richard's forces advanced towards Jerusalem, buoyed by intelligence of Saladin's reduced army and low morale within the city. Despite nearing Jerusalem, adverse weather and strategic concerns about potentially being besieged by Muslim reinforcements compelled a retreat back to the coast. Politics once again shifted dramatically with Conrad of Montferrat's election as King of Jerusalem, a position he would never formally assume, due to being murdered. Likely influenced by the complex web of alliances and enmities that characterized the crusade, you were never really safe. It was one thing to worry about Saladin, but oftentimes the people around you who wanted your position as king were a lot more likely to uh, do you in in the middle of the night. Now, this period also saw Guy of Jerusalem compensated with Cyprus, indicating a fluid nature of power and territory during the conflict, with different little islands and territories being passed around between rulers like a hot potato. Now Richard's strategic focus extended to fortifying Ascalon, and engaging in skirmishes with Saladin's forces. That was the priority. He came to the Holy Land to do one thing, and that was get Saladin. So, despite a second march on Jerusalem, internal divisions within the Crusader ranks, particularly disagreements over whether to directly attack Jerusalem or to first weaken Saladin's base in Egypt, led to yet another withdrawal. This internal discord was just characteristics of the challenges of maintaining a unified crusading effort against a resilient and tactically savvy opponent. That being said, the Muslim side had their own political intrigues, didn't they? The sudden capture of Jaffa by Saladin's forces in July of 1192 amidst internal unrest within his army, set the stage for one of the Third Crusade's most dramatic episodes. Despite the city's fall, and the disarray within the Muslim ranks, Richard, upon learning of Jaffa's plight, mounted a daring naval counterattack, with a modest but very skilled and motivated force. His unexpected assault not only took the Ayyubids by surprise, but also successfully liberated the city and the Crusader prisoners, which helped bolster his depleted forces. Now, Saladin wasn't going to take that lying down, of course. His attempt to reclaim Jaffa through a stealth attack of his own was thwarted by the vigilance of the Crusader forces. And unfortunately for Saladin, it resulted in significant casualties for the Muslim armies. This defeat at Jaffa was not only a strategic and symbolic importance of the coastal cities, but it really marked a turning point in the Crusade, reinforcing the Crusader state's position along the Levantine coast. The aftermath of the Battle of Jaffa led to the negotiation of a treaty between Richard and Saladin. This agreement, while maintaining Muslim control over Jerusalem, allowed Christian pilgrims and traders safe access to the holy city. That was the Treaty of Ramla of 1192. A significant concession that reflected the mutual respect and pragmatism of both leaders. Oh, and I've said it in several other videos. Don't think that Saladin was this cartoonish bad guy villain. 
he was quite the opposite. Many of the crusaders actually remarked that his demeanor and the way he was with people was quite conducent to a chivalrous conduct. Well, if only all of their own leaders could be following the rules like that. Well, this treaty, this Treaty of Ramla, concluded the campaign, and it also allowed the Crusaders to retain a coastal strip extending from Tyre to Jaffa, which ensured their continued presence in the Holy Land. The recapture of parts like Galilee and the shared control of strategic locations like Ramla and Lydda between the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Ayyubid Sultanate. So it definitely highlighted how nuanced territorial negotiations can be. And of course, this nuance to agreements and making of compromises that certainly characterizes that both sides were certainly in no position to be fighting to the death. Now, despite the Muslims maintaining control over Jerusalem, the treaty's position for safe pilgrimage to the city by Christians represented a notable achievement in an era that was marked by religious conflicts, facilitating a period of relative peace and relative coexistence. Now a little side quest for you. The acquisition of Cyprus significantly bolstered the Crusader states by providing a valuable logistical and military base that would support future Christian operations in the region. Yeah, spoiler alert, there are more crusades to come. This strategic gain was very important, and they would use it a lot later on. So, what do people think about the Third Crusade? Well, if you ask a lot of modern historians, they'll tell you lots of different things. Some people view it as a general success for prolonging the existence of the Crusader states and securing concessions that allowed Christian access to Jerusalem. Others? Well, they critique it as a outright failure for not achieving its primary objective of reclaiming Jerusalem, or deemed the high costs, in terms of both human lives and resources, as rendering the expedition hardly justifiable. What do I think? Well, I think the fact that Christians could now walk into Jerusalem wearing their crosses, and... They were basically protected by a treaty that was agreed on by a Muslim and a Christian, Saladin and Richard. I think this mutual understanding that the Christians were going to show up, they were going to say their prayers, and the holy city wasn't just holy for one side. Well, I think that's a victory in itself can't have Jerusalem all to ourselves, can't we? Of course, in our modern day, the fight for Jerusalem sadly continues in other ways. But who wants to get demonetized talking about that? The Fourth Crusade Initially aimed at reclaiming the Holy Land from Muslim control, took an unexpected and controversial turn that culminated in the sack of Constantinople, the Christian capital of the Byzantine Empire. This diversion was prompted by a series of financial and logistical challenges, coupled with the influence of Venetian merchants who redirected the crusading forces for their own economic and political gains. The Crusaders' attack on Constantinople not only deepened the rift between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, but also weakened the Byzantine Empire, contributing to its eventual fall to the Ottoman Turks. 
Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, good to meet you. If you're coming back, good to see you again. And if you'd like to support the channel, the links to the Patreon are in the comments and description. Otherwise, those who feel inclined can leave their thoughts in the comments or like and subscribe the video. Now, this is part of a series on the other crusades. If you want to watch the other videos, then you'll find them on my channel in the Medieval History playlist. Otherwise, let's continue with the history of the Fourth Crusade. Between 1176 and 1187, Saladin's Ayyubid Sultanate overpowered the Crusader states in the Levant, capturing Jerusalem after a siege in 1187. This loss prompted the launch of the Third Crusade. The Ayyubids then reduced the Crusader presence to a few coastal cities, Tyre, Antioch, and Tripoli. The Third Crusade set out with the aim of retaking Jerusalem, and while it didn't capture the city itself, it certainly did regain significant territories, including Acre and Jaffa. The campaign concluded with the Treaty of Jaffa in 1192 that established a truce with Saladin. This period also saw a heightened friction between Western European states and the Byzantine Empire. Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa all but nearly attacked Constantinople over disputes with the Byzantine Emperor Isaac II Angelos, who was preoccupied with internal challenges. Now Richard I of England also known as Richard the Lionheart, managed to capture Cyprus, and instead of returning it to the Byzantine Empire, as was the arrangement, he decided to hand it over to Guy of Lusignan, a former king of the Crusader state of Jerusalem. Following the death of Saladin in 1193, his empire was divided among his sons and brothers. Henry II of Champagne, the ruler of Jerusalem, extended a truce with the Egyptian sultan Al-Aziz Uthman. However, the German Crusade of 1197 somewhat disrupted this peace, leading to further conflicts but eventually resulting in a truce that left Jaffa under Ayyubid control and Beirut with the Crusaders. Now, to the jewel in the crown. Constantinople, existing for 874 years by the time of the Fourth Crusade, remained a major Christian city, retaining much of ancient Rome's infrastructure. It was a key trade hub, attracting interest and envy from Western powers, especially Venice. Now, in 1195, Byzantine Emperor Isaac II Angelos was overthrown, and his successor, Alexios III Angelos, faced significant challenges including financial instability and defensive neglect. All of these culminated together to further weaken the empire. In January 1198, Pope Innocent III assumed papal office, with the proclamation of a new crusade as a central ambition of his papacy. His summons went largely unanswered by the monarchs of Europe, due to various political entanglements. For example, Germany was embroiled in conflicts with papal authority, while England and France, they were a little bit too busy fighting each other. Nonetheless, inspired by the sermons of Fulke of Neuilly, 
The crusading force was eventually assembled at a tournament in Ecris-sur-Aine in 1199, organized by the Count Thurbart of Champagne. Now, Thurbart was initially chosen as the leader, but was succeeded by Boniface of Montferrat upon his death in 1201. Boniface, inheriting the title from his brother, Conrad of Montferrat, took on the leadership role. Now Boniface, alongside with the Crusaders' leadership, reached out to Venice, Genoa, and other maritime powers in 1200 to attempt to secure a naval passage to Egypt, which was identified as the new target of the Crusade, a shift from the previous focus, which was mainly centered around Palestine. This strategy, recognizing Egypt as the primary Muslim power in the Mediterranean, and a significant trading partner, particularly with Venice. Of course, the choice of Egypt necessitated a maritime campaign, demanding the assembly of a fleet, and a damn good one. A task Genoa declined, but Venice, under Doge Enrico Dandalo, accepted the task. Dandalo saw this as an opportunity for Venice to expand its wealth, prestige, and territorial holdings. And Venetian merchants were known for being particularly savvy. Their entire culture at this point was just about making money and building boats, which kind of goes hand in hand. The agreements with Venice stipulated the transportation of a substantial force that required at least a year of preparations. Of course, this affected Venice's commercial engagements. The crusading force, primarily hailing from various regions of France, including Blois, Champagne, Amiens, and Burgundy, among others, also saw participation from Flanders, Montferrat, and contingents from the Holy Roman Empire. This diverse assembly was to depart Venice in the early October 1202, aiming directly for Cairo, the stronghold of the Ayyubid Caliphate. Pope Innocent III ratified this plan, emphasizing a prohibition against assaults on Christian territories. Not all crusaders agreed to depart from Venice, however, leading many to embark from Flanders, Marcel, and Genoa instead. By May 1202, the main body of the Crusader army had gathered in Venice, but the numbers were somewhat less than anticipated. Only around 12,000 showed up, and they were expecting 33,000 at least. A little disappointing. Well, Venice had fulfilled its part of the agreement preparing 50 war galleys and 450 transport ships, which was more than enough for the gathered forces. However, the Crusaders fell short of the required 85,000 silver marks, managing to scrape together only 35,000, and later adding another 14,000 through severe financial sacrifices. Of course, this situation put Venice in quite a difficult position, having paused its commercial activities to outfit the expedition. So not only they lost money because they weren't doing business as usual, all of a sudden bills could not be paid because the crusaders did not meet their obligation. Talk about heartbreaking for Venice. Well, the requirement to crew the fleet also placed a considerable strain on Venice's workforce and economy, so it was not looking good for them. Doge d'Angelo, 
and the Venetian leaders had to then make a choice. The crusade could not afford its fees, yet disbanding the assembled force would damage Venetian prestige and financial stability. Dondolo proposed a solution. The crusaders could offset their debt by targeting various Adriatic ports and towns. This culminated in the capture of Zara in Dalmatia, a city that had asserted its independence from Venetian control and was under protection of King Emmerich of Hungary and Croatia. I'm sure you can imagine how Hungary and Croatia felt about this development. Well, of course, the decision to attack Zara was controversial, to say the least. King Emmerich was a Catholic, who had taken up the cross, and many crusaders objected to assaulting fellow Christians. In fact, they had been told specifically not to do this. It was the only rule that they were given. Well, some, including a group led by Simon de Montfort, opted out and pursued their own journey to the Holy Land independently. Despite opposition from the Pope's threat of excommunication, the Crusaders proceeded to besiege Zara, capturing it in November of 1202, after displaying its Catholic affiliation did not deter the attack. Now, Pope Innocent III, who had told them, whatever you do, do not attack other Christians, Upon learning of the sack of Zara, excommunicated the crusaders, urging them to adhere to the original vows and proceed directly to Jerusalem. Fearing the disillusion of their forces, the crusades' leaders withheld the Pope's decree from their troops. Innocent III later lifted the excommunication for those not directly involved in the attack on Zara, recognizing the coercive influence of the Venetians on the Crusaders. Now, the tension between Venice and the Byzantine Empire was significantly heightened by both commercial rivalry and the historical grievances, which mainly stemmed from the massacre of the Latins, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I'm sure you can guess what happened via the name. Now, the Chronicle of Novgorod suggests a deeply personal element to this animosity, alleging that Doge Enrico Dandolo had been blinded on the orders of Emperor Manuel I Komnenos during an embassy to Constantinople in 1171, this, of course, fueled quite a lot of resentment towards the Byzantines, especially from Dandolo, who was walking around with his hands in front of him. Now, in the lead-up to the fleet's departure from Venice, Boniface of Montferrat made a detour to visit his cousin, Philip of Swabia, sparking a good bit of speculation about his motives. Now, he might have been trying to avoid the threat of excommunication, aware of Venice's contentious plans, or he might have sought an alliance with Alexios IV Angelos, Philip's brother-in-law and the son of their dethroned Emperor Isaac II Angelos. It's uncertain whether Boniface knew of Angelos IV's presence at Philip's court, now, Alexios IV, who was at this time in exile, proposed a rather lucrative deal to support the crusade financially, offer military assistance, and promise ecclesiastical concessions in exchange for the crusaders' help in reclaiming his father's throne from Emperor Alexios III Angelos. This proposal delivered to the Crusades' leadership during their winter stay in Zara, 
and promising to alleviate their financial strain, was met with quite a lot of enthusiasm, particularly by Doge D'Angelo. But, despite D'Angelo's intricate knowledge of Byzantine politics, and skepticism about the feasibility of Alexios the Force promises, the allure of resolving their monetary predicament swayed their leaders. After all, they were in way too deep, and they needed a way out, whatever it was. Boniface of Montferrat, having returned from his visit with Alexios IV, joined the fleet in Corfu, ready to advance the plan. While most leaders were persuaded, or possibly influenced by Dandolo's incentives, a faction led by Renaud of Montmirail opted out, proceeding directly to Syria. Now the crusade, now committed to venture against Constantinople itself, a Christian city, prepared a formidable naval force, including siege engines, and set sail in April 1203. Despite the controversial nature of their new objective, Pope Innocent III's response was ambivalent. He forbade attacks on Christian entities, unless they obstructed the crusade. Stopping short, just a little bit short, of outright condemnation of the plan to attack Constantinople. Well, Upon their arrival at Constantinople on the 23rd of June, 1203, those of the Fourth Crusade faced a city of immense scale. Home to half a million inhabitants, protected by a garrison of 15,000 men, including the renowned 5,000 Varangian guards and a modest naval fleet of 20 galleys. Despite its imposing population and storied defences, the city's military might was constrained by political and economic factors, limiting its permanent forces to a core of units, albeit quite elite and experienced. In times of imminent threat, the Byzantine capital had historically been able to call upon reinforcements from its provincial territories, However, this time, the swift approach of the Fourth Crusade left the city's defenders ill-prepared for the siege. The Crusaders' primary aim was to dethrone Emperor Alexios III Angelos and replace him with Alexios IV, the exiled son of the previous emperor, Isaac II. They were driven by the promise of substantial rewards from Alexios IV for their military support. This demand was communicated to Alexios III's representatives via Conan of Bethune, emphasizing the crusaders' intent to fulfill their bargain with the claimant to the throne. Now the internal politics of succession within the Byzantine Empire marked by a history of palace coups and a fluid concept of hereditary right, meant that the citizens of Constantinople viewed the crusaders' cause with a good bit of detachment. Accustomed as they were to frequent shifts in imperial power. After all, it's not like they were voting anybody in. A king is a king, right? Well, initially... The Crusaders attempted to take control of the strategic suburbs of Chalcedon and Chrysopolis, but they were repelled back. However, they demonstrated their military prowess in a smaller engagement, where a contingent of eighty Frankish knights achieved a surprising victory against a larger Byzantine force of five hundred. Well, this showcases quite a lot of tactical advantages and determination of the Crusaders, despite being outnumbered. 
to breach Constantinople. The Crusaders first had to get across the Bosphorus, utilizing around 200 vessels, including horse transports and galleys, they crossed the narrow strait. The Byzantine forces, arranged by Alexios III along the shore north of Galata, were quickly overcome by the Crusader force, who charged from their transports, causing the Byzantine troops to retreat in fear. The Crusaders then targeted the Tower of Galata, key for its control over the chain that blocked the Golden Horn, guarded by a diverse garrison of mercenaries from England, Denmark, and mainland Italy. Well, on July 6th, the Crusaders' flagship, the Aquila, succeeded in breaking this chain, with a segment of it later sent to Arca to strengthen the defences there. During the siege of the Tower of Galata, although the defenders made several attempts to break the siege, they often faced very heavy casualties. In a notable sally, many defenders were unable to return to the tower, and were either killed by the crusaders or drowned in the Bosphorus. The capture of the tower allowed the crusaders to access the Golden Horn, and the Venetian fleet sailed right in. A display intended to rally support for Alexios IV from the city's populace instead was met with taunts and jeers from the citizens, contradicting the crusaders' expectations of a warm welcome for the pretender. On July 11th, the crusaders positioned themselves near the Blackernane Palace at the city's northwest. Initial assaults on the walls were repelled, but a week later, on July 17th, a more coordinated attack on the sea and land walls at the same time led to the Venetians breaching around 25 towers. The Varangian Guard repelled attacks on the land walls until a retreat covered by a Venetian fire screen inadvertently caused significant destruction and displacement within the city. In a decisive move, Alexios III marshaled a large force to confront the Crusaders, but ultimately retreated without engaging, severely impacting morale and leading to his personal flight from the city. Not a good look, Alexios. With Alexios gone, Constantinople's authorities reinstated Isaac II, Faced with achieving their declared goal, but without the promised reward, the Crusaders negotiated for Alexios IV to be made co-emperor alongside his father Isaac II, culminating in Alexios IV's coronation on August I. Now Alexios IV, he found himself in a challenging position unable to fulfill the grand promises he'd made to the Crusaders due to the depleted state of the imperial treasury, exacerbated by Alexios III's escape with a significant portion of the empire's wealth. Things were about to get very, very awkward. In a desperate attempt to gather funds, Alexios ordered the melting down of Roman icons for their precious metals, but he managed to raise only around a hundred thousand silver marks, a decision that horrified the Byzantine populace and was seen as a grievous act of sacrilege. Now this act was condemned by citizens and historians alike, with many marking it as the pivotal moment, symbolic of the empire's decline. Just imagine what we lost, all those great statues, melted down. It's like taking your 
mother's wedding ring to a pawn shop to pay your electricity bills. Ugh. Terrible. The forced desecration of religious icons alienated Alexios IV from his people and heightened tensions within Constantinople. In a bid to secure his position, Alexios IV sought to extend his alliance with the Crusaders for another six months, until April of 1204, and even led a contingent to confront Alexios III. Now during his absence, civil unrest escalated, culminating in violent riots and a devastating fire that ravaged the city leaving approximately 100,000 people without homes and managing to even further strain relations between the Byzantines and the Latin population, as if they were not strained enough as it was. Now the death of Isaac II in January of 1204 and the growing dissatisfaction with Alexios IV's rule led to a brief and unsuccessful attempt by the Byzantine Senate to appoint Nicholas Canabus as emperor. But Nicholas was not keen on the idea, and he simply declined the position. Well, if he had have taken it up, there was a good chance he would just be simply assassinated some weeks later. Perhaps we should give him a little bit more credit for being ahead of the curve. Alexios Dukas, a notable figure with military experience and respect among the populace, at least the majority of them, capitalized on the widespread discontent to seize power for himself. After deposing and executing Alexios IV, Dukas was crowned Emperor Alexios V. He promptly focused on reinforcing the city's defences, and rallying support against the crusader threat. Well, infuriated by the assassination of Alexios IV, whom they had supported and put quite a lot of hope and stock into, the crusaders and Venetians, who were still quite out of money, demanded that Emperor Alexios V honor the commitments previously made. Now, Alexios V's refusal to comply led to yet another assault on Constantinople. On April the 8th, despite the Byzantines' forces, strong resilience and their success in damaging the Crusaders' siege equipment with heavy projectiles, Adverse weather conditions, and a strong shore wind hampered the Crusaders' efforts, preventing most of their ships from approaching the walls effectively. Therefore, this initial attack was a complete failure, with only one minor engagement at the city's towers, and none of which of them were captured. Back to the drawing board. Well, in the aftermath, Latin clergy within the crusading army sought to rally the demoralized troops, preaching that their cause was just and divinely sanctioned, despite the setback. You've got to be joking. I think everybody knew at this point that they were just fighting to get themselves out of debt. Well, either way, they framed the failed assault, not as divine punishment, but as a test of faith, depicting the Byzantines as traitors for the murder of Alexios IV, and comparing them unfavorably. The quote was apparently made by the Latin clergy that they were even more traitorous than the Jews, which, make of that what you will, well, this attempt to morally justify the campaign against Constantinople was met with mixed reception. But a soldier must 
follow orders, right? Ignoring Pope Innocent III's commands against attacking, the Crusaders made preparations for another assault, while Alexios V opted to defend from within the city. The Varangian Guard, who were also unpaid and discontented, simply walked off. They left their posts and Alexios V was forced to flee when nightfall hit. Now amidst all this, there had to be a new emperor, right? Well, the efforts to appoint one amid all this chaos, of course, proved very futile. So, Constantinople was effectively a city without a ruler. Fortune favoured the Crusaders on April 12th, when favourable winds allowed the Venetian fleet to breach the city's defences. A small group of Crusaders then breached the walls, and despite fierce resistance from Byzantine forces, including negotiations by the Anglo-Saxon defenders for better pay, the Crusaders gained a foothold in the Blackerne Quarter, their attempt to use fire as a defensive measure inadvertently caused further destruction. Who would have thought? And another 15,000 people had their homes burned down. Well, by the next day, April 13th, the Crusaders had taken complete control of Constantinople marking a significant and devastating turn in the city's history, and a devastating turn in the broader context of the Crusades. I mean, what had the Crusades become, with Christians fighting Christians? One can only imagine the Muslim rulers watching on from Jerusalem, thinking, what on earth are they doing? Well, for three days following their breach of Constantinople, the Crusaders engaged in unprecedented pillage, marking one of the darkest episodes in medieval history. The systematic destruction and looting inflicted upon the city saw a loss or damage of countless Greco-Roman and medieval works, alongside widespread violence against the civilian population. Churches and monasteries, despite the sacredness afforded to them, were not spared. They were desecrated and stripped of their treasures, contravening even the threat of excommunication. No one cared. They just wanted to loot. Well, eyewitnesses from the period, including Nicetas Corniates and Geoffrey of Villardouin, documented the ruthless greed and destruction that characterized the sack. Not seen since the fall of Rome back in 410. The looting of Constantinople resulted in the acquisition of approximately 900 thousand silver marks worth of treasure. While the Venetians claimed their agreed portion, the distribution of the spoils among the Crusaders was uneven, with a significant amount concealed by some knights. Deep pockets, of course. The brutality of the sack, characterized by murder, looting, and was noted for its sheer scale, drawing comparisons to the sacking by historical barbarian tribes, yet surpassing them in ferocity. The Venetians, partly Byzantine in culture themselves, managed to save some of the priceless art. However, many crusaders from other regions who were perhaps not quite as high class, 
didn't recognize the value of these things, and engaged in acts of profound desecration and violence. Which leads us to the Hagia Sophia, the pinnacle of Christian architecture in Constantinople, which was subjected to some of the most egregious violations. Its religious icons, holy books, and silver iconostasis were destroyed, and the sanctity of the patriarchal throne was desecrated in a mocking display of contempt for the orthodox Christian tradition. This event not only represented the significant loss of culture and religious heritage, but also deepened the schism between the Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic churches, exacerbating the estrangement of East and West. In fact, it's rather arguable that this event of the Fourth Crusade was more damaging to Constantinople in terms of loss of culture and art and literature than the actual fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 was. Think about that. The consequences of the Fourth Crusade's diversion to Constantinople extended beyond the immediate horrors and destruction. It signaled a pivotal decline in Byzantine power, which hastened its vulnerability to future conquests, and ultimately facilitating the rise of the Ottoman Empire. This rather ironic outcome starkly contrasted with the Crusades' initial goals, leading to a resurgence of Islam in regions once held by Christian powers. Pope Innocent III was understandably quite angry about this. His reaction to these atrocities committed by the Crusaders was one of profound dismay and complete confusion, as he confronted the moral and spiritual failings of those he had sent forth under the banner of the cross. The sack of Constantinople remains a poignant testament to the complexities and unintended consequences of the crusading movement, leaving a lasting imprint on the historical trajectory of both Eastern and Western Christendom. Of course, imagine being Pope Innocent III. This whole thing was his idea in the first place. It's kind of like finding out your son is a mass murderer. But, of course, not everybody was in on the siege of Constantinople. The journey of the Fourth Crusade was marked by numerous defections, with many crusaders choosing to take a more direct route and fulfill their vows by heading straight to the Holy Land, bypassing the siege of Constantinople entirely. Despite Geoffrey of Vilhadwin's portrayal of these individuals as deserters, modern historical analysis suggests that a significant number, though not a majority, of the Crusaders made their way to the Holy Land by any means necessary. A substantial portion of these Crusaders departed from southern Italy, particularly from ports in Apulia, aiming for a landing at Arca. This route was chosen by several knights and their retinues, who for various reasons, including disillusionment with the Crusades' direction, or simply a desire to fulfill their vows more directly, opted for a more linear approach. The financial resources for the Holy Land's defense including the contributions from the preacher Fulk of Newley, were rather significant. These funds were directed towards the fortification of Arca, which was already fortified enough as it was, but this reinforced its defences against potential attacks. 
The defections, well, they occurred in waves, with a notable number leaving after the siege of Zara, and others departing directly from Zara for the Holy Land. Some crusaders, upon reaching the Holy Land, found themselves constrained by existing truces with Muslim powers, and limited in their military options. These constraints had led to rather tragic outcomes for some, like Renard and his contingent, who suffered ambush and captivity while attempting to engage in military actions independently. Additionally, several official and unofficial groups made their way to the Holy Land, either in defiance of, or as an alternative to, the main crusading forces' objectives. These groups included notable figures and contingents that chose to distance themselves from the controversial decisions made by the crusaders' leadership. Now in the summer of 1202, Baldwin of Flanders made the strategic decision to divide his forces for the Fourth Crusade, leading one contingent to Venice and dispatching another by sea under the leadership of John II of Nessel, Thierry of Flanders, and Nicholas of Mali. The Flemish fleet embarked on a Mediterranean journey that included a notable military engagement on the African coast, where they managed to capture a Muslim city, leaving it under the control of the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, before heading to Marcel to overwinter. The Marcel pilots, renowned for their navigational skills and experience in open sea sailing, offered the Flemish and French crusaders a vital link to the Holy Land. By March 1203, Baldwin's fleet received orders to sail towards Metheny to meet with the Venetian forces. However, due to timing and decision-making processes influenced perhaps by the news of the Crusades' redirection to Constantinople, the Flemish fleet chose to proceed directly to Acre, possibly making a stop in Cyprus, where Thierry of Flanders laid a familial claim to the island. Now upon reaching Acre, the Flemish contingent faced the same diplomatic constraints as other crusaders, with King Amory of Jerusalem adhering to his truce with the Ayubids, and thus limiting their military options. The crusaders dispersed, serving in different capacities across the Levantine states, with some being captured in conflicts that erupted after the truce's initial breakdown. The changing politics and military dynamics in the region, highlighted by the seizure of ships by both Christian and Muslim forces, speaks to the precarious balance of power and the complex network of alliances and hostilities that characterize this period. The embassy of Martin of Paris and Conrad of Schwarzenberg to the main crusader army, beseeching it to join the conflict in the Holy Land following the truce's violations, illustrates the ongoing challenges and fragmented nature of the crusading effort by this time, as well as, of course, the difficulties in undertaking such a diverse and geographically dispersed task. Now back to Pope Innocent. He spoke of the outcomes of the crusade thusly, and, my God, he does not sound happy about it. This is from Pope Innocent III, a quote. How, indeed, will the Church of the Greeks, no matter how severely she is beset with afflictions and persecutions, return into ecclesiastical union and to a devotion for the apostolic see, when she has seen in Latins only an example of perdition and the works of darkness, so that she now, with reason, detests the Latins 
more than dogs. As for those who are supposed to be seeking the ends of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not their own ends, who made their swords, which they were supposed to use against the pagans, drip with Christian blood, they have spared neither religion nor age. They have committed adultery and fornication before the eyes of men. They have exposed both matrons and virgins, even those dedicated to God, to the sordid lusts of men. Not satisfied with breaking open the imperial treasury and plundering the goods of princes and lesser men, they have also laid their hands on the treasures of the churches, and what is more serious, on their very own possessions. They have even ripped silver plates from the altars, and have hacked them to pieces among themselves. They violated the holy places, and have carried off crosses and relics. End of the quote from Pope Innocent III. Doesn't sound happy about it, doesn't he? While well, following the sack of Constantinople in 1204, the Fourth Crusade culminated in the division of the Byzantine Empire through the Partitio Terrarum Imperi Romaniae, a treaty that allocated territories between the Republic of Venice and the leading crusaders. This partitioning led to the establishment of the Latin Empire of Constantinople, marking a profound shift in the region's political and cultural landscape. Boniface of Montferrat, despite being a favoured candidate for the emperorship among many, given his royal connections and his visibility among the crusader forces, was ultimately bypassed, in favour of Baldwin of Flanders for the imperial throne. The Venetians harboured certain reservations about Boniface, fearing his ties to the previous Byzantine regime, and his potential bias towards Genoa. Concerns that stemmed from Montferrat's geographical proximity to Genoa, and Boniface's own familial connections through his brother Renier's marriage to Maria Comnene, a former empress. As a result, Baldwin of Flanders was crowned the first emperor of the newly formed Latin Empire, while Boniface was compensated with the creation of the Kingdom of Thessalonica. Effectively, a vassal state to the Latin Empire. Now Venice, don't forget about them. They also secured significant gains notably establishing the Duchy of the Archipelago in the Aegean Sea, further asserting its maritime dominance and expanding its commercial empire. Well, the aftermath of the Fourth Crusade also saw the emergence of Byzantine successor states as refugees and remnants of the Byzantine aristocracy sought to preserve their heritage and authority as much as they possibly could. The Empire of Nicaea, under Theodore Lascaris, the Emperor of Trebizond, and the Despote of Epirus, were among the most significant of these entities, each representing the centre of resistance against Latin rule, and a beacon of Byzantine continuity in the face of Latin occupation. And... The Muslims, sitting comfortably down in Jerusalem, didn't really feel a thing. Wasn't that interesting? Well, if you've enjoyed this full history of the Fourth Crusade, albeit a one-hour video on the Fourth Crusade perhaps does not do it a justice, but... This is the main idea. The Fifth Crusade Orchestrated by Pope Innocent III 
and launched under Pope Honorius III, represented a bold endeavor to reclaim Jerusalem by diverting its focus to Egypt, deemed the economic backbone of the Muslim Ayyubid dynasty. European crusaders, including forces from Hungary, Germany, and Flanders, set their sights on the strategic prize of Egypt, capturing the key port city of Damietta in a move that signaled early success. Yet the campaign ultimately stumbled, marred by leadership disputes and strategic missteps, notably failing to secure Cairo. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to have you with me again. If you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description. Otherwise, like, comment and subscribe and let's get started. On today's topic, which is of course part of a broader series on the Crusades. And if you're interested in that, well, go and have a look in the playlist. Medieval History. I'm sure you'll find them. Now, without further ado, let's get on to the video. By the year 1212, Pope Innocent III's reign had been marked by significant events and challenges, including the disillusionment following the Fourth Crusade's failure to capture Jerusalem, and the Albigensian Crusade's initiation against the Cathars in southern France since 1209. Not just these two, but the rather unusual occurrence of the Children's Crusade. Well, his efforts to recover the Holy Land were further complicated by the establishment of the Latin Empire of Constantinople, with Emperor Baldwin I at its helm, chosen with substantial influence from the Venetians. The appointment of the Venetian Thomas Morosini as the first Latin Patriarch of Constantinople sparked quite a conflict with Innocent III, who deemed the election uncanonical. Now the politics of Europe at this time were tumultuous, to say the least. In Germany, the assassination of Philip of Swabia in June 1208, ended his contest for the throne against Otto of Brunswick, who later became Holy Roman Emperor, and eventually clashed with Innocent III, which led to his excommunication. And it wasn't just Germany. France was deeply embroiled in the Albigensian Crusade, and engaged in conflict with England under King John, known as John Lackland. Meanwhile, Sicily was under the rule of young Ken King Henry the Second, and Spain was preoccupied with its reconquista against the Almohads, leaving very little enthusiasm or energy for a new crusade. In the Levant, John of Brienne became a key figure in the Kingdom of Jerusalem through his marriage to Maria of Montferrat, and upon the birth of their daughter Isabella II, he was appointed regent. The region faced its own challenges, notably the war of the Antiochian succession following the death of Beaumont III, which would not be resolved until 1219. Despite the lack of a truce renewal with the Ayyubids under Sultan al-Adil, John of Brienne secured a new agreement in 1211 to last until 1217 and sought papal support, recognizing the limited military resources in the Syrian Franks. In the April of 1213, amidst a chaotic period for the Christian kingdoms, Pope Innocent launched a clarion call for a new crusade through his papal bull, Quia Maior, aiming to galvanize Christendom towards the recovery of Jerusalem. This initiative 
was further reinforced by the Ad Liberandum Decree, issued during the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, setting forth a framework for crusading that would endure for nearly a century. The Crusades' promotion, of course, faced obstacles, notably in France, where Robert of Courson's fervent recruitment efforts clashed with the local clergy, leading to tensions with Philip II of France. Despite these challenges, the Fourth Lateran Council sought to address grievances and unify Christian forces, though, ultimately, few Frenchmen joined the initial 1217 expedition. Innocent's vision for the Crusade emphasized papal leadership to avoid the misdirection experienced during the Fourth Crusade, which was a complete disaster. He planned for a rendezvous for crusaders in Brindisi and Messina, with strict measures to cut off trade with Muslims to secure supplies for the crusade. The Pope also offered indulgences not only to participants, but to those who financially supported the endeavor. An indulgence is effectively a ticket to heaven, if you didn't know. Now, the Crusade's preparation included ensuring the safe return of Raoul of Merencor, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, with John of Brienne tasked with his protection. Diplomatic efforts were made to reconcile regional conflicts involving Leo I of Armenia and Hugh I of Cyprus to secure a unified front upon the arrival of the crusading force. But Pope Innocent wasn't around for too long. Perhaps that's for the best. Because he died in July of 1216, and Honorius III ascended to the papacy, under whom the crusade of course continued to be a focal point. The subsequent year marked the crowning and tragic fate of Peter II of Courtenay as the Latin Emperor, whose capture and death highlighted this perilous journey to the East. Spiritual leadership and recruitment for the Crusade saw figures like Robert of Corson and Jacques de Vitry playing pivotal roles, the latter facing the challenge of preaching in the corruption-rife Latin settlements of Syria. Oliver of Paderborn's successful preaching in Germany, alongside Honorius's appeal to rulers like Andrew II of Hungary and Frederick II of Germany, underscored the widespread call to arms across all of Christendom. The cultural influence of troubadours like Elias Cairel Pons de Capdoulet, and Amory de Pegulan played a significant part in rallying support for the crusade, demonstrating an intertwined nature of martial and cultural mobilization for the greater good. So, as the armies assembled, estimates suggested a force exceeding 32,000 prepared with advanced siege technologies such as counterweight trebuchets, signaling a formidable campaign poised to make its mark on the Holy Land. This mobilization reflected not only the ambition and spiritual fervor driving the crusade, but also the complex politics and social dynamics that shaped Christendom's response to this call to arms. And so, in the early July of 1217, the Crusaders embarked on their journey to the Holy Land, choosing the familiar sea route. Their voyage commenced from Dartmouth, England, where they elected leaders and established laws for their expedition. 
Led by William I of Holland, the fleet set sail southward, stopping at the renowned pilgrimage site of Santiago de Compostela, before facing storms that unfortunately scattered the ships, delaying their arrival in Lisbon. Now upon reaching Lisbon, finally, albeit a little bit late, the local bishop appealed to the crusaders for assistance in seizing Alcácer do Sal, a city that was under Alamohad control. While the Frisians abstained, citing Pope Innocent's directives from the Fourth Lateran Council, the remainder of the crusaders, persuaded by the Portuguese plea, and, in alliance with the Knights Templar and Hospitaller, laid siege to the city. And they captured it in October of 1217. A fraction of Frisians, choosing not to participate in this siege, instead conducted raids along the Iberian coast, targeting Faro, Rota, Cadiz, and Ibiza amassing considerable plunder. They then ventured along the southern French coast, wintering in Civit Vecchia, Italy, before resuming their journey to Acre in 1218. Meanwhile, in the north, King Ingi II of Norway took up the cross in 1216, but he didn't last long. He passed away in the following spring, resulting in a pretty minimal contribution to the crusade from the Scandinavians. Maybe they'll join them next time. Now the Kingdom of Georgia, under Queen Tamar's ambitious leadership, had reached the pinnacle of its power, and was a formidable challenger to Ayurved dominance in eastern Anatolia. Tamar's reign concluded with her death in 1213, and her son, George IV of Georgia, initiated preparations for a crusade to aid the Franks in the Holy Land. However, the impending Mongol invasion in 1220 kind of put a spanner in the works. Priorities had to be prioritized. Georgia's demise led to his sister, Rusidan of Georgia, to inform the Pope that Georgia could unfortunately not honor its commitment to the crusade, due to the Mongols coming to burn and kill everything. I'm sure the Pope understood. Now, following Saladin's death in 1193, Sorry to go back a little bit, but we must explain that after his death, his brother Al-Adil ascended the print to the principal rule of Egypt, marking the beginning of the Ayyubid dynasty's leadership in the region. Saladin's lineage continued through his son, as Zahir Ghazi, who maintained control over Aleppo. The early years of Valadil's reign were challenged by natural disasters, including a devastating famine triggered by an exceptionally low Nile and catastrophic earthquakes exacerbating the populations suffering across Egypt and extending all the way to Syria and Armenia. Well, let me explain the Nile situation. Now, the Nile is subject to yearly floods, this is what irrigates a lot of the crops. If the flood is good, everybody's happy. If the flood is bad, as in not enough water, well, everyone gets a little bit hungry. You want to have a good flood, not too good. You don't want to have the house flooding, but just enough to irrigate the fields. Now, Al-Adil's tenure was characterized by a strategic approach to maintaining peace. He didn't want any more crusades. They were done with that. 
he wanted to avoid them altogether. Therefore, he engaged in trade with maritime powers Venice and Pisa, aiming to deter their involvement in crusading efforts against his rule. To strengthen the region's defences, he commissioned the construction of a new fortress at Mount Tabor, enhancing the protection of key cities such as Jerusalem and Damascus. Conflicts during his reign were predominantly localized in Syria, involving skirmishes with the Knights Hospitaller and disputes with Beaumont IV of Antioch, and these were mainly managed through his nephew Al-Zahir Ghazi, although Al-Adil himself did confront the Crusaders directly in 1207, showing that he was willing to negotiate peace through strategic concessions. Now the death of Al-Zahir in 1216 introduced a period of potential vulnerability for the Ayyubid domain, as he was succeeded by his three-year-old son, Al-Aziz Muhammad, and no one's scared of a three-year-old. The transition coincided with Saladin's eldest son, Al-Afdal, attempting to reclaim Aleppo with support from Kakyas I, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum. So that's more farther up towards the north. Now the resulting conflict within the Ayyubid territory underscored the dynasty's internal and external challenges. However, the resolution came when Al-Ashraf, another of Al-Adil's sons, defeated the invading Seljuk forces, thereby preserving the Ayyubid control over the Levant, at least for now. Now back to the European side of things. King Andrew II of Hungary was the inaugural European monarch to commit to the Fifth Crusade in 1217, following Pope Honorius III's summons to honour a vow made by his predecessor. Venturing from Zagreb with a formidable contingent, including notables like Leopold VI of Austria and Otto I, Duke of Merania, Andrew's substantial forces, which numbered at an estimated 20,000 cavalry and a much larger infantry force, embarked from Split to the Holy Land via the Venetian fleet demonstrating the significant mobilization for this crusade. Upon reaching Arca, strategic discussions commenced, led by Andrew II alongside key figures such as John of Brienne and the military order masters. Despite ambitious plans to strike in both Syria and Egypt, Logistical constraints necessitated a shift in focus towards more manageable military engagements. Al-Adil, aware of the impending crusader force, prepared defensively, ensuring his territories in Egypt and Syria were well guarded, particularly focusing on protecting Damascus and Jerusalem from potential crusader advances. The crusaders' initial maneuvers towards Damascus showcased the Ayyubid strategic withdrawals and defensive tactics, avoiding direct confrontation with the crusader force, significantly stronger crusader force. Now back to King Andrew. His leadership in these early stages although not leading significantly to territorial gains, laid foundational strategies for the crusade. His subsequent return to Hungary in 1218, owing to health concerns and the looming threat of excommunication, marked the end of what is now referred to as the Hungarian Crusade of 1217. Efforts to fortify key crusader strongholds like Chateau Pellerin 
and Caesarea, underscore the ongoing preparations for a larger offensive. Notably, the focus on Egypt as the primary target, specifically the port city of Damietta. The Crusaders made its strategic arrival at Damietta's port on the 27th of May, 1218, marking the beginning of an ambitious siege against Egypt's formidable defences. Initially led by Simon III of Saarbrück, and soon joined by luminaries such as John of Brienne and Leopold VI of Austria, the Crusaders' morale was buoyed by celestial signs, such as a lunar eclipse, interpreted as an omen of impending victory. Now, of course, things like this are really open to interpretation. Contrary to the Crusaders' determination, the Muslim defenders, under the stewardship of Sultan al-Adil, were caught completely off guard. Their complacency rooted in underestimating the Crusaders' resolve. Al-Adil, preferring diplomacy over conflict, found his peaceful inclinations rather at odds with the more belligerent elements within his realm. So, as the Crusaders assembled, Reinforcements from Syria bolstered the Egyptian ranks stationed at al adiliya though their primary role was defensive, aimed at thwarting any attempts by the Crusaders to cross the Nile. So what about Damietta? Well, it was known for its formidable fortifications. It featured a tri-layered wall system, that's right, three walls, numerous towers, and the strategically vital Burj al Silsila, or the Chain Tower, which controlled river access with massive iron chains. The initial Crusader assaults on this tower were met with failure. Despite the deployment of innovative siege tactics, and even the construction of special siege vessels specifically designed to overcome the city's unique defences. A breakthrough did eventually come, with the leadership and creativity of Oliver of Padebon, whose siege engine, protected from Greek fire and equipped with a novel revolving ladder, enabled the Crusaders to finally capture the chain tower on the 25th of August, a victory that dramatically shifted the siege's momentum. The unexpected loss of the tower, and the subsequent death of Sultan al-Adil, marked a turning point. The succession of al-Kamil to the Sultanate brought renewed efforts to defend Egypt, including the strategic scuttling of the ships to block the Nile. Complicating the Crusaders' position as they prepared to endure the winter of 1218-19 and continue their push against the Ayyubid dynasty's heartland. As the siege of Damietta dragged on and on, the Crusaders found themselves at quite a crossroads. Despite their strategic advantages, the momentum of their campaign began to wane as leaders considered their vows already fulfilled and many contemplated returning home. The logistical challenges of the Nile and the anticipation of reinforcements prompted a approach of wait and see. Among the awaited were Pelagius Galvani and Robert of Corson, dispatched by the Pope with crusaders from Rome, alongside a contingent from England led by notable figures like Ranulf de Blondeville and Oliver and Richard, 
King John's sons. The Crusader camp suddenly faced assaults from Egyptian forces starting on the 9th of October 1218, but they managed to repel the attacks thanks to timely counteractions by John of Brienne and a good amount of strategic failures on the Egyptian side. Despite Pelagius assuming command with a claim to supreme leadership, his initiatives yielded not very much. Further hampered by natural calamities like a devastating storm that inflicted heavy losses on the crusaders, including the loss of a vital floating fortress and subsequent disease outbreaks which claimed many lives. Notably, it also claimed the life of Robert of Corson. In the midst of these challenges, Al Camille's reign was nearly upended by a coup, sparking a chaotic retreat by the Egyptians that presented the Crusaders with an unexpected opportunity to advance. So as the negotiations began, Al Camille's generous offer to surrender Jerusalem for a Crusader withdrawal from Egypt was met with some mixed reactions. Torn between the secular leader's pragmatism and Pelagius and the religious order's resistance, emphasizing the deep divisions within the crusading camps. Personally, I think it's a pretty good deal. But I wasn't there. Now, Al Muazzam's strategic decision to dismantle fortifications in the Holy Land was a calculated move to weaken potential crusader positions. Despite ongoing assaults by Muslim reinforcements, the crusaders' resolve was stiffened by new arrivals and supplies, allowing for continued, though often futile, assaults on Damietta. Pelagius's aggressive tactics in July and August of 1219 marked a repeated but unsuccessful assaults on Damietta and a disastrous attempt to capture al Kamil's camp at Fariskur. Definitely dwindling fortunes for the Crusaders. Yet the Sultan's renewed peace offer, once again stretching out the hand, more desperate and conciliatory than before, was again rejected. Well, that just shows that Pelagius was there for the long run. He wanted Egypt, and he was going to get it, no matter what. Then, Francis of Assisi's arrival at the Crusader camp in September 1219 marked another poignant chapter in the narrative of the Fifth Crusade. Initially barred by Pelagius from pursuing what seemed to be a doomed mission, Francis, along with Illumato d'Arietti, was eventually permitted to cross enemy lines under the assumption that they would simply never return and stop being a problem to everybody. However, contrary to expectations, Sultan al Kamil was intrigued by these Christian mendicants and entertained their message, a bold denouncement of Islam with unexpected tolerance. Although calls for their execution arose, I mean it was blasphemy, and the Muslims generally don't like that, al Kamil himself allowed them a respectful hearing and ensured their safe return, a gesture that underscored a mutual pursuit of peace and respect amid the conflict. Now Francis's interactions with al Kamil transcend mere diplomatic parley. They manifested his lifelong dedication to the ethos of Christian missionary work, exemplified by his 
previous attempt to convert the caliph and his legendary encounter with the wolf of Gubbio. This episode did not culminate in the sultan's conversion, as later Franciscan narratives suggest, but it did ensure a gentler treatment of Christian captives, and marked a significant, albeit symbolic, bridging of the two faiths. Now, back to the siege of Damietta, stretching all the way from 1218 to 1219, that represented the Crusaders' relentless efforts to recapture the Holy Land. Despite initial setbacks and the grueling campaign marked by environmental hardships and internal strife, the spirits of the Crusaders were buoyed by a failed resupply attempt by al Kamil's forces. This misstep had the unwittingly unified the crusaders, propelling them towards the city's eventual capture. Damietta, found nearly deserted and laden with the spoils of war, offered the crusaders a strategic and extremely high morale boost, a victory on all fronts, albeit at staggering cost to the city's inhabitants. But, you know. Now post-victory, Damietta became a focal point of contention among the Crusaders, caught between the secular and ecclesiastical claims to its rule. John of Brienne's departure, under unclear circumstances, left Pelagius completely in charge, a decision later ratified by Pope Honorius III, further entrenching the papal authority in the Crusades' leadership. The succession crisis in the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia following Leo I's death significantly impacted John of Brienne, a prominent figure of the Crusade and despite Leo I's designation of his infant daughter, Isabella of Armenia, as his heir, Pope Honorius's initial support for John, through his marriage to Stephanie of Armenia, underscores quite an intertwining of politics, inheritance, and the crusade as a whole. John's claim was abruptly terminated by the deaths of Stephanie and their son, leading to a swift papal shift in support of Raymond Ropin, Leo I's disinherited relative. Well, John wasn't giving up yet. His journey to assert the claim, followed by his strategic withdrawal amidst the controversy and subsequent relinquishing of his claims, illustrates a transient alliance and the shifting sands of power of the time. His departure for Jerusalem, rumoured as desertion, but aimed at securing his inheritance and his eventual return to the Crusade, reflect the dual pressures of feudal obligations and the Crusader ideal. The unguarded sea routes, leading to a Muslim attack on Limassol, exemplify the logistical challenges faced by the Crusaders and the constant threat posed by the Ayyubids, even after the significant victory at Damietta. The departure of the Cypriot forces, alongside John's return journey through Cyprus, potentially replenishing his ranks, demonstrates the importance of naval strength in maintaining control and supply lines across the extremely important Eastern Mediterranean. John of Brienne's actions, oscillating between personal territorial claims in Cilicia and his commitment to the crusading cause in Egypt, embody the role of the crusader leaders who had to navigate personal ambitions 
feudal loyalties and their obligations to the Pope. Now, with that being said, the period of following the capture of Damietta by the Crusaders in the 5th century was not marked by celebration, but rather stagnation and internal discord, ultimately setting the stage for the catastrophic Battle of Mansurah in 1221. Despite achieving a significant victory, the Crusader forces found themselves mired in inactivity, undetermined by a lack of discipline and strategic direction. Pelagius's stringent rules, while intended to maintain order, failed to effectively mobilize the Crusaders or protect vital supply routes from Cyprus, leading to significant losses and contributing to a sense of disillusionment with the ranks. At this point, everybody had pretty much had enough. The addition of new troops, including contingents led by high-ranking ecclesiastical figures, such as the Archbishop of Milan, did very little to galvanize the Crusader forces. Meanwhile, the Muslim world, under the leadership of Al-Kamil, adapted to the new threat posed by the Crusaders, reinforcing strategic locations such as Mansurah and renewing diplomatic overtures for peace, which were consistently rebuffed by Pelagius and the Crusader leadership. The Crusades' fixation on prophecies and rumors of the mythical Christian King Prester John coming to their aid illustrates a desperate hope for divine and miraculous intervention in their campaign. This belief in prophetic victory clouded their strategic judgment, leading to rash military decisions such as the ill-fated advance on Cairo, the anticipation of support from Frederick II, which was delayed and ultimately ineffective, further exacerbated the crusade's precarious position. In contrast, the Muslim response, characterized by diplomatic efforts and military reinforcements, demonstrated a more pragmatic approach to the threat posed by the crusaders. The Ayyubid's ability to shift focus and resources in response to changing circumstances, including the potential threat from the Mongols, underscored their resilience and strategic acumen. Which leads us to the 4th of July, 1221. The crusade, led by Pelagius, made a pivotal yet ultimately ill-fated decision to advance towards Cairo. Against the counsel of more experienced leaders like John Brienne, who was advising very sternly against this decision. But of course, no one listened. This bold move aimed to press their advantage following the capture of Damietta, but quickly faltered due to a combination of overconfidence, inadequate preparations, and a complete lack of understanding of the local geography and enemy tactics. The Crusaders' camp, poorly situated and poorly constructed, proved to be vulnerable to the Ayyubid Sultan Al-Kamil's strategic responses. Al-Kamil, leveraging his intimate knowledge of the region, and his newly arrived reinforcements from Syria skillfully maneuvered his forces to isolate the Crusaders from Damietta, their critical supply line. Despite warnings from his allies and the dire visible build-up of Egyptian forces, Pelagius persisted with the offensive. All of this led to a dire situation for the Crusaders. The Egyptians capitalized on their geographical advantage by utilizing the Nile's canals to outmaneuver 
and besiege the crusader forces, effectively cutting them off. In a desperate bid to retreat, the crusaders found themselves completely trapped, compounded by their own negligence in safeguarding their wine stores, leading to disorder within their ranks. Now recognizing their precarious position, and the futility of further combat, especially after the Egyptians flooded their encampment by opening the Nile sluices, Pelagius decided it was probably time to initiate some peace agreements. But this time, the terms weren't so forgiving. The Crusaders were to relinquish Damietto, and agree to an eight-year truce in exchange for safe passage home, the liberation of prisoners, and the return of the True Cross relic, which was probably the one that stung the most. The negotiation process was naturally tense, with the exchange of hostages to ensure compliance. Notably, the Crusaders' hostages included John of Brienne and Herman of Salza, while the Egyptians offered up al kamils son, as Sali Ayub. So, the surrender of Damietta on the 8th of September 1221 marked a humiliating conclusion to the Fifth Crusade, with the Crusader forces retreating under the terms agreed upon. This retreat underscored the campaign's complete strategic misjudgments and logistical overreach, ending the crusade without achieving its lofty objective of reclaiming Jerusalem. And actually, they didn't achieve anything at all. They only lost more, and they had to hand over the true cross. Thus, the Fifth Crusade concluded with no significant gains. It was marked by substantial losses in lives, resources, and, of course, reputation. The premature initiation of offensive operations before Emperor Frederick II's reinforcements arrived, and the rejection of a peace treaty, were sources of widespread bitterness. Key figures faced personal consequences. Walter of Peleria was exiled, and Admiral Henry of Malta was initially imprisoned, but later pardoned by Frederick II. John of Brienne? He faced criticism for his leadership, and was notably absent during the critical phases of the crusade in 1220. What about Pelagius, though? Well, he was denounced for ineffective leadership and his refusal of the Sultan's peace offers. Frederick II received the harshest criticism for his apparent lack of commitment to the Holy Land, focusing instead on European ambitions. Additionally, the Crusaders failed to secure the return of a piece of the True Cross, a significant religious symbol, which just added to the campaign's perceived failures. Just throw it on the pile, I suppose. Well, thank you very much for listening. And that was it, the Fifth Crusade. The Sixth Crusade, led by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, stands out quite uniquely in the history of the Crusades for its diplomatic rather than military approach to regaining control of Jerusalem. Frederick's negotiations with the Ayyubid Sultan of Egypt, al kamil resulted in a treaty that restored Jerusalem peacefully. Not only that, but Nazareth and Bethlehem were put back into Christian hands without a fight. An achievement that previous crusades had failed to accomplish through decades of warfare and losses. Well, how did they do it? You're about to find out. Hello and welcome to the channel. 
If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. Well, if you'd like to support the channel, as always, Patreon links are in the description and comments. Otherwise, like, comment and subscribe. Now before we begin, do remember, this is the sixth video in the series on the Crusades. So if you want to start from the beginning, go on to my channel's playlists and you'll find them in the Medieval History section. So without further ado, let's get on to the Sixth Crusade. First, we must understand how the Fifth Crusade ended. Give us some context. The Fifth Crusade concluded in 1221 without achieving its objectives, largely due to the absence of Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, who had vowed to participate, but never showed up. His forces, which were sent to Egypt a little too late, could not salvage the campaign, marred by a lack of effective leadership. The delay persisted until Frederick's eventual actions years later. So, a little bit earlier, after Pope Innocent III's death in 1216, his successor, Honorius III, gently reminded Frederick of his commitment, a stance that hardened under Gregory IX, who became Pope in March of 1227. Meanwhile, on the Muslim side, the Ayyubids in Syria and Egypt were embroiled in their own internal strife. Yet, the Sultan al Kamil's peace offer, made during the Crusade, remained open, a chance that Frederick would later seize upon. Frederick's role in the aftermath of the Fifth Crusade became crucial for Christendom's effort to retake Jerusalem. At his coronation as King of Germany in 1215, Frederick surprised many by taking up the cross, a vow he reiterated upon his crowning in Rome in 1220. And despite reminders from Honorius, Frederick's departure for the crusade was once again delayed. Strategic meetings and vows in 1222 and 1223 failed to hasten his departure. A marriage to Isabella II of Jerusalem in 1225, arranged with John of Brienne, aimed to solidify his position, but did not expedite the crusade. Well, despite efforts to rally support for a new crusade led by Frederick, there were still plenty of obstacles in the way. The departure was delayed beyond the planned 1225 date, reflecting the challenges of mobilizing support across Europe, which had its own internal fractures. But Frederick's commitment to the crusade, questioned due to these delays, would eventually lead to his own controversial crusade in 1228, undertaken under drastically different circumstances from those envisioned during the Fifth Crusade. The San Germano Agreement, concluded on July the 25th, 1225, in modern Casino, featured negotiations between Frederick and Honorius, mediated by Dominican Gaula de Ronis. Frederick pledged to initiate a crusade by August 15, 1227, to support 1,000 knights in Syria for two years, and to provide 100,000 ounces of gold, safeguarded by key figures such as Herman of Salza and John of Brienne, to be used for the Holy Land or returned upon his arrival in Acre. The Emperor affirmed the agreement, albeit solemnly, with Reynald of Erlingen 
vowing on Frederick's soul to honor the terms under penalty of excommunication. Frederick therefore reiterated his commitment in a letter to the Pope, accepting all of the consequences of non-compliance. Following the agreement with Honorius for a crusade before 1228, Frederick convened an imperial diet in Cremona to address heresy, organize the crusade, and restore imperial power in northern Italy. This prompted the reformation of the Lombard League, opposing Frederick's influence and leading to the cancellation of the diet. The situation was stabilized somewhat through a compromise facilitated by Honorius, involving the restoration of papal possessions in the kingdom of Sicily back to the Pope. Frederick sought to undertake the crusade as the king of Jerusalem, marrying John of Brienne's daughter Isabella by proxy in August 1225 in Arca, later formalized in Brindisi on November the 9th, 1227. Disagreements, however, arose between Frederick and John regarding the kingship, with Frederick asserting his claim and proclaiming himself King of Jerusalem in December of 1225. John sought to support Rome where Pope Honorius sided with him, but Frederick's claim was acknowledged by Jerusalemite lords, excluding the Evelyns. Based on the Assises of Jerusalem which required the monarch's residence in the kingdom. Now, in preparation for his rule and the crusade, Frederick issued a royal decree granting privileges to the Teutonic Knights, putting them on equal footing with the Templars and Hospitallers. And if you want to know about them, I've made full videos about it. Go and have a look, it'll be in the Medieval History playlist. Well, he also appointed Thomas of Aquino as the Bailey of the Kingdom, replacing Odo of Montbéliard. In November of 1222, John of Brienne, the first king of Jerusalem to travel to Europe, landed in Brindisi with several goals. To replenish the kingdom's depleted treasury, ensure future crusades weren't hindered by fragmented leadership, like the debacle they witnessed in Egypt, what an embarrassment, and, of course, to secure the kingdom's leading role in such endeavours. Despite appeals for aid in England and Spain, his efforts yielded very little. Even a promise made on a deathbed from Philip II of France drew from funds already designated for the Holy Land. Henry III of England's levy for the cause also appeared to garner limited resources. So, the Fourth Lateran Council's decree, ad liberandum, in 1215, had already established a public funding system for the Crusades, with disbursements from papal treasury significantly supporting the movement, alongside individual contributions from the Crusaders. Of course, it didn't work out too well uh, in previous times, but that's another story. Now, by 1220, though, Innocent II had centralized these distributions. However, from 1221 to 28, ecclesiastical funding for Frederick's impending crusade was nowhere to be found, compelling the emperor to finance the Sixth Crusade independently. The gold reserved after the San Germano Agreement was quickly depleted due to delays, prompting Frederick to levy taxes in Sicily from 1228, though he did secure additional financial backing from Cyprus 
and leveraged his title as Jerusalem. These efforts were, however, insufficient, resulting in only a modestly sized crusader army, and he was going to need more than that. Of course, the Fifth Crusade's failure was a collective effort of the Ayyubid brothers Al-Kamil, Al-Muazzam, and Al-Ashraf. Post-1221, Al-Muazzam returned to Damascus, wary of his brother's intentions, and in June 1222, he launched a campaign against I am Guy brother Embriaco to uphold a truce and unsuccessfully besieged his cousin Al Nasir Kilij Arslan, the Emir of Hama, briefly capturing Murad al Numan and Salamia before being ordered by Al Kamil to cease and relinquish his gains. He then formed an alliance with Saladin's former general, Gokbori possibly at al-Nasir Sultan's behest, to confront al-Ashraf. Once again, this is all important to understand the Six Crusades' development. We have to sort of go back and set the scene from the end of the Fifth. Now, al-Muzaffar Ghazi, stationed in Marafarikin, careful when you say that, and Aklat, lost Aklat to al-Ashraf after a revolt. Then joining al-Muazzam's rebellion, their uprising was swiftly suppressed by al-Ashraf with support from Aleppo. After multiple failed assaults on Homs, restrained by al-Kamil, al-Muazzam sought support from Egyptian dissidents boldly challenging Al-Kamil to confront him in Syria, and enlisted Khwarazamians under Jalal al-Din Mangaburni against al-Ashraf. In 1226, as al-Muazzam and Gokbori launched offensives on Homs and the Mosul region respectively, al-Ashraf called upon Kaikubad I, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, for assisting against Gokburi. Ultimately, Al-Muazzam and Gokburi prevailed, with Jalal al-Din establishing control over Aklat, and later Azerbaijan, recognized by Al-Muazzam, who maintained control over Damascus. Now in the next year, 1227, with the Crusaders assembling and his realm under threat, Al-Kamil revised the idea of ceding Jerusalem to Frederick II, as internal dissent and external pressures continued to mount. Now following Al-Muazzam's death in the November of 1227, his son Nasir Daoud succeeded him with Al Kamil's endorsement. And there was a peacetime, albeit a short lived one, as Duad defied Al Kamil over Crack de Montreal and Al Aziz Uthman's aggression led Al Kamil to capture Jerusalem and Nablus in 1228. This led to a meeting between Al Ashraf and Al Kamil at Tel Al Ajul and it resulted in Al-Ashraf taking Damascus, leaving Duad with Al-Jazira, and Al-Kamil began negotiations with Frederick II. By 1226, the preparations for the Sixth Crusade indicated an imminent expedition aimed at reclaiming Jerusalem, led by Emperor Frederick. Bound by this previous agreement of San Germano, Frederick committed to the campaign. The transition from Honorius III to Gregory IX in 1227 brought a pope with a strong resolve for the crusade, and a notable antipathy towards Frederick. So, from here let's go through some of the key events. Bit of a timeline for you. Starting from August 1227, 
the initial group of crusaders left Brindisi for Syria and landed there by October. Between 1226 and 1227, Frederick was in engagement with diplomatic talks with the Ayyubid Sultan al Kamil. In the September of 1227, a second contingent, including Frederick, embarked but soon returned. Months later, in November of the same year, Pope Gregory IX excommunicated Frederick. Then in June 1228, Frederick embarked for the Holy Land. After pausing in Cyprus for five weeks, Frederick reached Arca in September 1228. The Six Crusades saw a shift in focus directly towards Jerusalem with contributions mainly from Germany and financing directly from Sicily. Bishop Conrad of Hildesheim took over recruitment efforts in Germany, succeeding Oliver of Paderborn. Landgrave Louis of Thuringia and Valran of Limburg inspired numerous knights from Thuringia and Austria to join with additional support from cities like Cologne, Lübeck, and Worms. Now, English involvement came through Henry III, who had been interested in a crusade since his coronation. Despite the domestic issues that were taking precedence, there was significant English participation William Brewer, the Bishop of Exeter, represented his uncle, William Brewer, joining with Peter de Roches, Bishop of Winchester. Now, their contingent, possibly including mercenaries as well as the main force, left from Brindisi in the August of 1227. Both of these aforementioned bishops worked very closely with Frederick II, and they even disregarded papal orders due to Frederick's excommunication, and contributed financially to the Crusaders' efforts, notably in terms of fortifying Jaffa and Caesarea. Now back to the Muslim side. Sultan al Kamil, facing internal conflicts, decided to seek negotiations from the West offering control of parts of the Holy Land for military support against his brother, Al-Muazzam. Frederick II, who was notably quite familiar with Arabic and Muslim culture, sent his own advisers to meet with al Kamil, but the initial talks led only to an exchange of gifts. Negotiations continued even after and despite of Frederick's excommunication. Now by midsummer of 1227, Brindisi was completely full of crusaders, leading to overcrowding and disease due to the high temperatures. Discontent led a lot of these crusaders to simply return home, with notable deaths, including the Bishop of Augsburg, the first groups sailed in August 1227, comprising of Germans, French and English, who arrived in Arca by early October. They reinforced the coastal towns and initiated more construction projects, including rebuilding Montfort Castle for the Teutonic Knights. Oh, I'm sure they were very pleased about that. Now, Frederick II's departure, of course, was delayed, and upon setting sail on the 8th of September 1227, plague struck the fleet, causing deaths, including Louis of Thuringia. Frederick disembarked at Otranto for some professional medical care, while his fleet continued the journey on to Acre. With Frederick's absence, somebody had to be in charge, so he had Henry IV of Limburg take the command until he was on the mend. 
which leads us to early 1228. Al-Aziz Uthman of Banyas Now negotiations between Frederick and Sultan al-Kamil resumed in secret, causing unease among the German crusaders, and upon learning of al-Muazam's death in November 1227, Frederick sent Richard Filangieri with reinforcements to Syria, planning his departure for spring 1228. In a final attempt to reconcile with Pope Gregory IX, Frederick dispatched Archbishop Albert I of Kaffenberg and two Sicilian justiciars to negotiate with the Pope, but he was having none of it. It was to no avail. Consequently, Frederick embarked from Brindisi on June 28, 1228, leading a relatively small force due to his primary army, having already departed back in August 1227, and additional forces in April 1228. Notably, Gurin de Montagu, the hospitaller master, who had influenced the Pope to end the truce with the Muslims, refused to join the excommunicated emperor prompting Bertrand de Thessy to take his place. Now during the journey, Frederick's fleet made several stops. On June 29th he stopped at Otranto, then Othanoi, and Corfu. On July the 2nd he stopped at Porto Guicardo, and finally he arrived at Suda Bay in Crete on July the 7th. The fleet lingered along the Cretan coast, including a full day stop at Heraklion, before crossing the Aegean to Rhodes between July 12th and 15th. After replenishing water at Fenica on the Anatolian coast on July 16th, the fleet crossed to Cyprus, landing in Limassol on July 21st. Cyprus had been an imperial fief since Emperor Henry VI, Frederick's father, had recognized Amory of Lusignan as king just before the German Crusade of 1196. Following Amory's death in 1205, his widow, Alice of Champagne, became regent for their son, Henry I. Alice related to Empress Isabella II, and unaware of Frederick's claims, faced contention when Frederick arrived, intending to assert his authority over Cyprus, particularly challenging John of Ibelin's regency. Frederick's insistence that John of Ibelin's regency was illegitimate led to significant disputes particularly over the fight of Beirut, highlighting the constitutional separation between the kingdoms of Cyprus and Jerusalem. And this dispute alienated the influential Ibelin faction, setting a tense backdrop for Frederick's crusade efforts. Well, after all this, Frederick finally departed for Arca on from, rather, Famagusta, on September the 3rd, 1228, with King Henry I, John of Ibelin, and other Cypriot nobles, leaving Amalric Barlais as the bailey of Cyprus. Upon arriving in Arca on September 7th, 1228, Frederick was received warmly by the Templars, Hospitallers, and the clergy, although his excommunication prevented him from some ceremonial factions. But everybody was in general pretty happy to see him. What he could not get, though, from the clergy was the ceremony called the Kiss of Peace. Look that one up. In response, Frederick sought reconciliation with the Pope 
by sending Henry of Malta and Archbishop Marino Filangieri to convey his arrival in Syria and request absolution. I mean, after all, the problem was he couldn't get to Acre. Well, he called in sick, but the Pope didn't believe him. So, of course, he uh, had Reynald of Spatello appointed as his regent in Sicily to negotiate with Rome. Hopefully this time, with a bit of luck, the Pope will be a little more lenient on old Frederick. Well, unfortunately, the Pope, Gregory the Ninth, remained firm, instructing the Latin Patriarch and the heads of military orders to uphold the Emperor's excommunication. Talk about making it personal. Not fair on Frederick, I don't think. Well, his presence in Acre caused John of Ibelin to secure Beirut against potential imperial aggression, highlighting that divided loyalty within Acre. While Frederick's personal army and the Teutonic Knights supported him, others, including the Templars and the Syrian clergy, adhered to the papal stance against him. The Pisans and the Genoese sided with Frederick, whereas the English allegiance fluctuated depending on politics. Frederick attempted to maintain support by assigning nominal commands to loyalists like Herman of Salza and Richard Filangieri, but his excommunication dampened quite a lot of public enthusiasm. The Pope was doing everything he could to make Frederick a pariah. The military orders, particularly the Hospitallers and the Templars, were cautious, supporting the crusade indirectly so as not to draw ire from the papacy. The local barons, however, initially welcomed Frederick, but they began to grow sceptical due to his centralizing tendencies and previous actions in Cyprus, notably against John of Ibelin. With a modest force that was incapable of decisive action, and facing potential threats to his realm from Pope Gregory the Ninth, Frederick recognized that his campaign would have to rely on diplomacy rather than the strength of arms. Fortunately, Frederick was quite the talker. After settling conflicts within Syria, al Kamil was in a stronger position than when he initially offered a deal to Frederick. However, he likely was not aware of the diminished size of Frederick's army, and if he was, he may have seen things a little differently. Now, recognizing that negotiation was his best chance for success due to his limited military capability, Frederick communicated his presence in the Holy Land to al Kamil through envoys Thomas of Aquino and Balian of Sidon. al Kamil's response was polite, but non-committal. Subsequent discussions took place with al Kamil's representatives at the Hospitalo camp near Arca. During this time, al Kamil moved closer to the negotiation site. Frederick attempted to leverage his limited forces as a threat, hoping to pressure al Kamil into honoring a previously discussed agreement for the return of the city of Jerusalem. Despite his excommunication, Frederick was indirectly supported by the leaders and governing structure of groups like the Templars and Hospitallers during a march intended to show a great deal of force. However, the campaign was complicated by John of Brienne's actions in Italy posing a threat to Frederick's holdings there 
and pressuring him to conclude his business in the Holy Land swiftly. Al-Kamil, meanwhile, was preoccupied with a siege in Damascus, which possibly made him a little bit more inclined to come to the negotiation table. Eventually, he consented to hand over Jerusalem and a coastal corridor to the Crusaders. This treaty, finalizing on the 18th of February 1229, initiated a ten-year peace, witnessed by English bishops Peter de Roches and William Brewer. Though no complete version of the treaty exists, either in Latin or Arabic, it is known that al Kamil did relinquish control of Jerusalem. Notably, this excluded certain Islamic holy places that they kept for themselves. But the Crusaders also got Bethlehem, Nazareth, and part of the Sidon district. They also got Jaffa and Turon, which gave them significant coastal access. All in all, it was a good deal. The specifics of other territories returned to Christian dominion remain a little uncertain due to varying historical accounts. On this agreement was notably a compromise, leaving the Temple Mount, Jami al Aska, Aqsa rather, and the Dome of the Rock under Muslim control. Of course, they were not going to give up the Dome of the Rock. With the Transjordan castles also remaining in Ayyubid hands. I mean, they weren't stupid. Well, while the treaty's stance on the restoration of Jerusalem's fortifications is not explicitly clear, the Crusaders did indeed rebuild the city walls, and they weren't stupid either. Referred to at times as the Treaty of Jaffa, this accord is part of a broader agreement among Ayyubid rulers at Tel Ajul, near Gaza, making the pact with Frederick uh, rather an extension of these discussions. Thus also known as the Treaty of Jaffa and Tel Ajul. So Frederick's commitments within this treaty included support for al Kamil against adversaries, any adversaries, including Christian ones, effectively excluding the Principality of Antioch and the County of Tripoli from receiving aid in Muslim conflicts. The conditions regarding the military orders and the lands of Beaumont IV of Antioch reflect their reluctance back to Frederick, with an agreement to maintain the status quo and prohibit external assistance. The patriarch and leaders of the military orders, including Gerald of Lausanne, Pedro de Montagu, and Bertrand de Thesi, felt that this treaty and its allowances more than compromised the security of Jerusalem. Hermann of Salsa tried to mediate with Gerold, suggesting reconciliation. But the Patriarch viewed these efforts as deceitful. And of course, the Crusader states, well, they weren't as united as the movies will try and tell you. In fact, most of the time they were at each other's throats. If they weren't busy fighting Muslims, they were busy fighting each other and sometimes they were doing both on the same day. Now, he attempted to block Frederick's entry in Jerusalem, Hermann of Salsa, this is, by warning of excommunication for the army and declaring an interdict over the entire city. But despite these efforts, and the sending of Archbishop Peter of Caesarea to intercept the army, didn't work. He was unsuccessful. So 
So, Frederick triumphantly entered Jerusalem on the 17th of March, 1229, formally accepting the city's surrender from al Kamil's representative. The following day, he visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and, in a extremely controversial move, he crowned himself, possibly with the imperial crown, signalling his claim over Jerusalem. It was not received well. The act was seen as contentious, especially without the patriarch's presence, raising concerns about its legitimacy as an official coronation. Frederick's statement during the ceremony, which was read by Herman of Salza, reportedly attributed his excommunication to the Pope's advisers rather than the Pope himself. While well, Frederick, still wearing his crown apparently, visited the Hospitaller's palace to discuss Jerusalem's fortifications with English bishops and military order members, Archbishop Peter of Caesarea arrived on the 19th of March, 1229, to impose an interdict, but that ultimately was refrained. Frederick's interest in Jerusalem, little by little, began to diminish, and he faced hostility from Archer's populace, who reportedly pelted him with rotten fruits and any garbage they could get their hands on. Just goes to show you how popular the, quote, king, unquote, was. Well, Odo of Montbelliard and John of Ibelin intervened to calm the situation, but, well, opinion polls are always rather cruel. On the 1st of May, 1229, Frederick left Archer bound for Cyprus, where he attended the proxy wedding of Henry I of Cyprus to Alice of Montferrat. He returned back to Brindisi on the 10th of June, 1229, with the Pope learning of his departure from the Holy Land only about a month later. By autumn, Frederick had regained control over his empire. He even had his excommunication lifted on the 28th of August, 1230, following the Treaty of San Germano. Frederick also restored confiscated properties to the Hospitallers and Templars in Sicily. Well, to sum up, the outcome of the Sixth Crusade elicited a pretty mixed reception across the Christian and Muslim worlds. Frederick II, in a letter to Henry III of England, celebrated the crusade as a monumental triumph. He highlighted these successful negotiations and peaceful reclaimments of Jerusalem, positioning it as a testament to his diplomatic skills and leadership. Conversely, a starkly different perspective was presented in a letter penned by the patriarch Gerald of Lausanne, which was addressed to all the faithful. This correspondence castigated Frederick's approach and questioned the genuine success of the crusade, hinting at a more complex and less favorable outcome from the Christian standpoint. I think it's a bit harsh. I think he did pretty good, considering the circumstances. Well, we can't just talk about the Christian side. On the Muslim side, the reaction to the treaty was, of course, equally complex. Sultan al-Kamil, who had negotiated the agreement with Frederick, found more than a few reasons to be satisfied with the outcomes primarily because it allowed him to concentrate on the internal conflicts and threats that were threatening his rule. However, chroniclers and historians in the Islamic world seemingly lambasted the treaty as a 
catastrophic setback, interpreting it as a significant loss and even a dishonor to the Muslim defense against the Crusaders. The blame squarely placed on al Kamil, with critiques extending both to the Sultan for his decisions and Frederick for exploiting the situation to his advantage, reflecting a deep-seated resentment and disappointment within the Muslim narrative. All in all, I think we can chalk this one up for a win to the Christian side. The ten-year truce established by the treaty, set to expire in 1239, prompted Pope Gregory IX to issue a call for another crusade. They just can't help themselves, can't they? Well, this was aimed to secure the Holy Lands for Christendom in a more permanent fashion. And yeah, I suppose that the truce was for both sides. The Muslims were waiting for it to end, and the Christians were waiting for it to end, so they could get back to the good old holy war. Well, after this, it led to the initiation of what is called the Baron's Crusade, which I will cover. A somewhat disorganized, but very ambitious military expedition. And despite limited support from Frederick and the Pope, it managed to capture significant territories, and it even surpassed the territorial gains of the Sixth Crusade. But we'll have to talk about that in the next video, won't we? Well, thank you very much for joining me today. It's once again been a pleasure to walk you through all of this. And I'd like to thank my Mega Chat dear patrons, that is Jeffrey, JC, and Stark Factory. Thank you very much, guys, for your glorious contribution. If you'd like to make your contribution, you need only follow the links and you know what to do. But until next time, there's plenty more crusades to talk about. And despite the intensity of the creation of all this content, we're not slowing down. We're not running out of history. Following the Baron's Crusade, Jerusalem and the Ayyubid dynasty were fraught with internal divisions, weakening both factions. The Christian loss of Jerusalem and defeat at Gaza in 1244 significantly diminished their military foothold in the Holy Land and paved the way for the emergence of the Mamluk Sultanate. It was during this period of instability that Louis IX of France, encouraged by Pope Innocent IV, initiated the Seventh Crusade, with the specific objective of reclaiming Jerusalem. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to have you back with me again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, Take a look at the links to the Patreon, and you know what to do. Otherwise, a like, comment, and subscribe really helps. So, if you want to help me out, and click that like button. Thanks in advance. Now, get yourself comfortable, because we will now begin our topic for today. A full history of the Seventh Crusade. Now... Usually I will start off chronologically, but today I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler alert in the form of a Templar knight who was lamenting the outcome of the Seventh Crusade. So, it goes like this, and I will read from his direct quote. Rage and sorrow are seated in my heart, so firmly that I scarce dare to stay alive. It seems that God wishes to support the Turks to our loss. Ah, Lord God. Alas, the realm of the East has lost so much 
that it will never be able to rise up again. They will make a mosque of Holy Mary's convent, and since the theft pleases her son, who should weep at this? We are forced to comply as well. Anyone who wishes to fight the Turks is mad, for Jesus Christ does not fight them any more. They have conquered. They will conquer. For every day they drive us down, knowing that God, who was awake, sleeps now, and Muhammad waxes powerful. So, with that knowledge in mind, you perhaps know the outcome of the story, but I thought it was a good place to start. So how did we get to this point? Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. From 1241 to 1244, the Barons' Crusade concluded with the Kingdom of Jerusalem extending its territories, marking its largest expansion since the glory days of 1187, thanks to negotiations led mostly by Theobald I of Navarre. When Richard of Cornwall solidified agreements with the Muslim factions, he garnered support from the influential Ibelin family, particularly John of Ibelin, who was the old lord of Beirut. Despite the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II's crowning in 1229, and the Ibelin's initial acceptance of him as regent for the young Conrad II of Jerusalem, the kingdom, with its seat in Arca, faced rejection of Frederick's rule and a palpable absence of centralized authority. Richard's departure on the 3rd of May, 1241, left the kingdom seemingly stable, but internally it was completely fragmented, with various barons returning to their respective fiefs in Syria and Cyprus. Meanwhile, disputes escalated between the Templars and the Hospitallers in Acre and Hebron, driven mainly by disagreements over a treaty with Egypt. The Templars' attack on Nablus in the October of 1242, justified by retaliatory moves against An Nasir Daoud's aggression towards the Christian pilgrims, exemplified the deep-seated belief among Muslims that peace with the Franks was a pipe dream. Well, intrigues in Arca saw some hospitalers conspiring with Filangieri to overthrow the city to imperial control, but this coup was thwarted by an alliance of Templars, Philip of Montfort, and maritime republics. Despite the initial internal coup's failure and the eventual disavowal of Hospitaller Grand Master Pierre de Velbiod, Tyre remained a contested area until Richard Filangieri's departure and the eventual ceding of control to Philip of Montfort. Amidst the Ayyubid dynasty's disarray following Sultan al kamils death in 1238, his son As-Sali Ayyub seized power in Egypt amidst a complete political chaos. As-Sali's establishment of a Mamluk corps in his army signified a pivotal shift in the dynamics of military and laid the groundwork for the Mamluks' complete takeover of the Ayyubid dynasty. The Khwarezmian incursions from 1230 onwards exacerbated the volatile situation in the Levant, and it culminated in the catastrophic siege of Jerusalem in 1244. 
the subsequent alliance between Asali Ayyub and the Khwarezmians against the Crusader and Ayyubid factions at the Battle of La Fobie in Gaza showed another hint of the declining Christian influence in the region. As Salih Ayyub's maneuvers against his uncontrollable Khwarezmian allies and subsequent consolidation of power, including the capture of Damascus in 1245, exemplify the shifting power dynamic. However, the onset of the Seventh Crusade, as Asali's death in November 1249 left the region on the cusp of a further upheaval, also set the stage for the Mamluk ascendancy. Following the Baron's Crusade, a temporary peace was established with the Ayyubids, but that truce seems now was quite short-lived. The Christian military orders united to confront the Egyptian and Quasmerian forces at the Battle of La Fourbie, which took place on October 17th to 18th, 1244. Led by Walter IV of Brienne, the Crusaders and the Damascene army emerged the adversaries in a significant confrontation. The battle itself marked a decisive encounter between the Muslims and Franks, and it resulted in the death of 5,000 Crusaders, along with the capture of 800 of them. Among the fallen were notable figures, such as Armand de Perigot, the Grand Master of the Templars, and Peter II of Sargines, the Archbishop of Tyre. Key leaders, including Guillaume de Chateauneuf, the Grand Master of the Hospitaliers, and Walter IV of Brienne were also taken prisoner. The remnants of Crusader forces, which at this point comprised a mere 33 Templars, 27 Hospitaliers, and 3 Teutonic Knights, fled to Ascalon, alongside Philip of Montfort and the Latin Patriarch Robert of Nantes. In the aftermath, Jean de René, acting on behalf of the Hospitallers, and Guillaume de Sonac, who succeeded Armand, supported the Seventh Crusade, arriving in the Holy Land post the defeats of 1244. Hughes de Rivelle, who served as the Lord of Crac de Chevaliers between 1243 and 1248, would later succeed de Chateauneuf as the Grand Master of the Hospitallers ten years later, in 1258. And now on to Louis IX of France, another main character of this time. Born on April 25th, 1214, to Louis VIII and Blanche of Castile, ascended to the throne at the tender age of 12 years old, following his father's death in November of 1226. Now, during his minority, before he had reached full age, his mother, Blanche, served as regent, diligently preparing him for leadership and instilling in him the Christian virtues of a great leader. Blanche adeptly navigated the challenges that were posed by various rebellious vassals, and secured a Capetian victory in the Albigensian Crusade of 1229, and yes, there will be a full video on the Albigensian Crusade. We can't leave the Cathars out, can't we? Now, Louis IX reign faced its first significant challenge with the Santong War of 1242-43 against Henry III of England and his allies, which aimed to reclaim Angevin territories. 
This conflict culminated in a decisive French victory at the Battle of Taylorburg in July of 1242, marking the last major clash between the two nations until the subsequent Anglo-French War. Now, the Sixth Crusade of earlier years, along with the Barons' Crusade, did expand the Kingdom of Jerusalem to its largest extent, well, at least since that catastrophic loss at Hattin in 1187. But the Siege of Jerusalem in 1244 pretty much reduced the city to ruins, and it diminished its strategic and religious significance for both Christians and Muslims, as neither one of them really want to live in a smouldering rock, a pile of ashes and rubble. Of course, the massacre accompanying the city's attack didn't help either. But what it did help was to propel Louis IX towards organizing its crusade as a response. This was, of course, despite the diminished European interest in reclaiming the now repeatedly contested Jerusalem. This was the Seventh Crusade. People were tired. People just wanted to live a happy life back in Europe, as happy it, as it could be in the 13th century. But it was also a financial thing. There was a good chance that if you would put all your resources into a crusade, then you were probably going to lose your money. They weren't very good investments. But Louis' resolve to embark on a crusade was solidified following a severe malaria infection in late 1244, during which, if he survived, he vowed to undertake the holy mission. He made a pact with God. If you save me from this, I will save the holy land. Well, spoiler alert, he recovered and upon recovery, as soon as he could get himself out of bed, he immediately began preparations for what would be characterized as a genuine holy war. The first of its kind, since Godfrey of Bullion, of course. Now his dedication was further evidenced by the acquisition of holy relics, including the crown of thorns and parts of the true cross for which he commissioned the construction of the Saint-Chapelle in Paris to house these sacred items. Of course, subsequently, the papal blessing for his crusade became official. Now on to Pope Innocent IV, who ascended to the papacy on June 25, 1243, who found himself entangled in both religious and political conflicts, as much as the line between them is very thinly drawn, notably with Emperor Frederick II, who was still under excommunication. Now, initially hopeful of Innocent IV's election, Frederick soon realized that the Pope's intentions to uphold his predecessor's confrontational stance were sticking around and this was not good for him. Well, fearing abduction, Innocent IV fled Rome for Lyon in March of 1244, seeking refuge from the imperial cavalry that were hot on his heels. From Lyon, he presided over the First Council of Lyon in 1245, directing a new crusade under Louis IX's leadership and formally renewing Frederick II's excommunication, while declaring him deposed from his thrones. Innocent IV's tenure also marked the first serious engagement with the Mongol threat to Europe, initiating diplomatic outreach to the Mongol Empire in an attempt 
to forge a Franco-Mongol alliance against common adversaries. Well, it's worth a try, isn't it? The momentum for the Seventh Crusade, driven by the religious zeal and personal conviction of Louis IX, saw its ambitions challenged by logistical and political obstacles from within Christendom itself. The rapid decline of Christian strongholds in the Holy Land prompted urgent appeals for aid, compelling Louis to spearhead the crusade in response to both divine calling and the dire state of the Levantine Christians. Despite his near-death experience, or perhaps because of it, Louis's resolve remained unshaken, underscoring his deep personal piety and commitment to a crusading ideal. The process of recruiting for the crusade was met with varied enthusiasm, reflecting a rather complex image of what things were like at the time. Of course, in earlier times it was much easier to get people on board, but crusades of living memory certainly made it a harder sell. The recruitment effort, officially sanctioned by the issuance of a papal bull, highlighted a dual challenges faced by Odo of Chateau in rallying support for the crusade amidst ongoing conflicts with the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and many other regional tensions. The recruitment narrative reveals a broader picture of the era's crusading ethos, where motivations range from spiritual redemption to political loyalty. So, Louis's recruitment drive within the French aristocracy slowly gained momentum, reflecting a rather cautious approach. This hesitation was eventually overcome by a combination of royal persuasion, a promise of indulgences, and the alignment of the crusade with Capetian interests. This broad geographical spread of recruits, from the Low Countries all the way to Languedoc, shows a wide-ranging appeal of the crusade that was slowly building up, albeit tempered by the realities of feudal obligations and the practical challenges of raising and supplying an army. The strategic considerations behind recruitment efforts, such as attempts to enlist Harkon IV of Norway, shows another ambitious scope of Louis's crusading vision, aiming for a unified Christian offensive against the Muslim-held territories. Now what about England? You've got to have them on the team, right? Well, unfortunately, Henry III of England chose not to join the crusade led by Louis IX, largely due to their recent war and the English defeat at Taylorburg. Despite being approached by Galleron, Bishop of Beirut, with urgent requests for support to save the kingdom from collapse, Henry remained quite unmoved. He did, however, make some concessions. He agreed to a truce with France, promising not to take advantage of Louis's absence by attacking French territories while there was no army there to protect them. A small contingent of English crusaders, rather independently, under the lead of William Longsby, did participate in the crusade. An English chronicler at the time, Matthew Paris, left us with this documentation about Louis IX's efforts to recruit from Norway in his Chronica Majora. But he didn't join the expedition himself. 
Now, the financing itself was a monumental task, costing over 1.5 million livres to Neu, which was around six times the king's annual revenue. So think of it as six times GDP, basically. The daily expenditure for troops alone was 1,000 livres de noir. Louis managed to fund the crusade through various means, beyond his regular income. In 1248, he expelled Jewish moneylenders from France and confiscated their properties. That's one way to raise money, I suppose. Additionally, towns across France collectively raised over 70,000 livres de noir, with a similar amount coming from the region of Normandy. Now, a significant portion of the Crusades' fund came from vow redemptions and taxes on the clergy. The Pope, however, was concerned about the leniency of redemption conditions and the low rates being accepted, which prompted him to order a full financial audit. The French clergy contributed a tenth of their income over five years, while a general tax of a twentieth was organized. Despite these efforts, the crusade saw limited financial support with contributions from English and even German churches being notably absent. Individual commanders, including Louis' brothers, also raised funds from their own domains, but it was still a very hard slog. Now, in October 1245, Louis finally called together his barons to secure their support for his crusading endeavour. A year later, he convened a gathering in Paris to ensure the nobility would swear fealty to his offspring, should he not return. Among those called was Jean de Joinville, Seneschal of Champagne, whose detailed account offers a unique personal perspective on the crusade. He hailed from a lineage that was quite familiar with crusading, his forefathers had participated in various crusades in the past, and his father and cousin were in the Fifth Crusade in Egypt. Initially resistant to pledging fealty to Louis IX, Joinville eventually set sail with twenty knights. However, financial constraints in Cyprus led him to join the king's service in exchange for financial support. Now, the Crusade's foundation rested on the ships that Louis had required, acquired, rather, with 16 from Genoa and 20 from Marseille, designated to meet at Aegis Motors. Now, this harbour, recently annexed to the royal domain, necessitated extensive enhancements to accommodate the fleet. Guglielmo Baconegra, the Genoese consul, played a pivotal role in these preparations personally. The force that embarked with Louis IX in late August 1248 mirrored the size of Richard I's contingent in 1191. Alternate travel arrangements were made by others, including Jean de Joinville and Raymond VII of Toulouse though Raymond, unfortunately, died before departure. Hugh I of Blois, another crusader, also didn't quite make it, several days before, in fact. Rest in peace. Well, once again, financial challenges plagued Alphonse of Portiers, who eventually did manage to set sail to the east, but with rather light pockets. Well, regardless, 
upon Louis's arrival in Cyprus. Extensive efforts had already been made to amass provisions, with supplies either purchased locally or transported from France. Now the situation that Louis had found himself in was very complex, marked by extensive preparations and extraordinary taxation, including levies on the clergy to fund the expedition, and generally, this does not make you very popular. Governance of France during his absence was entrusted to his mother, Blanche, who was in all fairness more than capable. The international scene presented its own challenges, including maintaining peace with Henry III of England and managing relations with the Venetians, who were understandably disgruntled due to the potential disruption to their trade with Egypt. Relations with Emperor Frederick were particularly delicate, especially given Louis's neutrality in the ongoing dispute between the papacy and the empire, and the potential conflict arising from Frederick's son, Conrad II of Jerusalem, being the titular king of Jerusalem. Now French envoys' updates to Frederick were, in turn, relayed to the Sultan Asali Ayyub, which just made the diplomacy of the Crusades' undertakings even more difficult. Well, regardless of all that, the date was set, and the Seventh Crusade officially commenced on August 12th, 1248, as King Louis IX departed from Paris, accompanied by significant figures, including Queen Margaret of Provence, her sister Beatrice of Provence, and two of Louis's brothers, being Charles I of Anjou and Robert I of Artois. Such French names, aren't they? Anyway. Their brother, Alphonse of Poitiers, along with his wife, Joan of Toulouse, would leave the following year. Now, the crusading force also included veterans like Hugh IV of Burgundy and Paul Mauclair, as well as other nobles such as Hugh XI of Lusignan and Olivier de Termes. English support was represented by that aforementioned William Longesby. Departures took place from both Aegis Mortis and Martel, with some English lords deterred by King Henry III from joining at the last minute. But participants actually arrived from as far away as Scotland, including Patrick II of Dunbar, and the Stuart of Dundonald. The journey of Louis to Aes Mortes was a blend of religious procession and royal departure, highlighted by the dedication of the Saint Chapelle, constructed to house the holy relics he acquired and the ones he planned to acquire on the way. Now, upon reaching Cyprus, on September 17th, 1248, Louis and his entourage began to face delays. But it wasn't just a normal wait around and play chess and maybe leave tomorrow. No, they all ended up getting all kinds of illnesses. Malaria, apparently, which is never good even on a nice day and this caused significant losses due to disease. Notables such as John Montfort and uh, Archibald the Ninth of Bourbon, beg your pardon, were among those who died. The assembled crusaders were joined by reinforcements from Arca, including figures like Jean de Ronay and the future Grand Master Guillaume de Sonac. Discussion among crusaders settled on Egypt as their primary target, recalling the past exchanges with the Ayyubids during the Fifth Crusade. 
However, Louis was advised against immediate action due to the approaching winter storms and the potential for Ayubid conflicts. Despite all this, he shrugged it off and uh, rejected negotiations with Muslims, instead going for a direct confrontation. The time for talk was over, before it even really began. Efforts were also made to engage with the Mongols, hoping for an alliance. But these were met with diplomatic but ultimately non-committal responses from the Mongol regent Ogul Kaimish. Challenges in securing sufficient supply ships and supplies also arose as the crusaders prepared to depart for Egypt. Louis' alliance with the Genoese and ongoing conflicts in the region complicated efforts even more, but arrangements were eventually made for the necessary transportation. During this period, Louis received various delegates and responded to requests for assistance, prioritizing the crusading effort over other pleas for help, of course. Can't get distracted. Now, Sultan As Sali Ayyub spent the winter months in Damascus, finalizing his control over Homs, and in anticipation of a Frankish invasion, he presumed would target Syria. Upon realizing that the true aim was Egypt, he lifted the siege and commanded his forces to march straight to si Cairo, rather. Stricken with tuberculosis and unable to lead directly, he appointed his experienced vizier, Ad-Din Ibn as sheikh as military commander. Preparations for defense included fortifying Damietta and deploying the Banu Kanana tribesmen, who were known for being able to kick heads in when needed. Now, on May 13th, 1249, Louis' fleet, comprising of 120 large ships, set sail towards Egypt. However, a storm later scattered the fleet, and only a fraction of the army accompanied Louis to his initial arrival off Damietta on June the 4th. He was advised to wait for reinforcements. Of course, that would make sense. But he completely ignored that advice, and he initiated the siege of Damietta at dawn on June the 5th, barely 24 hours after arriving. He really could not wait. Well, despite strong resistance, the Crusaders, under the leadership of both French knights and those from Outremer, that means overseas, the ones from the Crusader kingdoms, managed to push the Muslim defenders back. The Egyptian forces retreated over a boat bridge to Damietta, but in their hasty departure, failed to destroy the bridge behind them, which allowed the Crusaders to simply walk across it and capture the city. Certainly an oversight on the Egyptians' part. The seizure of Damietta came as a complete surprise, and it presented a strategic pause as the Crusaders waited for the Nile's receding floods before advancing further. Louis transformed Damietta into a provisional Frankish stronghold, rewarding allies and ensuring justice for the local Coptic population. Queen Margaret and other noble women were summoned from Arker, and preparations for a further campaign began amidst the summer's challenging conditions. Of course, the fall of Damietta alarmed and 
angered the Muslim world, prompting Asali Ayyub to offer Jerusalem in exchange for the city, an offer that Louis refused, unwilling to negotiate under such terms. I mean, the Crusaders were holding the cards, at least for now. The Egyptian military and leadership faced repercussions for the loss. Certain commanders got executed, and the other ones simply faced disgrace. Well, despite the initial unrest, and even talks of a coup, loyalty to the Ayyubid dynasty ultimately prevailed, and defensive preparations intensified around Mansurah, where Asali Ayyub personally supervised military arrangements despite his deteriorating health. That's right, he still had the tuberculosis. But then again, if Baldwin IV could have done so well back in the other crusades with leprosy, I'm sure that the Muslims can have their special guy who fights through on his sick day. Now, with the Nile's retreat in late October 1249, the arrival of reinforcements under Alphonse of Portiers, Louis decided it was time to advance towards Cairo. Despite an alternative strategy proposed to attack Alexandria, aimed at surprising the Egyptians and securing the Mediterranean coast, Louis, with opposition from Robert I of Artois and a few others, moved the army from Damietta towards Mansura on November 20, 1249. Damietta was left under garrison, with Queen Margaret and Patriarch Robert of Nantes among those who stayed behind. As the Frankish army embarked on their march, Sultan as Sali Ayyub succumbed to his illness on November 23rd, his death was kept a secret by his widow, Shajar al-Dur, and a few close associates to prevent political instability and panic in a time where you do not want people to panic. But she did act swiftly to secure her son Turan Shah's accession and maintain control over the government even with the Frankish army knocking at the door. Well, the Crusaders' rout to Mansura was fraught with challenges, including numerous canals and significant al bar az sagir canal, which Ad-Din used to his advantage by positioning his forces behind it and harassing the Crusaders with cavalry raids. Despite these obstacles, and a little bit of a skirmish near Fariskur on December the 7th, Louis's forces managed to reach Mansurah's outskirts by mid-December. In the weeks leading to the Second Battle of Mansurah, the opposing armies faced each other across the canal, with the Crusaders eventually securing a victory on February the 11th. 1250. And despite all the setbacks, including a failed bridge destruction under enemy bombardment, the Crusaders found a ford with the help of an Egyptian Copt. Robert I of Artois, leading the vanguard, defied orders to wait and attacked the Egyptian camp, resulting in heavy Egyptian casualties and the death of Ad-Din so I suppose it paid off. However, the subsequent charge into Mansurah led by Robert turned disastrous when Rukun ad-Din Baybar's strategic ambush decimated the Frankish forces, leading to significant losses, including Robert I of Artois and William Longsby. The survivors managed to regroup, and 
inform King Louis of the grim situation. Louis quickly compared for a counter-attack. Successfully repelling the Mamluks and securing a temporary victory, though at great cost to his army's strength and morale. He even lost his brother. This victory, however, did not translate into long-term success for the Crusaders. The situation that King Louis found himself in after the Battle of Mansurah was an eerily mirroring of the predicament faced by the Crusaders during the Fifth Crusade, when the capture of Damietta led not to victory, but a devastating retreat. The repeated attacks by the Egyptians on February 11, 1250 demonstrated their resolve, with the Crusaders barely holding their ground. The fall of the Templar master Goulême de Sonarc, and the acting hospitaller master, Jeanne de Ronay, even more highlighted the dire straits of the crusader leadership. The surrounding of Alphonse of Portiers, though he was ultimately rescued, was another foreshadowing of the desperate situation that was about to unfold. For two months... Louis lingered at the crusader encampment, pinning all of his hopes on the political turmoil in Cairo to give him some kind of strategic advantage, some way in. However, the arrival of Turan Shah in the late February signaled the beginning of a relentless and brutal Egyptian counteroffensive. The Egyptian strategy of intercepting supply boats on the Nile proved devastatingly effective, exacerbating the already dire conditions of famine and disease that were ravaging the Crusader ranks. The critical moment came with the Battle of Fariskur on April 6th of 1250. Despite the dire need for a retreat to Damietta, Louis' attempts at negotiation, including offering Damietta in exchange for Jerusalem, were flatly rejected by the Egyptians. Which was pretty sad, because if they had have taken the original offer from the Egyptians, they would have already been relaxing and living it up back in Jerusalem. Well, you know what they say about hindsight. The ill-fated decision to march the Crusader army back to Damietta turned very disastrous when the Egyptians caught up with them. Because when they did, they launched a full-scale assault. The surrounding of the Crusader forces near Fariskur the subsequent death of key figures like Hugh of Lusignan, and even the capture of King Louis and his entourage, well, that spelled defeat, all in capital letters. The total capture of the Crusader forces, along with the ships tasked with evacuating the sick, well, that was just the icing on the cake. It was a complete Egyptian victory. No one could argue this. A beat down not seen for generations. The profound loss not only marked the decisive defeat of Louis's army, but it also underscored that vulnerability of the Crusader states and a shift in the dynamic of power in the region. They wanted to capture Jerusalem, but it instead ended in the loss of their own leading monarch and the decimation of his army. 
setting the stage for a period of negotiation, ransom, and, yes, the eventual release of Louis. Albeit, without achieving the Crusade's initial spiritual and territorial ambitions. The Egyptians were, notably, overwhelmed by the sheer number of captives. Estimated by the Sultan itself to be around 30,000 crusaders, which is probably an overstatement, but still a significant portion of Louis's force. While well, with no means to guard all the captives, or feed all of the captives, the Egyptians decided to just execute the infirm, and Daily, several hundred of them would be taken out and decapitated, basically until the decapitator's arms got tired. Then they'd have a little rest and get back to it the next morning. Louis was moved to a private residence in Mansurah, and the captured crusader leaders were held together in a very large and unpleasant prison. Though their lives were threatened, their potential for ransom spared them. Jeanne de Joinville, claiming kingship with the king, did manage to save his life. His actual relation to Emperor Frederick II, held in high regard by the Egyptians, further ensured his safety. Well, the demands that were placed upon Louis by the Sultan were of course very severe, including the surrender of Damietta and a hefty ransom for his army. The negotiations eventually led to the agreement that Damietta would indeed be surrendered, and the ransom was set at 800,000 Byzants. The deal's success was significantly due to Queen Margaret of Provence's actions, who, during her late pregnancy, managed to prevent the abandonment of Damietta by promising to buy and distribute all the food in the city, of course at an enormous cost. However, politics once again shifted dramatically with Sultan Turan Shah's assassination in 1250 May the 2nd, in a coup led by his stepmother, Shajar al-Dur, and the Mamluk leader, Baibars. Despite all the turmoil, the terms agreed upon with Louis were upheld by the Egyptians, albeit under tense conditions, including a demand for Louis to renounce Christ and convert to Islam, which, credit to Louis, he refused. On May the 6th, Damietta was handed over to the Muslims, and by May the 12th, after securing the remaining ransom funds, Louis and his nobles sailed for Arca leaving behind the wounded soldiers in Damietta, who were then massacred by the Muslims, even though the Muslims said they wouldn't do that. But they did it anyway. Well, the Seventh Crusade's failure resonated deeply in the West, leading to public mourning and unrest in France and Venice, I mean, everybody had wasted their time and money again. And of course, the Pope and all of the leaders who were saying, don't worry, this time it's going to be different. Crusade number seven will be great and will be taking back the Holy Land, will be bringing back the treasure and God is all going to let us into heaven. Well, we all heard what the Templar Knight at the start of this video had to say about all of it. Unfortunately, the stars did not align for the Crusaders. Definitely chalk this one up as a win 
for the Muslims. With the immediate aftermath of the crusade saw the effective end of the Ayyubid dynasty and the rise of the Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt. So I guess that's maybe something. And back in Europe, Henry III of England's promise of a crusade never really materialized. And public opinion in France was marked by disillusionment and anger towards the papacy's priorities. And honestly, you can't blame them for being more than a little upset. Well, that's it for the Seventh Crusade. But don't worry, despite all of this, there's more Crusades, which I don't know what to tell you. They just keep on coming. That being said, we are having fun going through all these, aren't we? At least I am. I don't know about you, but I certainly am. Well, I'd like to thank my Mega Chat tier patrons. That's JC, Jeffrey, and Stark Factory. Thank you very much, guys, for your continued support. If you would like to support the channel, you need only follow the links in the description to the Patreon. Otherwise, just subscribe and leave your comments down below. You know what it's like. But until next time, keep on fighting for the Holy Land, I suppose. Whichever side you're on. Good night, everyone. Look after each other. The Eighth Crusade Initiated in 1270 by King Louis IX of France It was an ill-fated expedition Aimed to strengthen the Christian foothold in the Holy Land By attacking the Muslim-controlled city of Tunis The campaign was cut short By an outbreak of disease which led to Louis's death and a swift conclusion to the crusade without any significant military engagement. Another disaster in a long line of ever-complicated wars. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you and if you're coming back, it's great to have you with me again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, Links to the Patreon are in the description and comments. And of course, a like, comment and sub goes a very long way. Thank you in advance for liking the video. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the topic. As always, this is number 8 in my series on the Crusades. If you're interested in the other ones, they're all there on the Medieval History Playlist. So let's get on with it. On the 24th of April, 1254, the Seventh Crusade came to an official close when Louis IX of France departed from the Holy Land, leaving behind Godfrey of Sergenes to represent him as the Seneschal to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This was a time when John of Ibelin took on the role of Bailey of the kingdom, following his cousin John of Arsuf, who then returned to Cyprus to counsel the place on Antioch. She was acting as regent for Hugh II of Cyprus, who held claims over both kingdoms of Cyprus and Jerusalem. The passing of Conrad II in Jerusalem in May 1254 led to his toddler son Conradin becoming the nominal monarch of Jerusalem. Before his return to France, Louis had managed to negotiate a truce with Damascus that would last until October 1256 
a move that was driven by mutual desire to avoid conflict due to the looming threat of the Mongols, and that was a threat for both sides. Similarly, Aibak, the Sultan of Egypt, sought peace and agreed to a ten-year truce with the Franks in 1255, though he made one exception for Jaffa, aiming to secure it as a port. Despite these efforts, the region's stability was as precarious as ever. An example of this was in January of 1256, when a Frankish raid led to a retaliatory expedition by the Mamluk governor of Jerusalem, who was ultimately defeated and killed. This prompted Ibak to negotiate a new treaty with Damascus, extending the truce to include Palestine and Jaffa. The year 1255 saw the death of Robert of Nantes, the Latin patriarch who had been captured with Louis IX during the Seventh Crusade. His successor, appointed by Pope Alexander IV, was James Pantaleon, a bishop very well versed in the affairs of the Prussian Crusades. Taking the name Urban IV, he didn't reach Acre until the summer of 1260, leaving that kingdom without a senior patriarch, amid threats from both Muslims and Mongols, as well as a good amount of internal threats, as there always were. The period also witnessed the War of St. Sabas, fueled by the commercial rivalries among Italian merchant cities, Pisa, Venice, and Genoa, each vying for control over the critical Mediterranean trade. These conflicts, while detrimental to Christian states, did not deter Muslim emirs from engaging in trade with the Italians often leading to treaties that ensured their continued profit. A notable incident occurred in 1250, when a Genoese merchant was killed by a Venetian, igniting tensions within Acre. The rivalries further escalated after Louis' departure, culminating in 1256 with the Genoese and Pisan merchants attacking the Venetian quarter over the monastery of St. Sebas in Arca. Despite various efforts to quell the violence, including the Venetians' temporary control over the monastery and the Genoese blockade, the conflict persisted. Influenced by external support from notable figures and military orders, of course it's trade and commerce, and everybody has their stake in the game. Two years later, in the February of 1258, the landscape of the Levantine politics took a significant turn when Plaisance of Cyprus, alongside her young son Hugh II, journeyed to Tripoli to rendezvous with her brother Bohemond VI of Antioch. Upon their arrival in Acre, a significant meeting of the Hautkur of Jerusalem was summoned. Bohemond promised that the assembly acknowledge Hugh II as the rightful successor to Conradin, who had been absent from the kingdom for a notably long while. He suggested that Hugh's claim be recognized, with Plaisance serving as the regent. This move was hoped to quell the ongoing civil strife. The Ibelins, along with the Templars and the Teutonic Knights, supported Hugh and Plaisance's claims. However, the Hospitallers contended that no decision could be made without Conradin's presence, thus dragging the royal family deeper and deeper into the civil conflict. The Venetians sided with Plaisance and her son, 
whereas Genoa, the Hospitallers, and Philip of Montfort backed Conradin. Despite their historical opposition to Frederick II. Well, eventually, a majority ruled in favour of recognising Plaisance as regent, leading to John of Arsuf stepping down as Bailey, only to be promptly reinstated. Following these events, Plaisance and Bohemond returned to Cyprus, leaving directives to combat the rebellion decisively. The impending arrival of the new Latin patriarch, James Pantaleon, was overshadowed by the escalating tensions in the Holy Land. Pantaleon, notable for his diplomacy in Prussian crusades, endorsed Plaisance, urging Pope Alexander IV for direct intervention. The Pope's response was to call for a truce among the belligerent Italian republics, ordering their envoys to embark on a diplomatic mission to Syria. This was amid ongoing conflicts, notably the Genoese fleet arriving off Tyre and joining forces for the pivotal assault. The consequential Battle of Acre on the 24th of June 1258 saw the Genoese retreat and the Genoese quarter within Acre fall, leading to their withdrawal back to Tyre. The Pope's initiative to dispatch a legatee, Thomas Agne, to mediate the conflict marked a turning point in 1259. I mean, if it's the Genoese fighting, along with the Venetians, those sorts of powers, people begin to lose money. So of course it's of utmost importance for the Pope to step in. Well, following the death of John of Arasov, Plaisance appointed Geoffrey of Sargins as Bailey, who, alongside Agni, managed to broker a temporary armistice. By January 1261, a conciliatory agreement among the Hot Gur and the Italian delegates was achieved, establishing the respective headquarters for the Genoese at Tyre and the Venetians and Pisans at Acre. This peace, however, was very fragile and conflicts re-erupted, undermining the regional trade and leading to naval skirmishes that persisted until 1270. Godfrey of Sargene's tenure as Bailey saw attempts at restoring order, though his authority did not extend all the way to Tripoli, where the conflict between Henry of Jebel and Beaumont IV continued to escalate. The violent feud culminated in the murder of Bertrand Embriaco, with the blame squarely falling on Beaumont. The incident intensified the hostility between Antioch and the Embriaco family. Now, the complicated politics of the region were further destabilized by the Byzantine recapture of Constantinople. The Latin Empire, significantly bolstered by Italian trade, found itself under the threat from Genoa's support for Michael VIII Pelagos. Michael's triumph at the Battle of Pelagonia and subsequent treaty with the Genoese facilitated the re-establishment of Byzantine control over Constantinople in 1261, and this, of course, effectively dissolved the Latin Empire. All of those treaties that were made, agreements that were struck, promises that were waiting to be kept, well, they were all gone now. Time to renegotiate. Now the death of Plaisance in the September of 1261 once more left the regency of Cyprus and Jerusalem 
in contention. Despite Hugh of Brienne's claim as the next heir, the High Court of Cyprus favored Hugh III, Plaisance's nephew, as regent. The acceptance of Hugh III as de facto regent marked a temporary resolution to the succession dispute. Although it was marred by reluctance from the hot core to pledge full allegiance without Conradin's presence. The subsequent death of Isabella in Cyprus in 1264 reopened the debate over the Jerusalem Regency. Ultimately, the jurists of Outremer favored kinship over primogeniture, leading to Hugh III's ununanimous recognition by the nobility and military orders. The administration of Arco was once again entrusted to Geoffrey of Sargonese, reflecting a period of arguably relative stability amidst the comparatively chaotic turmoil of normal times. Now, things got a little bit more complicated with the emergence of everybody's new best friends in the mid-thirteenth century. You guessed it, the Mongols, who began their invasions in the 1240s, establishing the Ilkhanate in the southwestern reaches of their expansive empire. The Mongols quickly became a formidable force, initially overcoming the Ayyubids and constantly shifting their allegiances between the Mamluks and the Christian states of the West. An unreliable ally, but an even worse enemy. Louis IX of France, during his crusade in 1248, found himself in indirect contact with the Mongols, through envoys from El Gigide, suggesting a joint military strategy against the Muslim powers of Egypt and Syria. Louis' outreach to Mongol courts, including missions to the great Khan Guyuk Khan and later his successor Monke, highlighted the complexities of these international relations. Though these efforts ultimately did not culminate in a direct alliance or military cooperation. The Mongol campaign against the Assassins in 1257, led by Hulagu, was another demonstration of their military prowess and also strategic ruthlessness. The surrender and subsequent execution of the Assassin's leader, Ruk ad Din, marked the near obliteration of this once universally feared sect. Well, in Syria, the Mongol forces, again under Hulugu's command, proceeded to dismantle the Ayyubid dynasty with the capture of Baghdad in 1258, and then continued their conquests into Syrian territories, including the significant captures of Aleppo and Damascus. These actions drastically altered the politics of the region, Notably, the Mongols' approach to their Christian allies, such as Hethum I of Armenia and Beaumont VI of Antioch, was another nuanced strategy, aimed at leveraging religious and political alliances, which of course included negotiations with the recently reconquered Byzantium. The fallout from these conquests affected the relationships between the various Christian and Muslim states, with significant events such as the excommunication and later absolution of Bohemond VI, illustrating a tangled web of ecclesiastical and political maneuverings. The Mongols, while not seeking direct conflict with the Frankish states, nevertheless found themselves 
well and truly engaged in hostilities, such as the sacking of Si Don in response to the killing of a Mongol commander. The culmination of all of these events led to the pivotal battle of Ain Jalut in 1260, where the Mamluks of Egypt decisively halted the Mongol advance. The subsequent assassination of the Egyptian Sultan Qutuz by Baibars, who ascended to power shortly after, marked another significant turning point, as Baibars' less conciliatory stance towards alliances with the Franks signaled a shift in the region's diplomacy. The Mongol dominion over the Levant faced a pivotal moment with the death of Hulagu in the February of 1265, which weakened their grip on the region, yes, but momentarily. His widow, Dokus Katun, adeptly secured the succession for her stepson, Abaka, who was a Buddhist and then the governor of Turkestan. Hulagu's pre-death negotiations with the Byzantine emperor Michael VIII Pelagiliokos for a marital alliance were quickly adapted to the new circumstances, resulting in the marriage of the emperor's daughter, Maria Pelagina, to Abaka. This transition marked the beginning of a challenging period for Abaka, whose reign was immediately threatened by the Golden Horde in alliance with the Mamluks. In the broader context of the Christian and Islamic worlds, the death of Pope Urban IV was followed by the election of Clement IV in 1265. Abaka sought to reinforce Mongol ties with Western Christendom to counter the Mamluk threat, initiating diplomatic exchanges with Clement IV and dispatching ambassadors to Europe in hopes of forming a comprehensive alliance against the Mamluks. These diplomatic efforts were part of a more broader strategy that included outreach to the kings of France and Navarre, as revealed in 1267 letter from Pope Clement to Abarco, which highlighted the Mongols' willingness to assist the Latins in the Holy Land. Now this period also saw attempts by James I of Aragon to engage with Abarco, culminating in a failed expedition to Arco in 1269. The communication between Abarco and European rulers, including Edward I of England, showcased another complex web of alliances and counter-alliances that characterized the Crusading era. The succession of Gregory X after the longest papal election in history, represented a continuity of the Vatican's engagement with the Mongols, further exemplified by the Mongols' delegation participation in the Second Council of Lyon in 1274. Baibars, well and truly ascended to the power as the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, following his key role in the Seventh Crusade, and defeating the Mongols at the Battle of Ain Jalut, which I'm sure was universally appreciated. Well, all of this marked another shift in the region's power dynamic. His aggressive stance against the Mongols and the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, alongside his refusal to continue accommodating policies of his predecessors, set the stage for a new phase of Islamic consolidation and resistance against both the Mongols and what remained of the Crusader states. The post-Mongol invasion era 
saw the Muslim world grappling with the absence of a unifying caliphate authority after the sack of Baghdad. The attempts to re-establish a caliph in Cairo, with al mustan Sir II's brief, and ill-fated tenure followed by al-Hakim, signaled the beginning of a new era of Muslim leadership that was centered in Egypt, far, far away from any Mongols who wanted to cause trouble. Baibar's military campaigns against the Crusader states in Syria were relentless and marked by a series of strategic sieges and assaults. In 1263, his initial siege on Acre, though unsuccessful, led him to target other cities. Nazareth fell with Baibars ordering the destruction of Christian structures and banning of Latin clergy. His conquest continued with the capture of Arsuf, where, despite promising safe passage to the surrendering hospitaliers, he enslaved them and demolished their fortress. Well, that's not very nice, isn't it? The cities of Haifa and Caesarea soon met similar fates under his forces. The focus of Baibar's aggression extended to Sicilian Armenia in 1266, exploiting its allegiance to the Mongols. The disaster of Mari saw the defeat of Armenian forces, followed by the devastation of its principal cities, Tarsus, Mamistra, and Adana. This situation forced Hetoam I to cede control of key fortresses to the Mamluks and negotiate for his son's safe return, setting a precedence for Silesia's dual allegiance to the Mongols and tribute payments to the Mamluks. Safed a stronghold that was held by the formidable Knights Templar, became a significant target for Baibars in 1266. Its location was rather special, as it provided crucial intelligence on Muslim movements. Despite offering the Templars safe conduct, Baibars, take a guess, massacred them upon surrender choosing to occupy and reinforce the fortress instead of destroying it. Once again, Baibar's ruthless, really bad guy. But maybe I'm a little biased. Well, the fall of Antioch in 1268 represented one of the most brutal episodes in the crusading era especially with its population, with Baibar breaking his promise of mercy to the city's defenders and inhabitants. The massacre and enslavement that followed eradicated a substantial portion of the Christian population and marked the end of the Principality of Antioch, highlighting the devastating impact of Baibar's campaigns on the Crusader states. You see why we needed an Eight Crusade now? Indeed, the background is quite important. Despite his victories, Baibars was cautious of potential threats from the Mongols and the possibility of a new crusade led by Louis IX. His diplomatic outreach to Hugh III of Cyprus and the negotiation of a truce with the remaining Crusader states indicated a strategic shift to consolidate his gains, but also prepare for future challenges. Well, rewinding back a little bit, in the aftermath of Louis's departure from the Holy Land, the Mamluk's military ascendancy escalated, capturing numerous Frankish strongholds and repeatedly assailing Arca. 
The looming specter of losing the entire kingdom spurred discussions of launching a new crusade. The conclusion of the Second Baron's War with Edward I's victory over Simon de Montfort, coupled with Charles of Anjou's triumph in the Battle of Benevento, liberated more than enough French martial resources. Pope Clement IV, seizing the moment in January of 1266, announced plans for a new expedition to the Holy Land, a venture initially conceived under Urban IV's papacy in 1263, some three years prior. This initiative sought to rally support against the Sultan of Babylon, or the Pharaoh of Egypt, and the Saracens, aiming to alleviate the plight of Christians in the region and bolster the Holy Land. By September 1266, the determination of Louis to lead another crusade crystallized, despite the pressing demands within France. By 1267, despite health and weariness, Louis was poised to embark on the new crusade, symbolized by a ceremonial taking of the cross at Saint-Chapelle on the 25th of March of that same year, 1267. A subsequent ceremony was held at Notre Dame, with Theobald II of Navarre among those committing to the cause, and despite a comparatively lukewarm response compared to his first crusade, then the scepticism of chroniclers like Jean de Joinville, preparations continued to progress along pretty nicely. The 1267 Crusade, emanating from the Upper Rhine, underscored a broader pattern of papally endorsed crusade preaching and mobilization. Clement's directive to German bishops, Dominicans and Franciscans to preach the cross met with mixed responses. Only finding notable success in regions that were adjacent to France. The departure of several hundred crusaders from Basel during Lent in 1267, though modest in its scope, represented the fervent hope and commitment of those willing to journey to the Holy Land in anticipation of larger expeditions, led by monarchs like Louis and Edward I of England. Now in the early stages of 1267, the Mongol Ilkhanate's leader, Abaka, initiated diplomatic outreach to James I of Aragon, proposing an alliance against the Mamluk Sultanate, a formidable force in the Levant. James I, responsive to this call, dispatched Jaime Alaric de Perpignan as his envoy, who later returned accompanied by a Mongol delegation. Despite reservations from Pope Clement and Alfonso X of Castile about James's involvement in the Holy Land, partly and due to questions about his moral character, the death of Clement IV in November and the delayed election of his successor, Gregory X, left James with a much freer hand. Additionally, Alfonso's influence over Aragonese decisions was fairly minimal. Fresh from his conquest of Mercia, James began fundraising for his own crusade. On the 1st of September, 1269, James set sail from Barcelona with a significant fleet, unfortunately to be scattered by a storm. While the king and the majority of his fleet did turn back, a smaller contingent, led by his illegitimate sons Pedro Fernandez and Fernand Sanchez, pressed on to Arca, arriving as Baibars ended a truce and menaced the city with a large force. 
Now the Aragonese contingent was eager to engage Baibar's forces. However, the Council of the Templars and Hospitallers advised them against action, at least for now. Now, everything in Arco was very precarious on all fronts. Geoffrey of Sargonet's death in April of 1269 left the city's defense in the hands of his successor, Robert of Gresk. A French regiment under Olivier de Termes was deployed on a raid at the time of the Aragonese festival, arrival, rather, only to encounter Baibar's forces upon their return. Despite Olivier's preference for a stealthy withdrawal, Robert of Cresc's insistence on confrontation led them into a carefully laid ambush by Baibars, resulting in significant losses for the Crusaders. Certainly not off to a good start. The Aragonese, meanwhile, advised against a sortie to rescue the beleaguered regiment, prioritizing rather the defense of Arco over a risky engagement with Baibar's troops. This cautious stance, however, meant that the Aragonese expedition concluded without any significant contribution to the Christian defense. Now, the defeat of Manfred of Sicily at Benevento in 1266 by Charles I of Anjou marked another shift in the power dynamics of Italy. Manfred's refusal to retreat from the battlefield led to his death, a moment that could have spelled harsh reprisals for his supporters. However, Charles opted for a more lenient approach, a decision that was met with scepticism by those who doubted the sustainability of such conciliatory measures. Despite Charles' victory and initial attempts at leniency, his administration faced criticism from Pope Clement, who found Charles' methods and demeanor to be overly arrogant and frankly quite obstinate. Now, politics and the complexities thereof were further compounded when Charles was invited to expel the Ghibellines from Florence, a move that aroused the Pope's concern over Charles' territorial ambitions in Tuscany. Clement's unease led him to extract a promise from Charles to relinquish any claims on Tuscany within three years. Meanwhile, Charles' ambitions extended beyond mere Italy. He pledged to support Baldwin II of Courtenay in an endeavor to reclaim Constantinople from the Byzantine Emperor Michael VIII, with the agreement that he would receive a portion of the conquered territory. Charles' military campaigns continued with the siege of Pogibonsi in Tuscany, which resisted capture until late November 1267. Meanwhile, the political fallout from Manfred's defeat saw his supporters seeking refuge and rallying support in Bavaria for Conradin, Manfred's heir, to claim his rights over Sicily. This led to an invasion attempt by Frederick of Castile, supported by Muhammad I al-Mustansir, the Hafsid Caliph of Iftikia modern-day Tunisia, launching a campaign from North Africa into Sicily. The subsequent Battle of Tagliacozzo in the August of 1268 initially suggested a victory for Conradin, yet the battle ultimately ended in his defeat and capture. The execution of Conradin and Frederick of Baden in October 1268 marked the end of their challenge to Charles' rule. Frederick of Castile, however, managed to escape the aftermath of this defeat, 
finding refuge in Tunis. This escape set the sage for his involvement against Louis's crusaders in the 1270 Tunis campaign. Linking the conflicts of the Mediterranean in a web of alliances and hostilities that spanned from Italy to North Africa. Now, Louis's enduring commitment to a liberation of Jerusalem was ultimately challenged into a new strategic direction, a crusade against Tunis. This shift, influenced by his confessor Geoffrey of Beaulieu's assertion of Muhammad al-Mustansir's potential conversion to Christianity, and possibly persuaded by Charles of Angelo's geopolitical interest, marking a significant pivot in Louis's crusading endeavors. The rationale for targeting Tunis blended both spiritual ambition with political calculus, with the aided dimension of Charles' desire to assert control of a tribute payments from the region, a legacy of Sicilian monarch's dominion. Thus, the 1270 crusade, equipped with Genoese and Marcelloise fleets, was a departure from Louis's original plan of directly aiding Outremer via Cyprus. The shift to Tunis as a primary target represented a complex amalgamation of Louis's religious motiva motivations, rather, but also Charles' political objectives. The logistical challenge of financing the crusade underscored another lukewarm support from the expedition received, and it forced Louis to shoulder a significant portion of the financial burden himself. The involvement of the church, through Clement's allocation of a tenth of the church's income in Navarre to Theobald II, highlighted more ecclesiastical support for Louis's cause. I mean, at least you've got the church behind you, right? Well, send out the preachers, they did, and the efforts in Navarre, led by the Franciscans and the Dominicans, were another crucial aspect in rallying support for the crusade. On July the 2nd, 1270, under the leadership of Florent de Veronese, France's first admiral, appointed in 1269, Louis and his expeditionary force set sail from Aigues Mortes. This marked the beginning of what would be Louis's final crusade, a venture characterized by the king's personal sacrifice and dedication to the religious cause. The crusade was, of course, a family affair, with Louis's brother Alphonse of Portiers, his wife Joan of Toulouse, and his sons, including Philip III, among the notable participants. The presence of his nephew Richard II of Artois, and leading nobles like Robert III of Flanders and John I of Brittany, further underscored the expedition's significance to the French nobility, many of whom were actually descendants of veterans from previous crusades. Despite the meticulous organization of the fleet, the departure was delayed by at least a month, posing challenges related to the Tunisian heat and potential maritime hazards. The army, though smaller than that of the Seventh Crusade, was significantly large, with Louis's own household contributing 347 knights to an estimated force of around 10,000. The Second Fleet, commanded by Louis's son-in-law, Theobald II, set sail from Marcel. But... The journey to Tunis was not straightforward, involving a strategic stop in Sardinia, where tensions with the local population 
due to the Genoese origin of their vessels, underscored more of the complexities of Mediterranean politics. This unification of the French and Navarine fleets at Cagliari, and the subsequent revelation of Tunis at the Crusades' initial target, surprised the troops, who had actually more so anticipated a direct engagement in Jerusalem. Nonetheless, the profound respect for Louis among his followers somewhat mitigated their concerns, maintaining cohesion and morale as they prepared for the unexpected campaign ahead. Upon arriving at Carthage on July 18, 1270, Louis's crusading force encountered an unexpectedly vacant harbour, leading to divided opinions within the royal council regarding their next move. Ultimately, their decision was made to disembark and take control of the strategic point at La Goulette. This initial success, however, was tempered by the harsh realities of the Tunisian climate and the logistical challenges of maintaining an army abroad including the critical issue of sanitation and fresh food supply. As the Crusaders settled and awaited reinforcements by Charles of Anjou, their situation grew increasingly dire due to outbreak of disease, likely dysentery, which ravaged the ranks. The king himself was not spared and after receiving his last rites, King Louis succumbed to the illness on August 25th. His death marked a significant turning point in this crusade, pretty much destroying the morale, and casting a pall of uncertainty over the entire expedition. Well, Shortly after Louis's death, Charles' fleet arrived. While potentially being a source of reinforcement, but it instead marked the beginning of the end for the Crusades' objectives in Tunis. The mutual affliction of both the Crusaders and Almustansir's forces with the disease paved the way for peace negotiations, and led to a somewhat anti climactic conclusion to the campaign. The toll of the Tunisian campaign was heavy, with notable figures such as John II of Sosons and Alfonso of Brienne among the casualties. The survival of others, including Jean Depp and John I of Brittany, highlighted the arbitrary cruelty of the disease in determining the fate of those involved in the crusade. The Treaty of Tunis, signed on November 1st, 1270, marked the conclusion of the Eighth Crusade, bringing a period of truce between the Latin Christians and Tunis under Muhammad I al-Mustansir. This agreement afforded the Christians notable commercial privileges, including free trade and the establishment of religious missions within Tunis, effectively opening new avenues for interaction and influence. The treaty notably benefited Charles I of Anjou by securing a significant war indemnity and in addressing the issue of the Hohenstaufen refugees within the Sultanate. Now Philip III of France, ascending to the throne amidst the adversity of the Tunis campaign, faced the immediate challenge of leadership during a time of loss and disease. The deaths of his brother, John Tristan, followed by his father, Louis, and the subsequent fatalities within his family, took a deep personal toll on the royal family. The practice of Mos Teutonicus applied to Louis IX's remains for preservation during transport back to France, 
reflects the length in which the Crusaders went to honour their dead, even in the face of logistical challenges. Most soldiers were simply buried on the field, if they were buried at all. Upon his return to Paris in May 1271, Philip III's reign began under somber circumstance. With his coronation in Reims in August 1271, signifying both the continuation of the Capetian dynasty and a moment of solemn reflection on the Crusades' impact. Edward's arrival in Tunis with the English fleet on the eve of the Crusaders' departure underscored another challenge of co coordination and communication in the timing that plagued the Crusades. Despite this setback, Edward's commitment to the crusading cause led him and the remnants of Louis's force to Sicily, only to face another adversary when a storm devastated their fleet off Trapani. Undeterred, Edward pressed on to Arca in April of 1271, marking the continuation of what would be recognized as the last major crusade to the Holy Land. The election of Gregory X as Pope in September of 1271 during his engagement in Arca with Edward's expedition highlighted the deep intertwinement of religious leadership with the crusading effort, or at least what was left of it. His immediate appeal for aid upon learning of his election and his poignant sermon in Arca reflected a profound commitment to Jerusalem, echoing the enduring spiritual and political aspirations of the crusaders who simply didn't want to let go. The Second Council of Lyon, in March of 1272, represented a significant ecclesiastical effort to organize a comprehensive crusade funded by a church-wide tithe. Despite the enthusiasm of figures like James I of Aragon, internal opposition from entities such as the Knights Templar showcased more complexities and divisions. The involvement of the Mongol delegation at the council, which is surprising, and the subsequent plans for a joint crusade with the Mongols to commence in 1278 just shows another broad scope of the alliances. However, Gregory's death in 1276 completely destroyed these plans, which was a shame, because they were considered quite viable for reclaiming the Holy Land. Well, all of the resources amassed for the crusade were redirected. And, well, the idea continued to be even more unpopular. However, Philip's undertaking of the Aragonese crusade in 1284, and his subsequent death in dysentery again, further underscored the personal risks and political gambits inherent within the crusading movement, and the eventual loss of the Holy Land following the siege of Arca in 1291 under Philip IV of France, marked the end of an era, closing a chapter on the Crusades, that had been characterized by lofty aspirations, complex international alliances, and that profound cooperation between power, faith, and harsh reality. Well, thank you very much for listening. We certainly have talked about the Crusades a lot this week, haven't we? And there's still a few more little Crusades to do, like the People's Crusade, the Children's Crusade, the Albigensian Crusade, we'll get to them. Allow me to thank my Patreon members on the top tier, being Jeffrey, JC, and Stark Factory. If you would like to become a member of the Patreon, you know what to do. 
Otherwise, I wish you all the best. Look after yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone. In the year of 1095, Emperor Alexios Komnenos appealed for support from Pope Urban II at the Council of Piacenza. The Byzantine Empire, facing threats from the Seljuk Turks and compensating for territorial losses, pleaded Western Europe for aid. Urban's response far exceeded anyone's expectations. At the Council of Clermont, Pope Urban called for the First Crusade, advocating a doctrine of Christian holy war, bellum sacrum, based on Old Testament precedents. This call ignited unprecedented enthusiasm in Catholic Europe, leading tens of thousands to take up the cross and march far away from home joining the crusade. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. If you'd like to support the channel, why not head over to the Patreon? Otherwise, you can like, comment, and subscribe, but only if you feel like doing so. Now, with that out of the way, let's get on to our video for today. The Crusader States, from their establishment to their fall. Let's get started, shall we? Make yourself comfortable, please. Emperor Alexios cautiously welcomed the Western nobles leading the crusade, using diplomacy to extract oaths of fealty from most of them. Notably, Godfrey of Bolion, Bohemond of Taranto, Tancred of Horteville, and Baldwin of Boulogne swore fealty to Alexios, promising to return any Byzantine territories they reconquered. Only Raymond the Fourth, the Count of Toulouse, refused to swear allegiance, opting instead for a Pact of non-aggression. Now during the march to besiege Antioch, Byzantine guides like Tatikios accompanied the Crusaders, forming alliances with local Armenians along the way. Baldwin, however, broke off from the main army and ventured to the Euphrates seizing fortifications, and gaining favor with local rulers. Thoros, the ruler of Edessa, sought Baldwin's assistance and eventually adopted him as a son, allowing Baldwin to assume control after Thoros's death in 1098. Baldwin's county of Edessa was characterized by its fragmented territory and dependence on alliances with neighboring warlords. As the crusaders advanced towards Antioch, Sultan Barkyarak of the Seljuk Turks was preoccupied with the power struggle against his brother Muhammad Tapar. Sensing an opportunity, Bohemond of Taranto persuaded the other leaders that Antioch should belong to him, if he could capture it. Especially since Emperor Alexios Komnenos did not assert his claim to the city. When Alexios withdrew his support, citing advice from deserters, Bohemond took advantage of a renegade Armenian tower to gain entry into Antioch in June of 1098. He was let in by a commander sympathetic to their cause. The Crusaders, after capturing the city, decided to return it to Alexios 
as they had sworn to do. But when they discovered Alexios's withdrawal, Bohemond claimed Antioch for himself, leading to a dispute among the crusader leaders. This dispute caused a dis delay in the crusaders' march, with Raymond of Toulouse engaging in small expeditions while Bohemond consolidated his rule in Antioch. Pressure from the poorer Franks led Godfrey of Bouillon and Robert II, the Count of Flanders, to reluctantly join the unsuccessful siege of Arca. Alexios requested a delay in the Crusaders' march to Jerusalem to allow Byzantine assistance, further deepening the already deep divisions among the Crusader leaders. Don't be too quick to think that this was just for the sake of Christendom and taking back the Holy Lands. No, there was plenty of politics and plenty of selfish desires at play, just like anybody else. Now, despite the eternal, internal, perhaps also eternal conflicts, the Crusaders eventually marched along the Mediterranean coast down to Jerusalem. They captured the city on July 15th, 1099, after a relatively short siege. The conquest resulted in the massacre of thousands of Muslims and Jews, with any survivors sold into slavery. Although proposals to govern Jerusalem as an ecclesiastical state were rejected, Raymond refused the royal title, allowing Godfrey to become the first ruler of Jerusalem, adopting the title in Latin Advocatus Sancti Sepulcri, the Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, the establishment of the Crusader states, these were lands held by Crusader armies that they would operate out of in the Levant, being Jerusalem, Antioch, and several other smaller ones, did not significantly alter the political landscape of the Levant. Frankish rulers replaced local warlords in the cities, but large-scale colonization well, that simply did not occur. And the traditional organization of settlements and property in the countryside remained virtually unchanged. Now, what about the Muslim leaders? Well, they were either forced into exile or simply massacred, with very little resistance from the native population. Despite the conquest, treaties and armistices between Christians and Muslims were recognized as valid according to Western Christianity's canon law, and negotiations with Muslim leaders were facilitated by mutual understanding between Frankish knights and Turkic warlords. However, the fervor of crusading began to wane in the following decades, with only smaller groups of armed pilgrims taking the journey to the Holy Land. Now, the complex politics of the Levant during the early years of the Crusader states was marked, of course, by shifting alliances, strategic ambitions, and ongoing conflicts among both Muslim and Christian factions, inside and out. The feud between the Fatimids and the Seljuks presented a significant obstacle for Muslim unity, allowing the Crusaders to exploit divisions among their adversaries. Despite being outnumbered, and greatly outnumbered, the Franks were able to form temporary alliances with the neighboring Armenian, Arab, and Turkic groups leveraging these relationships to strengthen their positions. 
each crusader state had its own strategic objective during its nascent years. Jerusalem sought secure access to the Mediterranean, essential for trade and communication. Antioch aimed to expand its influence into Cilicia and along the upper Orontes River, while Edessa sought control over the upper Euphrates Valley, strategically positioned for both defense and expansion. Tugatin of Damascus, the most powerful Syrian Muslim ruler, pursued a rather pragmatic approach towards dealing with the Franks. His treaties, establishing shared rule or condominiums between Damascus and Jerusalem in contested territories, set precedents for diplomatic arrangements with other Muslim leaders. In the August of 1099, Godfrey of Boilon scored a crucial victory against the Fatimid vizier Al-Afdal Shahan Shah at Ascalon. The arrival of Daimbert of Pisa, the papal legate, with naval support, further bolstered the Franks' position. Daimbert, advocating for the creation of an ecclesiastical principality, secured oaths of fealty from Godfrey and Bohemond. Following Godfrey's death in the following year, 1100, his brother, Baldwin, assumed control of Jerusalem, cementing his rule through alliances and strategic maneuvers. Tancred, initially resistant to Baldwin's authority, eventually accepted the regency of Antioch in exchange for concessions. While Raymond of Toulouse laid the groundwork for the county of Tripoli, capturing key cities and besieging Tripoli itself, his cousin, William II Jordan, continued the siege after Raymond's death, eventually completing it in 1109. Beaumont's release in 1103 marked another turning point, as he sought to regain influence in Antioch and compensate Tancred for his support. However, the conflicts, as always, continued. With Baldwin of Borque and Jocelyn of Courtenay captured during an attack on Ridwan of Aleppo, Amidst all of these power struggles, the Byzantines slid their way in and seized the opportunity to reconquer Cilicia, making things even more complicated. Bohemond's return to Italy marked a significant shift in the leadership dynamics of the Crusader states. With Bohemond absent, Tancred assumed control in Antioch while Richard of Salerno took charge in Alessia, Edessa, rather. However, Beaumont's attempt to reinforce his position by crossing the Adriatic Sea and besieging Dyrrachion ended in a catastrophic failure. The subsequent Treaty of Devon, forced upon by Beaumont by Emperor Alexios Komnenos, compelled him to cede Laodicea and Cilicia to Byzantine control, becoming a vassal of the empire and reinstating the Greek patriarch of Antioch. Now despite these terms, Beaumont never returned to fulfill his obligations, leaving his underage son, Beaumont II, to inherit his legacy. Meanwhile, the fall of Tripoli prompted Sultan Muhammad Tapar to mobilize the Atabeg of Mosul, Mordud, to launch a jihad against the Franks. Over several campaigns between 1110 and 1113, 
Moadud attempted to push back the Crusaders in Mesopotamia and Syria. However, internal rivalries within his own armies hindered the effectiveness of these offensives, leading to their eventual abandonment. Mordut's focus on Edessa as Mosul's primary rival resulted in devastating campaigns that inflicted lasting damage on the country's eastern regions. Now the Syrian Muslim rulers, viewing the Sultan's intervention as a threat to their autonomy, sought alliances with the Franks against the common enemy. Aleppo, vulnerable to Frankish attacks, allied with the Artukid princes, Ilghazi and Balak, who inflicted significant defeats on the Franks between 1119 and 1124. Despite these setbacks, the Frankish counter-invasions continued, reflecting the volatile nature of the region's power dynamics. In 1118, Baldwin of Borke succeeded his uncle Baldwin I as King of Jerusalem, assuming the leadership amidst a series of challenges. The sudden death of Roger of Salerno at the Battle of Agar Sanguinus led Baldwin II to assume the regency of Antioch for Bohemond II, further complicating the politics. To address growing concerns over moral standards, ecclesiastic and secular leaders convened a council at Nablus, issuing decrees that improving societal conduct. That sounds like fun. Well, the Council of Nablus also laid the groundwork for the creation of military orders, such as, and I'm sure you've seen my videos on it, the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller. Reflecting the increasing militarization of the Crusader states, as Baldwin II focused on defending the northern crusader states against external threats, his absence from Jerusalem sparked opposition among the nobility, culminating in a deposition attempt. Emphasis on the attempt. They did not get very far. Baldwin's strategic marriages including that of his daughter Melisende to Fulk of Anjou, aimed to strengthen alliances and secure the kingdom's future. However, the internal conflicts and external pressures managed to shape the Crusader states more than any of their marriages could. Bohemond II's death in 1130 further exacerbated tensions, leading to another power struggle over control of Antioch between Alice and Baldwin II, who resumed the regency until his death in 1131. On his deathbed, Baldwin II made a pivotal decision by naming Fulk Melisende and their infant son Baldwin III as joint heirs to the throne. However, Fulk, intending to consolidate his power, initially sought to revoke this agreement. His favoritism towards his own compatriots sparked more than a little discontent within the kingdom. In 1134 he faced a revolt led by Hugh II of Jaffa, a relative of Melisende, which he managed to suppress but was ultimately compelled to accept the shared inheritance. Now, it wasn't easy outside of that either. Antioch also faced external threats, as Leo, a Cilician Armenian ruler, capitalized on the city's weakened state and seized the Cilician plain. Despite these challenges, 
Falk continued to assert his authority. Thwarting numerous attempts by Alice to assume the regency in Antioch. In 1133, Fulk proposed a marriage alliance between Constance, Bowman II's daughter and heir, and Raymond of Poitiers, a son of William IX of Aquitaine. Raymond's eventual arrival in Antioch three years later marked a significant development as he married Constance, and embarked on campaigns to reconquer parts of Cilicia from the Armenians. However, the situation escalated some years later in 1137, when Pons of Tripoli was killed in a battle against the Damascenes, and the Zengi decided to invade Tripoli which just made things a lot worse. Despite Fulk's intervention, Zengi's forces captured Raymond II, that was Pond's successor, and besieged Fulk himself at Montferrand. Faced with dire circumstances, Fulk had no choice but to surrender the castle and also pay a heavy ransom for their freedom. Meanwhile, Emperor Alexios' son and successor, John II Komnenos, asserted Byzantine claims to Cilicia and Antioch, compelling Raymond of Poitiers to give homage and agree to surrender Antioch under certain conditions. Despite joint efforts by the Byzantines and Franks to besiege Aleppo and Shizar, they were unable to capture these strategic sounds, towns rather. The fall of Edessa in late 1144 shocked Western opinion and prompted a massive military response, culminating in the arrival of Louis the Seventh of France and Conrad III of Germany in Acre, four years later, in 1148. However, their attempt to attack Damascus ended in failure, leading to scapegoating and a decline in European support for future crusades. Subsequent events saw Raymond of Poitiers killed at Inab in 1149, while Jocelyn was captured and also tortured before dying. Beatrice of Seon, his wife, sold the remains of the country of Edessa to the Byzantines, with Baldwin's consent, of course. Baldwin, who was eager to rule alone, forced Melisende's retirement in 1152, while Constance remarried to Reynald of Châtillon in 1153. As internal conflicts persisted, Nur ad-Din's rise to power in Aleppo posed a significant threat to the Franks. The strategic marriage alliance between Baldwin and Manuel's niece, Theodora, marked a shift towards Byzantine influence in the region further complicating the politics of the Crusader states, already complicated enough. The death of the childless Baldwin III in 1163 marked a turning point in the politics of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. His younger brother, Amalric, ascended to the throne, but was compelled to repudiate his wife Agnes of Courtenay due to consanguinity. Despite this marital complication, the right of their two children, Baldwin IV and Sibylla, to inherit the kingdom was confirmed. I've got a video on Baldwin IV as well, and he is just awesome. Perhaps put that on the list of watch later. He's just great. Well, back to our video. 
Meanwhile, the Fatimid Caliphate was embroiled in internal strife, with rival viziers, Shawar and Dirgum, vying for power and seeking external support. This discord provided an opportunity for Amalric and Nur ad-Din to intervene in Egypt. Amalric launched multiple invasions of Egypt between 1163 and 69, but despite cooperating with the Byzantine fleet during the last campaign, he was unfortunately unable to establish a foothold. Nur ad-Din recognizing the strategic importance of Egypt, appointed his Kurdish general, Shirku, to lead military operations in the region. Shirku's nephew, Salahuddin, rose to prominence during this period, eventually succeeding Shirku as vizier after the death of the Fatimid Caliph al-Adid in 1171. And yes, of course, Salahuddin or Saladin was indeed one of the main characters of these, uh, of these tumultuous times. Now, amidst all of this, Amalric sought Byzantine military support for further attacks on Egypt. They really wanted it. In March 1171, he visited Manuel in Constantinople and swore fealty to the emperor in exchange for his assistance. However, conflicts with Venice and Sicily prevented the Byzantines from launching a campaign in the Levant as planned. The relationship between Saladin and Nur ad-Din was characterized by a mutual distrust, hindering their cooperation against the Crusader states. Nur ad -Din's suspicions were further fueled by Saladin's remittance of suspiciously small revenue payments. Despite Nur ad -Din's preparations for an attack on Egypt, his sudden death in the May of 1174 left his 11-year-old son as his successor. Well, shortly after Nur ad -Din's demise, Amalric also passed away, leaving his thirteen-year-old son, Baldwin IV, to inherit the throne. Now, Baldwin IV faced the additional challenge of leprosy, which would profoundly impact his ability to rule and maintain stability in the kingdom, but not his resilience, as he had plenty of that. The ascension of under-age rulers, both in Jerusalem and Muslim Syria, led to a period of disunity and political maneuvering. In Jerusalem, following Baldwin III's death, the seneschal Miles of Plancy briefly seized control until his murder in Acre. With the Baronage's consent, Amalric's cousin, Raymond III of Tripoli, assumed the regency for the young Baldwin IV. Raymond's marriage to Eshifa of Bures solidified his power, making him the most influential baron in the kingdom. Meanwhile, the empire of Nur ad-Din quickly disintegrated following his death, with his confidant, Gumush Dekin, taking As Sali from Damascus to Aleppo. Saladin emerged as the key figure, reuniting much of Muslim Syria through campaigns against the Zengids and the Gumush Dekin. This period also saw Emperor Manuel's unsuccessful campaign against the Sultanate of Rum weakening Byzantine influence in the region. Raymond's main concern during his regency was 
upholding the balance of power in Syria. Despite initial clashes with Saladin, he eventually signed a truce to maintain stability. In Jerusalem at the same time, Baldwin reached a majority age in 1176 and planned an invasion of Egypt, renewing ties with the Byzantines. However, the plan was abandoned due to various challenges, including Baldwin's deteriorating health. It's a little difficult to do almost anything with leprosy. Tensions between Baldwin's maternal and paternal relatives intensified, leading to political intrigue and maneuvering for control. Baldwin sanctioned the marriage of his sister Sibylla to Guy of Lusignan to thwart a potential coup by Raymond and Beaumont. Saladin's growing power further complicated matters, prompting a more defensive strategy among the Franks. Meanwhile, the decline of Byzantine influence allowed Bohemond to assert himself in Antioch, despite facing excommunications for his controversial marriage. Saladin's truce with Bohemond was followed by preparations for an invasion of Jerusalem, where Guy assumed command of the defense. Baldwin's dismissal of Guy and his appointment of a young co-ruler underscored the kingdom's internal divisions. As Baldwin's health deteriorated further, the issue of succession became a pressing one. With no consensus on who the next ruler would be, the matter would ultimately be decided by European powers. Meanwhile, Bohemond's actions in Antioch added to the region's instability. Things were heating up. Saladin's strategic finesse and military might posed an existential threat to all of the Crusader states, prompting frantic attempts at defense and diplomacy within Jerusalem and its allies. The power vacuum following Baldwin V's death made things even worse, and it allowed Sibylla's faction to assert dominance over Jerusalem, Acre, and Beirut. Despite much opposition, Sibylla and Guy of Lusignan were crowned, exacerbating tensions among the fractured nobility especially since Guy of Lusignan had a reputation of making a bit of a mess of things. Well, in the face of Saladin's encroaching forces, the Franks struggled to unify under a coherent military strategy. Reynald's advocacy for offensive action clashed with Raymond's call for prudence, highlighting the disarray within the leadership. Nevertheless, Guy marshaled a substantial army to challenge Saladin's siege of Tiberias, hoping to reverse the tide of the conflict. Well, the tide was not reversed, especially when the Battle of Hattin rolled around, a pivotal confrontation in the July of 1187, which proved disastrous for the Crusaders. Saladin's forces completely overwhelmed the Frankish army, capturing numerous leaders, including Reynald, and leading to the subsequent fall of Jerusalem in October. Now, the city's surrender marked a profound setback for the Crusaders, with tens of thousands of inhabitants either fleeing to neighboring strongholds or having a career change and becoming a slave. 
Now, even amidst all this chaos, figures like Conrad of Montferrat emerged as stalwart defenders, holding out against Saladin's advances in Tyre. In Tripoli, the ascension of Beaumont's son underscored this shifting dynamic within the crusader leadership. The dire situation in Holy Land galvanized Europe, prompting Pope Gregory VIII to call for a new crusade. However, Saladin's military prowess forced him to temporarily divert his attention, allowing at least some respite for the besieged cities of Tyre and Antioch. Nevertheless, Saladin was quite the talker. His skillful negotiations secured significant territorial concessions from Beaumont. The Crusaders found their holdings in the region even more eroded. Well, as the Crusaders grappled with their internal divisions and the external threats, the fall of Antioch and other key territories highlighted the formidable challenge they faced in preserving their presence in the Holy Land. Saladin's adept navigation of diplomacy and warfare continued to reshape the geopolitical landscape of the Levant, leaving the Crusaders on increasingly precarious footing. Following the attempt to uh, enter Tyre, the failed attempt to enter Tyre, and the subsequent token move on Acre, Guy of Lusignan, Amory, and Gerard de Redford, along with their contingent of knights, found themselves in a rather difficult spot. Nevertheless, their actions managed to surprise Saladin and temporarily halted his advances. Temporarily, at least. Well, at least it was temporarily enough to buy some valuable time for the gathering crusader forces, and they needed all of the time they could get. In 1189, three major crusader armies set out for the Holy Land, Frederick Barbarossa's crusade, though, met an abrupt end with his untimely death in Anatolia, leaving only the remnants of his army to reach Outremer. Oh, Outremer, that's uh, overseas. They used to refer to the Levant like that. Ultra, mer, overseas. Meanwhile, Philip II of France and Richard I of England, that's Richard the Lionheart, by the way, landed safely at Acre. With Richard's conquest of Cyprus along the way, adding to their military prowess. The internal conflicts within the Crusader ranks only continued to simmer especially with the deaths of Sibylla and her daughters, reigniting the power struggle between Guy and Conrad. Conrad's controversial marriage to Isabella further exacerbated tensions, fueling gossip and undermining the already fragile unity among the Crusaders. Well, despite all of this, the Crusaders managed to eke out a significant victory with the capture of Arker after a prolonged siege. However, Philip's departure for Europe, and Richard's military successes at Arsuf, Jaffa, Ascalon, and Darnham, left Guy feeling somewhat marginalized, with Richard reluctantly accepting Conrad's kingship and granting Guy control of Cyprus. However, Conrad's assassination in Tyre once again saw the politics go through a reshuffle, leading to Isabella's marriage to Henry, the Count of Champagne, 
within less than a week. It was much better for Richard, because his health had begun to deteriorate at this point, and the Crusaders faced the daunting prospect of marching on Jerusalem. A three-year truce was negotiated with Saladin in September 1192, offering everybody a much-needed break. Although this well-timed truce did offer some respite, Frankish confidence in its sustainability remained low. The strategic position of the Crusaders, with their coastal enclaves and shortened frontiers, posed a minor threat to the Ayyubid's empire compared to regional powers. Following the death of Saladin, in the March of 1193, internal strife among his successors further weakened the Ayyubid dynasty, leading to near-constant truces and concessions simply to maintain peace with the Crusaders. Despite all of that, the spectre of conflict lingered on with both sides weary of each other's intentions and capabilities. Bohemond III of Antioch faced challenges from his Cilician Armenian vassal, Leo, who asserted his authority by seizing the northern Syrian castle of Bagras in 1191. Despite Bohemond's attempts to negotiate the return of Bagras, Leo imprisoned him and demanded control of Antioch. This ensuing power struggle led to Beaumont's release upon relinquishing his claims on Cilicia and arranging the marriage of his son, Raymond, to Alice, the daughter and heir of Leo. However, Raymond's untimely death in 1197 complicated matters prompting Bohemond to send Alice and Raymond's son to Cilicia, while Bohemond IV assumed leadership in Antioch. Meanwhile, the Franks recognized the strategic importance of Egypt in their quest to regain control of the Holy Land. Plans for a fourth crusade aimed at Egypt were thwarted when the crusaders diverted to Constantinople resulting in its sack. The deaths of Amory and Isabella in 1205 saw Maria of Montferrat's ascent to power, with John of Ibelin serving as regent until Maria's marriage to John of Brienne in 1210. The conflict between Antioch and Tripoli further escalated as Leo and Raymond Ropen exerted pressure on Antioch, culminating in the latter's brief installation as prince before Beaumont regained control with local support in 1219. The personal union between Antioch and Tripoli endured, albeit both states gradually disintegrated into smaller city-states eventually. In the broader context, the Crusaders embarked on a campaign in Egypt in 1219, capturing Damietta, but ultimately facing defeat and surrender. Cardinal Pelagius, while stationed in Damietta, attempted to support Raymond Ropen in Cilicia, but Constantine of Babylon, acting as regent for the Cilician queen, thwarted these efforts. Raymond Ropen was then captured, and subsequently died in prison, leading to alliances and feuds between Cilicia, Antioch, and their respective allies. The renewal of Frederick's crusader oath during his imperial coronation in Rome in 1220, signalled his commitment to the cause of reclaiming Jerusalem. 
although he did not immediately join the Egyptian crusade. Instead, he pursued negotiations with Al-Adil regarding the city's status. In 1225, Frederick married Isabella II and officially assumed the title of King of Jerusalem. Subsequently, Al-Adil pledged to relinquish Saladin's conquests in exchange for Frankish support against Al-Muazzam. However, Frederick's departure for the crusade was delayed due to an epidemic, leading to tensions with Pope Gregory IX, who actually excommunicated him for his perceived failure to fulfill his crusading obligations. Kind of like being fired for calling in sick. Despite this, Frederick set sail for the Holy Land in April 1228, following Isabella's death. In the Levant, Frederick's attempts to consolidate his authority and assert control over baronial fiefs sparked conflict with the Frankish aristocracy. Nonetheless, his diplomatic prowess enabled him to negotiate a truce with Al-Adil, known as the Treaty of Jaffa, which restored several key cities to the Franks, while granting Temple Mount to the Muslims. Upon his return to Italy in May 1229, Frederick appointed Richard Filangieri to govern the Kingdom of Jerusalem as his baili. However, this move was contested by the Ibelins and other barons, leading to the outbreak of the War of the Lombards. Despite initial gains by Filangieri, the Ibelins retained control of Acre and established a commune to safeguard their interests. In response to the impending expiration of the truce, Pope Gregory IX called for a new crusade, prompting wealthy French and English nobles to lead separate military campaigns to the Holy Land between 1239 and 1241. Employing Frederick's tactics of forceful diplomacy, these crusaders managed to restore most of the land west of the Jordan River to the Franks through treaties with local Muslim leaders. In 1243, Conrad reached the age of majority, but his failure to visit the Outremer prompted the Jerusalemite barons to elect his mother's maternal aunt, Alice of Champagne, as regent. The capture of Tyre in the same year marked the end of Frederick's authority in the kingdom, and further underscored the shifting dynamics that were occurring in the Crusader states. Furthermore, the westward expansion of the Mongol Empire into the Middle East began with the conquest of the Khwarazmian Empire in Central Asia in 1227. Following their defeat, part of the Khwarazmian army sought refuge in eastern Anatolia, offering their services as mercenaries to the neighboring rulers. Despite Western Christians viewing the Mongols as potential allies against the Muslims, Due to some Mongol tribes' adherence to Nestorian Christianity, the Mongols demanded unconditional submission from both Christians and Muslims, emphasizing their Great Khan's divine right to universal rule. As Salih Ayyub, the ruler of Egypt, hired the Khwarazmians and bolstered his military with new Mamluk troops, causing concern for his uncle As Salih Ismail, the emir of Damascus. 
In response, Ismail secured the alliance of Franks by promising to restore territories previously conquered by Saladin. However, in the July of 1244, the Khwarazmians sacked Jerusalem, catching the Franks completely off guard. Despite efforts to repel the invaders, the Frankish and Damascene coalition suffered a significant defeat at the Battle of La Fourbier in the October of 1244, leading to the loss of much of the Crusaders' mainland territory. Subsequent events saw Louis IX of France launching a failed crusade against Egypt in 1249, only to be captured near Damietta along with the remnants of his army. Meanwhile, internal conflicts among rival candidates for the regency and commercial disputes between Venetian and Genoese factions triggered a new civil war in 1256, known as the War of St. Sabas, which engulfed Tripoli and Antioch in chaos. Two years later, in 1258, the Ilkhan Hulagu sacked Baghdad. This ended the Abbasid Caliphate. And two years later, Hetham I of Cilicia and Bohemond VI joined forces with the Mongols in the sack of Aleppo and the conquest of northern Syria. The Mongols then emancipated Christians from Dimi status, leading to cooperation between local Christians and the conquerors. However, the Mamluks of Egypt emerged as a formidable adversary, culminating in the Battle of Ain Jalut, where they decisively defeated the Mongols. Under the leadership of Baibars, the Mamluks revitalized Saladin's empire, uniting Egypt and Syria, and launching successive attacks on the Crusader states. Despite occasional alliances between individual Frankish barons and the Mongols, the Crusader states gradually succumbed to Mamluk assaults. The fall of Arca in 1291, marked the end of the Crusader presence in the Levant, as the Mamluks systematically dismantled remaining Frankish strongholds and expelled their inhabitants, effectively bringing an end to the era of the Crusades in the region for good. Thank you very much for listening. We have reached the end of today's video. I hope you had fun. I hope you relaxed and learned something. I know I certainly did. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier patron, Stark Factory, for his contribution to the channel. And I'd like to thank you for listening so far. And dare I be so bold to assume that if you have done so, that you've liked and subscribe to the channel. Well, I think that I will see you in the next video after we've all had a nice little rest, don't you think? Good night, everyone. Be good to each other.